Welcome to part two of the Bathurst 12 Hours iRacing special event for 2021. This is race spot coverage of the great race at Mount Panorama. I'm David Haynes. I've got Daniel Harris and Lorenzo Bonda with me right now and Tyler Maxson behind the scenes in the production truck bringing you these great pictures. 30 splits, thousands of teams and therefore thousands of drivers signed up for this year's edition of the iRacing Bathurst 12 hour. This is top split. This is the 55 best teams that iRacing can put together. The highest ranked, the fastest, the most competitive, the strongest sim racing teams for an endurance challenge. And sure, does the mountain challenge them? We have seen many great drivers, great teams find the Armco find other teams and end up with damage on their cars. It's who can continue, who can keep it clean for 12 hours while also having great pace. Who's going to call themselves a winner and a champion in 5 hours, 54 minutes time. Maybe run you down a little bit the running order as we find them for the second half of this race. Team Red Line Orange lead as you can see on the left hand side of your screen with Max Verstappen driving for them at the moment. He's pulling away from Logitech G Altus Esports and his teammates at Team Redline Ice Blue. Six hours of running should mean the field spaces out a little bit, but uh, it hasn't happened completely. There's still some great battles. Here is your top 10 with uh, Inertia Sim Racing up into fourth. BS Competition in 5th, Beeler Racing Team Euronics in 6th, BMW Team Redline 71 in 7th, Pure Sims Esports into 8th, BS Competition 91 running in 9th with Elias Sepinen, and Sim RC in 10th. Daniel, in our little break, going from part 1 to part 2 of the coverage, they're has been a couple pit stops happen and that's why we see inertia currently running in fourth because i think the red line bmw have made their pit stop bs competition number 90 have made their pit stop and that's going to be very very interesting as they try to get onto some new tires to react to what team red line have done with their audis in the top five Oh, as we see a problem oh, for Yanti in the oh, front the corner. Wall. Big wiggle on the second stint of the tyres. They are going to find the barrier. Johnny Gindy has taken that immaculate BMW and just run out of grip on the rear. We're going to get the replay here. He's deep on the brakes. Doesn't even find much of the grass. He is just in too hot on the brakes. Locks the rears and there's not a whole lot of runoff if you commit to the corner. Yeah, not, not a lot down there, especially when you're down in the, in the bottom there. It doesn't look like there's too much damage to the car, which isn't too bad. Sorry, uh, just getting onto that. The Team Red Line Ice Blue has just jumped into the pits, but we see there was about 9, 10 cars that were uh, within on that lead lap, and now it's down to just 5 cars on that lead lap. So it just shows how quick Max Verstappen is in that, in that car. Part of that goes down to the pit stop phasing as well. But yes, you can see he's worked it out to a 56 second lead. All while I think almost everyone in that car has hit 30 lap stints for Team Redline Orange, while some other teams have gone 28 laps or 29 laps. And they're rolling through the pit lane now. No dramas for Team Redline Orange, who still have fuel left for two more laps when they do make their pit stop in two laps time. I think you'll see a couple more cars scored on the lead lap, but it, it goes to show their dominance that they're uh, they're making good fuel while also making great speed. It's going to be a struggle for that Cube Controls Altus car that we saw going a further lap down to the Red Line BMW. Lorenzo. The track temperature started at 20 degrees Celsius. It's now at 42. How do you approach a car setup knowing, as the teams did going into this, that we'd start in the cool of the morning and race into the baking summer sun? 
and how much the grip would change. I think the grip changes a lot. I had, I saw conversations, I think, from Simon Feigl uh, the, mentioning that the Audis would be stronger on the cold weather. Uh, they would have more grip to the cold weather. The BMWs would struggle a little bit, but when the, the track temperatures get a little bit more warm, the BMWs would be able to pull up against the uh, against the Audis. And this this is something we have we have actually seen throughout this race, where the BMW hasn't really it has really been able to keep up with the Audi pace. So. If you're an Audi, I think you have to finally find a compromise of not over, not over snapping the car on its rear, being maybe too oversteery because the Audi is not happy in, on its rear end. Whereas the BMW, it is more said. You can actually ride the curbs more and be able to ride it more. The uh, expense of maybe wasting the tires more than usual. Feigl might have been on to something with that knowing that it was the Audi teams that were first to decide they could only single stint the tyres while some of the BMW teams kept double stinting. Bueller Racing Team Euronics 451 is on the lane right now. Inertia Sim Racing Euro RC24 is on the lane. We've got to wait one more lap, I think, before we see Altus Esports 43 and when they take fuel and tires where they are relative to this car the red line ice blue is going to tell us whether the Audis are fading in the summer sun or whether maybe going to the single stint on the tires was too much too early and they lost time to that Uh, of course, with those pit stops that we were talking about uh, happening from about the top of the hour, rolling through into the next one or two laps, came quite a few driver swaps. So for the uh, 87 here, uh, it was uh, Jeffrey uh, Rietveld. It is now Alexius Iakola for BS competition. It was Nathan Lewis. It's now Alexander Voss. Team Redline have replaced Jonas Volmeyer with Patrick Holtzman. Uh, that's not a bad, uh, not a bad trade. And we wait to see. It's going to be Cooper Webster making room for Jordan Caruso in the Altus 43. And then at the end of this lap, we'll see probably uh, Max Verstappen hand the car back to Enzo Benito after two good stints. Clean stints from what we've seen, and quick ones too from Verstappen. I think that's just about the driver swap news in the top five. Pretty much, yeah. I think there will. Be, I think that's pretty much the standard moving forward to the remainder of the race. We might not be able to see some a uh, single uh, single stints and driver swaps, uh, uh, even towards the latter portion of the race. That is one thing that is kind of nagging me, though. We are at 42 degrees Celsius. Uh, do we, are we expected to see more of a uh, temperature change, uh, an increase of temperatures uh, towards the 1 o'clock part of the uh, afternoon? I'm thinking it'll, it'll keep going. I'm not sure what peak of track temperature we're going to have. The rapid climb in the temperatures, I think, the ink has slowed down a little bit. There was a moment there where it was going 25 and you blinked and it was 30 and you blinked it was 35. It's taken a little longer, I think, for it to get from 35 to 40 to 42. So we, we might not see it hit 50, but certainly there is a huge difference in the tire wear, in the slip angle, and in how you drive the car and the balance between 20 degrees Celsius and 42 degrees Celsius of track temperature. We might see it get closer to 45 or 48 but uh, I'm no longer sure it'll it'll peak past 50. So Meanwhile. as we watch the red line ice blue the pit stop for Altus Esports has seen Jordan Caruso rejoin just three seconds ahead there's maybe some shots where you'll see both of them 
uh, particularly the long shot down Conrod Strait. But now that they're both on new tyres and Red Lion are three seconds behind Altus, they didn't quite make the break even on that single stint. And that's not the only thing going on, Lorenzo. Yeah, that's not the only thing going on. I saw Inertia make the move on uh, Nicol Flaggy's Pure Sims right around Griffin's Bend, uh, where Nicol actually didn't put much of a fight. He just lifted off the gas, let Madikata Soya go by, and uh, now he's under his draft since Nicol has to come down into the pit lane this lap. Yeah, he absolutely has to, because at the end of this lap, be a 31-lap stint for Pure Sims, Almost everyone else lucky uh, when they hit 30 laps to a stint. So I think Foggy probably rolled out, gave this position away because he wanted a bit of the draft, save a little bit more fuel to make sure he could get to the end of this 31 lap stint for Foggy. And of course, it's not going to be 32 because he goes for pit entry. What a fun pit entry it is here. You can see uh, the way they attack the pit entry, the way they sometimes lock up the tires or get close to them in these ABS cars means that uh, there's some rubbered in racing line on the pit entry and indeed Max Verstappen uh, out of the car and Enzo Benito now driving the red line orange on his outlap. And on that outlap, 58 seconds clear of Altus Esports and Jordan Crew. So we, we called out that gap as it went one way, went the other. Uh, what was it? About a 36 second lead when Verstappen got in two hours ago and he's handed that over as a 58 second lead back to Enzo Benito. So uh, I think that's a pretty solid two hours. Remember the heartbreak for Verstappen here a year ago? So it's been much cleaner, much cleaner for him this year so far, Daniel Harris. Yeah, it has been uh, definitely a lot cleaner of a running for him. Um, he's been running very well, um, but it's to be expected they are um, just drivers of such a caliber and such such great skill that you don't expect anything less from them. One of the last couple cars coming through the pit lane as the uh, the pit window, which was the top of the hour, keeps stint by stint getting pushed just a couple of minutes later. Means Pure Sims have brought their two cars through the lane. And who made way for who in the driver swaps, Lorenzo? So then Craft uh, Sims from Nico Foggy on the 117 car just got overtaken by James Saunders uh, right before the Griffin's Bend. Uh, as he, they were, he was coming down on pit lanes, I mean Craft not Saunders. And then Ferguson took over from Dion Fiala, uh, Dion being a gas driver because he's from Mavano and being a gas driver in today's effort for Pearson's 116. So the BMW Team Red Line car on screen, one of the cars that were in that great four car battle we had for second, third, fourth and fifth. Well, regrettably, a uh, little bit of traffic, a little bit of uh, differences on the setup and how they handled the heat and different strategies have seen our battles spread apart a little bit, but not too much. Second, third, fourth and fifth, and fortunately for BMW Team Red Line, it is them in fifth needing to hunt BS competition in fourth, but also dropped back off the battle second and third. Great look at the dipper. Shows you how close Patrick Holtzman is to catching Alexander Voss. There is only a couple seconds in this one and a bit more time further up the road to the battle between Altus and Redline. We're talking about the pit stops for Pure Sims. Here is the 117. The long 31 lap stint for Foggy has made way for whatever this stint is going to be for Daniel Kraft still uh, in the battle with Yaz Heat where Johnny Gindy has given the car to Joao Vaz.
in the great graphic shows that BMW Team BS competition isn't far off the back of this battle either. 1.3 seconds from the Pure Sims Audi to that white and blue BMW. So if you are Phil Dinez, you're hoping for these two guys to start fighting. Yeah, I think uh, the, the good thing for Daniel Kraft is like let Saunders and Voss start fighting, you know, just scrap it out on the chase. From the looks of it, Voss has a car with better rubber, you know, it is more built up. Uh, but Voss Saunders has the lighter car in comparison to Voss uh, when they come down into Conrad straight. So if we're talking about battles, it wind up a little bit. It's been about nearly two seconds between Vaz and Daniel Kraft, but Daniel kind of struggled on his outlap, to be very honest with you, uh, David, because he went from basically P12 losing two positions in just one lap. So, more than six hours of racing. No safety cars in this iRacing special event, and yet still, uh, how close some of these teams are. Sees them, you know, battling each other, going through some traffic, making their pit stops, and then ending up right back in a battle with each other. Though it is looking good for Yaz Heat that they're getting away from Pure Sims just a little bit. BMW Team BS Competition 89 get back in this fight despite what appears to be a little bit of extra drag, a little bit of aerodynamic damage on the nose of their car. Several BS competition BMWs are all painted almost identical, so it's nice of them to put a little bit of damage in different places on the different cars to help us tell them apart, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good reminder to know which car's which now. Uh, Bit easier than reading the numbers and having to remember which is which but that damage is quite significant um just looking up the uh, up the table it looks like that um the altus esports of uh jordan caruso now and the team redline ice blue car they are in a lot closer of a battle uh, about three four seconds between them than what it was before the pit stops um so it's um with both of them i think taking tires with the driver swaps, I think it is uh, definitely going to also be something to watch here. Um, I think there was, three. forgive me, but I think there was a bit of a two-lap undercut for Redline as well. They pitted two laps before Altus, so consequently got on a new set of tyres to bang in two quick laps right as Altus were at the end of their double stint uh, on some, you know, uh, pretty yucky tyres. So that also probably helped end up being a bit closer now than it was when Redline first jumped into the pits. But when you look at this traffic, Daniel, that could make it get a lot closer as one of them is off. Uh, that, that is not what you want to see when you're battling for second, is side-by-side -side traffic in front of you here. Yeah, I've had a few times where I've been racing and I've had two wide, sometimes three wide, and I've just had to send it over the grass, but... <laughs> I haven't been in P2, so I don't think that's what um, what Jordan Caruso will be wanting to do, uh, especially in such a, a good position, as the gap has now dropped to 1.3 thanks to that uh, little hold-up, as he's going to try and gain a, a bit more time through down the mountain straight, or up the mountain straight, I suppose, as they're going up the mountain. It gets the move on the first one. Uh, no one who's ever walked this track would accidentally say down mountain <laughs> straight. Yeah. The calves let you know uh, which way it goes. But between him and Alexei Uziakala, uh, it was a 2 minute 6.5 for Caruso versus a 2 minute 4.8 for Uziakala on the lap that they just completed. That's how much time Jordan Caruso lost. But... 
they're both salmon trying to swim up the same stream here. What caused the gap to close up could then also see it expand again if the same thing happens coming down into the chase this time that disadvantages red line uh, in turn as it did Altus. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The traffic, I mean, you shorten the gap and then as soon as... Oh, oh there's a spin! There at, the, at the elbow. Was that a bit was of that contact? A mistake out of Davina that then saw Redline make contact? Or was it an ambitious dive from oh, Redline? It got even worse, uh, David. Oh, oh wow! It was a pile up, indeed, as it has. We are going to need to wind back the tape on that one at Just the exit of the uh, the elbow because it is a very very difficult place to try to recover your spun car got to start surely uh with team red line ice blue and their perspective of that one because they didn't want to get held up too much in the traffic and we'd seen uh Davina had started getting a little bit scrappy let's get the replay just just oh, the rear oh, just yeah. loses the rear just gets lost so there's actually no contact there no contact there, but now they roll backwards onto the racing line. They're waiting Ooh. on the racing line. Oh, and... wow! Which red line Three is... cars getting Which... involved. That's the Indigo and car the normal one. Got in there. It's just interesting to see from that shot that um, that one just looking down at the, at the crash. Uh, you see all those, um, the amount of, of uh, marbles and debris you can see it there on on the floor on the floor right there of the of the loose track, and it's just that that line that they have to stay on. If they touch just a little bit of that, um, it can really unsettle the car. And I think uh, they've just carried a bit too much speed into the corner. That's well, not the same car, but that was a nice little so, little barrel roll. Yeah, Indigo Team Red Line coming to grief, and then the. BMW Team Red Line making contact with the sister Indigo Red Line car. This, the onboard view from Patrick Holtzman. He, blind, comes around the corner. Oh, and there's three cars in the air, one facing the wrong way, and just about nowhere for Holtzman to go on that one as well. For a moment, the track was blocked. That is a proper Bathurst incident that you need to avoid if you're going to have a good race. Yeah, it really shows that just how how dangerous and how committed you need to be with these corners because it's things like that. Almost every corner is blind and you just have no clue what's going on up the road if you haven't got somebody uh, um, if you haven't got somebody telling you what's going on like a spotter or something, but Having that, that blocked track, it could have been a whole lot worse. So, a couple of real contending cars in that as well. That looked like quite a bit of damage for Patrick Holtzman in the 71. Uh, the Indigo Team Redline 70 was already a little further down the order, but not helping them uh, whatsoever to go for a... Uh, a bit of a roll there. I hope Johnny Vecchio took his like, seasickness medication this morning. And we also saw uh, one of the BS competition cars. I'm going to imagine it was your fourth place car, Alexander Voss, who also got a bit in the air. But I need confirmation or someone to look back at which BS competition BMW it was that picked up a bit of damage there. But certainly... Yeah, lucky break for Team Redline Ice Blue, not a lucky break for two of their teammates. Yeah, that could have been really bad for Team Redline Ice Blue. They just uh, just got a bit lucky that, um, that that they sort of lost the back end and sort of went around. If, if it was a front lock, I think they would have been right up the back of them and wouldn't have been able to avoid that. So I think they got quite lucky there. Lost a bit of time, but I think they might be able to gain it back. Um, just they've got a clear road ahead of them now, so I guess a, a lucky and a bit of bit of fortune. Then. Well, this is uh, 
Another difficult position to be in for the 43, Jordan Caruso with yet more traffic battling side by side, two wide in front of him through the chase. This is the 89 BMW Team BS competition battling with Pure Sims Esports' Daniel Kraft. Daniel Kraft isn't going to let Caruso through here because he has a battle all of his own, but now he's gotten two wheels onto the grass. He's dropped back from the battle. It's about time he gets on the brakes early and Caruso slides through Hell Corner into, well, still into second place, but he gets past that traffic. But again, another time through the traffic that lets the 87 Team Redline Ice Blue Audi get back within one second of second place. Yeah, but fortunately for for Jordan right now is the fact that uh, Alexi got the Pure Sims car right ahead of him at the entry of the cutting. So he's going to be tucked back all the way down towards the upside of the mountain and then the downhill into Forest Elbow behind the, behind the car. And Jordan kind of got clear air of sorts. He has a BS competition car in front of him. So you can close the gap, you can open up the gap a little bit more. It might go up to a one and a half seconds, I think. Producer Tyler Maxson has uh, had his eyes on the timing and he's seeing that fifth place BMW Team Red Line with Patrick Holtzman is really, really struggling. He is two seconds a lap off almost everyone else after his little of airborne excursion first with the uh, Dineva car and then with the Indigo Team Redline teammate. He's put quite a lot of damage on that BMW and he is hurting. His last hurting lifetime was a two time. minute fourteen dead. Uh, that that was the lap with the incident. The lap after oh. was a two minute six, which is still about a second and a half, maybe two seconds off what everyone else uh should be doing. Apologies, my timing hadn't updated yet. <laughs> yeah, if it was 2.14 and he was 10 seconds a lap off the pace, <laughs> uh, you know, he'd be basically driving a TCR car instead of a, a GT3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it just goes to sense. show that not only is the, the, the time lost on the lap of the incident, where he clearly lost 10 seconds, it's then an ongoing thing with the damage costing a further two seconds. He stayed out on track and managed a 2.5.2 for Holtzman. So now that lap, maybe he's picked the confidence up a little bit more. He's a second off where we might expect him to be, but he is definitely being caught by the Inertia Sim Racing Euro RC 24. You can see that in the on-screen timing, and you can also see it uh, on the racebot.tv live timing. It's Pinned in the YouTube chat, it's racebot.tv slash endurance. Uh, if you've got a friend racing, if you've got a teammate racing, if there's just a particular team you're cheering for, you want to see how they're doing, then head to racebot.tv slash endurance for that live timing. Dare I say, if you want to see what Max Verstappen's lap times are like, head to racebot.tv slash endurance. Not right now, he's not in the car. It's Enzo Benito in the number 33 that Max Verstappen is so generously uh, sharing with someone else because normally it's on his car when it's just him. But uh, Verstappen and Benito, it looks like a two driver combination in 33 today. And I think it's about an hour and a half. We'd probably expect to see Max Verstappen back in that car if you are one of the several Max Verstappen watches joining us. Hey, that, uh... Oh, sorry, not that, but Enzo Benito might not be Max Verstappen, but he is putting in lap times that are consistently three-tenths uh, quicker than uh, P2, and that, and that gap has, has gone from about, I think it was about 35 seconds after the pit stops, maybe 40 seconds. It's now at a minute five seconds, so... Um, about half a track, or, sorry, more than half a track, um, in front, and I think there's a possibility that even more people are going to get lapped, so it'll be interesting to see who ends up on the lead lap at the end of this race, 
Because <laughs> yeah, there's no that... pit stop messing around here. Uh, everyone has made the same number of pit stops. And it is eight cars on the lead lap. So you're not waiting for a red line to cycle through the pits and put a couple cars back on the lead lap. It is truly eight on the lead lap at the moment, Lorenzo. Yeah, I think for I think the red line orange mentality when they came into this race, you know, is all right. Uh, we have Max in the car. We have Enzo Bonito, two really good drivers. Enzo Bonito, a really good driver, and not just him. Uh, better does high racing from time to time, really fast in it. So I think they came with the mentality, you know, just go flat out every single every single lap. I think there is, if we built up a, if we build up a gap, I think there is no need for us to be saving towards the end, latter portion of the race. Where those guys who have been saving might be able to cut down maybe a 10, 20, 10, 20 seconds total from start to finish in pit time. So for them, it won't make a difference. Let's get some more tweets going. Team managers, fans, whatever. Uh, tweet us, hashtag iRacingBathurst12. And maybe in a couple moments' time, we'll pull up some of those here from our viewers, here from some drivers, here from some people involved as well. Get them going. That's hashtag iRacingBathurst12 on Twitter because there is plenty to talk about in this race still, especially with the way the battling has been going around second and third. Another thing Tyler Maxson has picked up on especially as we were riding on board with third place, is it looks like the red line ice blue Audi had been saving a little bit of fuel uh, through the traffic and when they were within the slipstream range of Altus Esports in second. It's not the only battle going on though, because we're looking at a bit of uh, R8G versus R8G uh, in uh, 20th and 21st, this one must be. Vlad Kimachev for R8G Esports and Julian Cernan for R8G Esports Junior. Well, they're in the correct order that the name would suggest, with uh, R8G Esports Senior in front of Junior. But looking at the cars, I think there's a little more damage on the number two. That might help the 17 get up closer and make a move. What was about half a second in it there is now basically a nose to tail, Daniel. Yeah, very close. It'd be interesting. If, I wonder if Team Oz will come into play, telling the junior team to back off, or if they've got more pace, tell them to go, go for it. Um, yeah, it does look like uh, they do have a little bit more damage. Uh, but it's hard to tell when the car's just... so so dark, though, is it? Isn't it? Yeah, um, it is. It is quite hard to tell. I think it might just be that the blue on that. Uh, on that junior car that might make it look a little bit more compared to the black, but um, yeah, it'd be, be uh, quite interesting, especially if something ends up and they make contact. There's going to be possibly a lot a lost seat uh, within that junior team. They have been picking up talent and signing drivers like No Tomorrow over the last couple of months, though at our 8G Esports and growing the team not a revolving door but uh, one way to get shown the door would be to make some unnecessary contact with your teammate this deep into the race with still a long way to go 6 hours 40 minutes of racing done 5 hours 21 still to go it's half past 12 in the session time the track temperature has hit 45 so maybe i'm wrong maybe it is going to keep climbing past 50 degrees what is going to be worked out a little earlier than that though is uh the, the hm engineering car the 16 right in front of vlad kimichev well, i think he's been hunting that more than the junior team has been hunting him three-car BMW battle across the top of the mountain Kimichev was looking very very good he caught HM engineering and he left Julian Cernan a couple car lengths further back
Yeah, and uh, the one the one problem is that uh, even it looks like they're close to one another, right? For four tenths of a second for us, looks like it is close. We've seen this as a trend time and time again, where one car leads uh, a train of uh, train of other cars, and they just keep saving fuel. One behind the another, one behind the other, and no real action happens. No one's trying to go for more aggressive moves. I think this is the same standard we're seeing over here. Nobody, you know, being overly aggressive. They're only going to overthink if there's a big opportunity coming up for them to actually make the overtake. Uh, just keep your car on track and gain positions from other people making those mistakes because we're seeing often people in the front uh, being caught up in the mistakes of other people or doing the mistakes as well. Yeah, you've got to be careful sometimes following following another car, particularly here I feel you can you can clatter the wall coming down the hill if you're staring too much at the car in front and lose sight of some of just the little reference points you need to to follow the correct line there. Is HM Engineering just close enough to the Lamborghini in front to pick up a slipstream that might help them uh, defend in their little battle? Or are they too far back on this one? Does not look like the RHE car is going to strike on this occasion. Meanwhile, Battle P2 and P3, uh, we have had our eyes back and forth acro across this one. Lorenzo Bonda, you think that this is closing up a little bit, and I can agree with that a little bit, especially now we see no lapped cars uh, in front of Altus or between these guys. Yeah, the closest car in front of Altus is actually the AS Heat car, but it's quite of a lengthy gap. I, if I have to say, it's about two second gap between Jordan Caruso and whoever's driving the AS Heat and Jean Vaz car. Just take, take a quick look in here. And now you have the draft all all the way up and down the, the car rod straight, uh, where Alexi might be able to catch up and maybe a tenth or two in the draft alone, and then the braking, and then it's all set up once again. Uh, for Alexi, I think he's just going to tuck in behind the Jordan, save a little bit of fuel, and then make the overtake when it's appropriate because he's two laps uh, older in the stint than uh, Jordan Caruso is. Could that be the red line strategy now? We saw a stint where the Altus car was happy to just ride along behind this red line Audi and save the fuel and go longer. Maybe the shoe is on the other foot uh, for this stint. Could be, you know, exchange of favors between teams, you know, just work yourself as partners. Or for Redline, uh, for Redline itself, you know, uh, just have one driver in uh, lengthy up the gap to its lead car because then again the lead car is a red line car as well. Swan neck mounts for the new BMW M4 GT3 prototype. Technically, still a, a prototype model on iRacing as it hasn't made its real world debut yet. But we are so lucky to. Uh, have BMW give iRacing enough data to put together GT3 spec car on iRacing that will continue to receive some updates as the specification gets finalized in the real world. And the camera and the rear wing placed just perfectly that at a certain distance backwards the Audi almost uh, disappears into a very narrow little blind spot. That is a very nice camera angle to watch from. Oh, this one's lame because you can't see the car. <laughs> if they go really the close, <laughs> it's, a, it's an exciting camera angle because you get this sort of wide angle look at the, uh, at the car behind really getting in your face, getting close. But Redline are close, but not that close at this minute, leaving a respectful one or two car lengths, it seems. Here's some of our other onboard angles. They are now looking forward from third place at second place in this race. 
This one's good too, because you can see the exterior body language of the car, but you can also see the interior sort of body language. How aggressive are the steering inputs? Where are they shifting on the rev lights? Uh, how much are they lifting and coasting? Can also be a story that those shift indicators tell you. Now, if you don't recognize it, that BMW was the BMW team red line car with Patrick Holtzman. He's lost the bonnet, he's lost some of the bumper, he's lost a lot of the rear fender as well, and that is why the inertia Audi has caught him so much. What was the difference on the last lap between our 5th and 6th place runners here? Kaito Soya for inertia was 8 tenths of a second faster. So full props to Holtzman. With all of that damage on the car, he must be hurting. He's still pushing it hard though. Uh, I th think into the chase though, the straight line speed deficit will probably make this an easy job for inertia. Yeah, it's uh, he's doing really well, especially with the damage that he's got, but I don't think it's going to be enough to hold that uh, P5 position. I think you're, you're going to be right, definitely down into the chase down the Conrad Strait. Uh, it will uh, be the end of P5, but I wonder, my question is, is going to be how much of that damage are they going to attempt to repair, if any, uh, if an if they take an early pit stop, uh, because yeah, you can just see how much damage is, is on that car, and it is it is very significant. As we come down the Conrod straight now, having a look, it doesn't seem like they have the straight line speed, but here they go, having a look, we get up to the kink, maybe under braking? Uh, they get a bit no. closer, but it doesn't look like I was watching the numbers. I was watching the numbers on that one. And definitely, once they got up towards sixth gear, Kartasoya definitely had five, six, eight kilometers. Not quite ten kilometers an hour advantage, though. But now he's right here. What about up Mountain Straight? Because that has been a key and popular overtaking place today. He holds back a car length. To make sure he gets a great run out oh, of turn is. one. Yeah, there's great no way. Uh, there's no way Holtzman's holding onto that one, and I think he's actually rolled out of it a little bit as well. Because if you do have that much aerodynamic damage, what you want is to have someone else punch the hole in the air for you and tow you around. So if Holtzman can stick with inertia here now, uh, that'll uh, help him not lose time hand over fist quite so aggressively. But still, you look at that damage and you think, can he? Can he hang with an otherwise pristine Audi with that much bodywork missing and rearranged? Looks like he's not doing too badly at it. But I don't know if it'll last. I don't think it will. Just looking at the, the Audi running... Oh, they get so close to that wall. Just looking at the Audi running, you can see how, how loose that back end gets through the corners and it just slides across onto the, the, the curbs and even looking down here is just watch the rear end of that car they seems to get a little bit loose so that they, these drivers are really are the best of the best to have so much control sorry over these uh over these cars and even I when it was cooler we saw that the audi really seems to like to drive with the tail out a little bit uh, they, they they've got it super pointy all of these teams at this level they, they turn that uh, steering wheel in a little bit, the car immediately responds, and then they're managing the slip angle through the corner. Not far uh, up the road, back down the road. Uh, this is uh, Triton, uh, and that is a Manitzi. And that is for 17th place. I believe that's Tim Matsky in that car? In the Manitzi no. Racing? Nope. No, I'm pretty sure this is uh, Dominic Belaya for DV1 Triton Racing and uh, Rasim Fazui for Maniti Racing. I can't wait for Ben Constanduris to pronounce Rasim Fazui in Maniti Racing. Uh, I, I hope that happens. hope that happens sometime. But they're having a great battle here, 17th and 18th. Both of them 
uh, on the first stint of tyres, so it's not like one car has old tyres, one has new. Both of them working about two thirds of the way through the first stint on their tyres. Well, I asked for your tweets and I believe you've sent some in. So let's have a look at what's happening on Twitter with hashtag iRacingBathist12. And BMW Esports, the iRacing Bathurst 12 is in full swing. We're halfway through the race, so you better keep on pushing for the next six hour, guys. Well, they definitely got quite a lot of cars in this fight pushing well. Patrick Holtzman, though, has a lot of uh, pushing he's got to do. BMW Motorsport, that's what racing in Down Under looks like. The second half of the iRacing Bathurst 12 hour has just begun. Try to make it a good one. BMW Motorsport are super committed to this race, though, because uh, when the shipping containers got delayed, they air freighted a BMW M6 to last year's race because they did not want to miss it. Put their money where their mouth was to race at the real Bathurst 12 hour did BMW Motorsport. So full credit to them. Great to have their support and that know that they're watching this one as well. Inertia racing though on your screen. Six hours to go. We're in the middle of the pit cycle sitting temporarily on P4. Track is getting warmer. Well they made that pit stop and uh, they came out in sixth. Now we've seen them make a move for 5th, and they're just starting to leave uh, the BMW Team Red Line behind. Ronan, I believe they're racing a Lamborghini today. Bathurst 12 hour halfway update. The team's climbed a few spots in the last 2 hours, up to 18th. We've gained time in the pack in front. Uh, that's right, they were 20th at one point, running up into 18th for Ronan, and that can happen in these races, uh, Lorenzo and Daniel, is you have a problem or a little bit of damage early in the race, drops you a long way back, but don't give up because you see problems can still strike to anyone else and you can grab some more spots. Lorenzo with a Lambo update. You know, when we were uh, we, when we were talking about Lamborghinis, yes, uh, they're they've been doing really good on the Lamborghini so far, P16. But the best Lambo in the field is still the CMRC Titan uh, car, uh, just on the verge of the top ten uh, for Marvin Strel, uh, nearly three for two point seven seconds behind Dan Ferguson and on the hunt. Yeah, so. Lots of manufacturers possible to be represented. Of course, in the world of virtual motorsport, uh, it's a lot cheaper to swap chassis between manufacturers. That sees a lot of our teams try to pick a car for a race that they think will be competitive. And that's seen a lot of our teams run the numbers and arrive at, they want to race a BMW, they want to race an Audi, but there is still uh, some Lamborghinis out there. There was a Ferrari, I believe, that's uh, not quite running as strong as uh, it seems like the BMW and the Audi are the car to have. And you think back on those tweets from BMW Esports and BMW Motorsports, though, their best car uh, is in second place with Logitech G Altus Esports. So, well, they got their... Uh, <laughs> Redline have got their uh, eggs across several baskets, so BMW are going to be cheering for that Redline BMW, but they've got to cheer against the Redline Audi uh, in their battle with Logitech G Altus Esports. This one, though, is still Maniti versus Triton. That Maniti is a nice color. I like the uh, the uh, green, white, and black. In fact, what um, color green are you going to call that? We've I, had... I'm I, <laughs> I'm going to call that a metallic. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just a metallic green. I'm not going to not going to give it a that, that. Actually, to me, that's more of a, a bit of a forest green in there. Bit of a darker green. Canadian Racine Fazui has a lot of work to do though because he's been looking at the T2 
teal, blue-green on the back of Triton Racing for quite a few laps now. You'll have uh, studied that BMW. Speed yeah. increases down Conrad Street. Triton Racing hit 250 kilometers an hour, hit 260 kilometers an hour. But now the slipstream pays dividends for Maniti Racing as they hit an end of straight speed three kilometers an hour faster. So they close a little bit, but not super, super drastically. Nothing like we saw the closing speeds between Inertia and uh, the BMW Team Redline. I wonder if that you can see that little bit of, of a kink in the uh, in the in the rear wing. I wonder if that makes just a little bit of a difference down that straight with a little less aero, causing them to lose the, just that little bit of speed. Maybe. I think the damage to the rear wing is also symptomatic of a hit to that corner that could have damaged other things we can't see so clearly as well, or that might have been visually repaired but not you know, completely repaired, because you can often do some level of repairs, but never perfect while the race is in motion. And actually, uh, with where some of the black is on the livery, it's hard to spot, but the fender is pushed in in the front right, leaving the front right tyre a little more exposed to the airstream. So, get a, get a good look, get your magnifying glass out, or see it from the right angle. You can tell that there is that slight kink to the rear wing, but also a bit of damage on the front right as well. Nothing severe, not the worst we've seen, but uh, not perfect. Woes continue for Patrick Holtzman in the red line BMW. Lorenzo, you've been seeing they are falling back into the clutches of yet another team. Yeah, falling back uh, once again to another team. Now this time Urano in their Audi R8. Louis Nasher driving that vehicle against uh, Patrick Holtzman, and I think the move will be set uh, right after Forrest Dalbo. Let's see how Nasher sets up that car. Slightly grazing the wall on the entry, but not avoiding the inside part of the barrier. I think the move will be set and done here, David. It's just all due to draft alone. Yep, Urano Esports and their Audi was pretty close coming off the uh, elbow and they get exactly what they need easy position and once again i think this is holtzman trying to follow in the draft of another car as long as he can we saw obviously he's been dropped from inertia uh, a couple seconds back couldn't hang with them and then once he's in the clean air that straight line speed must be atrocious uh because you're meant to have body work on the nose and uh on top of the engine Get a great look at the engine though, there's uh, some piping and whatnot in there. You can tell BMW sent iRacing some good data if the bonnet comes off and uh, you can get a good look at the turbo piping. Yeah, I think uh, that front end's looking more like a silver line car rather than a red line. But uh, it's, it's good Zoom. sportsmanship as well to see him sort of just, just let off and not fight the position because he knows he's not quick enough to be fighting there just wants to sit behind us. It's, it's good to see um, just some nice clean racing. So in the bonnet of the M4 GT3, or the the hood if you're an American, but luckily we're racing in Australia so I can call things what I want, uh, between the, uh, between the uh, radiator exhaust vents there's some two knacker ducts and now that uh, it's off you can tell that they're actually what feeds the Looks like they what feeds the intake for the turbo. So that's uh, an interesting thing to learn. I'm not one for knowledge on engines, so I'll take your word for it. I, I mean, yeah. I'm learning I'm learning new things all the time, just like our friend Dylan Coyle was uh, was learning about Conrods. I think it was Conrads uh. as well he was learning about. <laughs> <laughs> oh what a guy. What a guy. Yeah, uh, I kind of, I, I was telling Dylan, he kind of pulled up a Haynes in there. By the time, uh, by the time Haynes actually uh, butchered the name Jun Cow, Yellow Cow. Yeah, young, young Sao, um, uh, Yun Show. I don't know. I'll try anything <laughs> except the correct pronunciation of that particular corner. 
at Interlagos. Yeah. Here, no worries, no worries at Bathurst. I've got it all. I've got it all down pat. Now, now I'm actually curious. I know there's the prop the proper corner names for the internet international viewers because even the Australian ones did the their uh their name correct but is there any australian slang to a specific corner that the international audience doesn't know that that's all you david really. i got no idea no, not, not, not not really i think i think the nature of the way supercars coverage and other uh, other coverage is is if, if any of the corners has a nickname then that becomes the official name like uh like Metal Great, for example, isn't really an official sort of corner name, but it's just for years they had a great camera shot of that Metal Great. In fact, we've got one as well, um, right there, and just enough enough times of people calling it Metal Great. It's Metal Great now. All right, fair game. Because it's funny, in some places we all we we get those corner names, right? Uh, like Number Green, you have like Fox Hole Compression and things like that. But they have their German names and specific, even some obscure names for some other corners that only they know and we don't know. So uh, that's that was gets me curious about some chat facts or even some facts about the race sometimes. As much as I love Bathurst. It doesn't quite have as many corners as the Nurburgring Nordschleifer. But it's just um, as difficult. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I think I agree just as difficult. Because actually, for a lot of the lap here, the barriers are even closer than they are at the Nordschleifer. The Nordschleifer's challenge is just how many corners there are that it becomes, I think, more mentally fatiguing than here. I... I the endurance racing is like, tougher mentally at the Nordschleife, but I think tougher on the car here with just how close a lot of those walls are. Pit stop from BMW Team Redline. I was going to say a little on the early side, but they've actually gone 29 laps. This is right on schedule for the 71, and they're going to see exactly how much repairs is needed to fix that very, very wounded BMW M4 GT3. And the answer is probably a lot. And I imagine they're not going to take all of those repairs. But uh, that's, uh, that's something for us to learn as the pit stop window is open past the top of the hour now. Racine Fazui, so much closer to Triton Racing now than he was uh, not long ago. Well, he was right there, he dropped back a bit, and now it looks like he's on the attack once again, Dylan. Uh, Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> you know what? It was easily done because there was the three of us earlier, David, Dylan, and Daniel. I almost forgot what my own name was. <laughs> nah, that's okay. I've been I've been mistaken. Oh wow, look at that ouch. car. That is yeah. a big ouch. I rate Don't that take a, look. a very serious oof on the yikes to yelch scale. <laughs> that's a yeet. I think the the bonnet of that car has gone yeet as they leave. I think our cameraman like, almost got hit. Yeah, no, that was a, that was a great view that we got there um, of of that engine and and yeah, it was good to see that. Off schedule uh, driver change as well, by the way. I think Holtzman only did one stint there, and it's gone back to Jonas Volmeyer. Uh, they took full fuel, they took tires, and while the tires are changing, you can sometimes get a little bit of repairs done. But there is no way that 30 seconds of repairs was going to fix that uh, bloody crime scene, I think it was. Uh, we're going to take your uh, your feedback on YouTube chat and on Twitter, hashtag iRacingBathurst12. What should the pit lane cameraman be called? The flagman at the start-finish line is Barney, but who is his brother with the camera on pit lane. I'll throw that one open to Daniel and Lorenzo as well, but uh, I, I want to hear our unsullied and honest feedback from our viewers as well. Yeah, I'm, we, I'm wanna, we don't know. Go ahead, Daniel. Sorry, I'm going to say Ricardo because there was that, that little... Uh, in the... When Daniel Ricardo stole the uh, stole the camera and went looking at all the different cars, so I'm going to 
say, uh, full name is Daniel Ricardo or Ricardo. Uh, that's that's going to be where my vote lies because that was quite funny. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to say that uh, he saw the idea from me. I said Ricardo first here in our commentators chat. He just improved upon that. He kind of made it better, so I'll give the props to him. To be very honest, I want I want him to be named Bob. Well, we got just cause we we, <laughs> we we can get a tiny bit of feedback about some great racing action or some incidents or some moves. We ask a dumb question like, "What should a fictional invisible cameraman be called?" And we get so much great feedback. It should be John, Alfred, Kurt, or Reggie. But I have decided, I think he should be called Cameron Man. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. That's that really was bad. Bad. No, I think it's super fitting. Like it's a like it's a real person name, but uh, I reckon he should be Cameron Man. I disagree. Cameron? I don't like that. <laughs> it's kind of like, but you have to say with a Pittsburgh uh, sl accent. So, like, like you, you see Pat. You, if you guys know Pat McAfee, he's a he's a wrestler and a, a former opponent for the NFL. He always goes for the uh, for the on. On, on the pronunciation, so that Pittsburgh, Philadelphian way to say things, so Cameron, it would be the proper way for uh, David to pronounce the name if he wants to go like that. Yeah, a lot of these names sort of depend on what type of accent you have. Glad we, uh, we settled that one, but it's funny. He hasn't Barney. had to do much at all. He waved a green flag about seven hours ago. He's still and... holding on to it. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Who hasn't, you know, held on to something longer than they should, be it, you know, like, <laughs> feelings or... Anyway, um, he's, he's not going to have to wait. <laughs> he dreams of <laughs> uh, three wide starts and photo finishes. Barney, you're a hero and an inspiration to all of us, but he's not going gotta... to do a whole lot on a road course until uh, 4 hours 52 minutes time. He's going to grab a checkered flag. For whom is a good question, but definitely your best contenders is everyone on the lead lap, which at the minute is down to just five cars. Uh, some of the BS competition cars, I think, are going to cycle back onto the lead lap when Red Line pit in four or five laps time. Uh, definitely Redline, Altus Esports, Team Redline, Ice Blue, who are right with them for second and third, as well as Inertia up in fourth and Biela 451 in fifth. Some of our best bets for who Barney could be waving that checkered flag for later on. Um, my bet's going to be with number 33. <laughs> you I don't heard think, it here I first. I didn't say it because we got uh, accused of placing curses and hexes and delivering bad luck earlier in the broadcast. But this is what I was talking about. And that is painful for the BMW red line. Well, because you remember when they were in this battle, uh, you know, an hour ago, now they're staring at the same cars, but they're a lap down to their teammates and to the Altus 43. Push as he might, though, Caruso has been caught by red line ice blue towards the end of this stint. Who has thoughts on that one? Um, I don't know. I don't know what's what's going on. That uh, Altus Esports car should uh, be pushing a little bit more, you'd, you'd think. Um, but I think now the pressure might be on. But what's interesting to me is uh, the BS competition cars, they were fighting, they were in third when we started this. And in those t three three, four hours that we've been um, commentating, they've dropped down to to sixth, and that's, uh, that's quite a drop when you think they were up in the podium position to drop down so, so much. There was definitely just a little bit of lingering damage for the 90. It was in the fight and then just, just fell out of the fight and couldn't get back in. They were losing, you know, two tenths, three tenths of a second a lap here and there, and just getting, getting dropped by, uh, I guess, the pace that these two cars have managed to uh, to keep up. 
Caruso and you see Yakala. It is properly pit stop time though because we have had the pit stop for the number 90 BS competition. We've had the pit stop for the uh, red line BMW. How long was the pit stop for the red line BMW? He says out loud. Got just a minute nine. Just a minute nine. So that would have been tires as well. Wait, I'm looking at the wrong car, am I? <laughs> now I've lost oh, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a minute nine and Jonas Vormeyer yeah. got in. Yeah, so just the tires. They didn't do any extensive repairs to that car. I think they're just gonna just gonna hold on to it from here and trust that uh, similar incidents might happen for other people and that the gap they built up won't be usurped in the remaining five hours. They could maybe still hold on for a top ten, potentially? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, I think uh, they'll just be wanting to get to the end in that car and just hope that maybe some incidents take out some other people, but I think... I don't, I don't know if they'll be able to stay in the top ten. I think the uh, Sim RC Titan car will be able to catch them. As we look now at, I believe that is the 43 Altus eSports car getting in front of a back marker, getting a bit further away from the Red Line Ice Blue into Not the chase. Not David says that Team Red Line Ice Blue are coming into the lane but they're not they have saved a lot of fuel they are going for a 31 lap stint this time so that is why they haven't made a move at altus they have been sitting waiting lifting coasting be interesting to see um maybe they're wanting to just get a close that pit stop gap that they they made remember they they went what was it two laps i think earlier than uh the number 43 so i think they're wanting to just try and close up that pit stop gap maybe get on the same strategy because we we all we um we know now that they're gonna have to be taking tires i think every pit stop due to the temperature of the track being upwards of what was it 45 degrees now it's 47 it's 47 Jeez. now so it is still climbing one thing we Air learned from that on board there is yeah i know that's kind of cold for uh for this it uh, 12 months ago when i was at the track for the bathurst 12 hour it sure wasn't 23 degrees in the air at one in the afternoon it was <laughs> it, it was 38 39 um and if you dared step out of the shade you get turned into a pink prawn cracker the skin would start sizzling i was gonna really say damaged uh, enough uh, of my skin that weekend but I, I was going to say, doesn't doesn't that look like a normal day for you guys in Australia during the summer? Too cold. Uh, apart Tw from no, the wait, air temperature being 23, yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. When David actually went to Bathurst uh, yeah. last year. Oh, yeah, basically. Step out in the sun. It's... It, was... <laughs> it was a little on the hotter side. Like, that time of year in Bathurst... You know, you'd expect to average a high of maybe closer to like 32 or 35 or something. It was definitely considered slightly heat wave-ish that it was 38 degrees, 39 degrees, 40 degrees for like four days in a row. Um, As we see now, sorry, that the yep, ice the expected pit stop after 31 laps. red line ice blue onto pit lane and they've got to go a long way to find their pit stall guy and i wonder if we're going to get our favorite camera angle from cameron man on the pit lane oh yeah he's ready he's ready to take <laughs> a good look different. at team red line ice blue but what we're really going to learn from this is are they still going for single stint on the tires i can't imagine they do it once and then abandon going single stint when the track is even hotter oh, cameron man is really really tall now he's if he's looking at the car from that angle so the fueling normally takes about 
39, 40 seconds. That's about the stationary time we've reached now. Fueling almost done on the 80 second, 87 car pitted from third place. And there, up on the jacks it goes. So they are going to go new tyres. Pretty well expected, I would think, Daniel. Yeah, the, the track temp is just... I I just... I'm, I'm just wondering how the track has gotten that hot with the air temp only being 23 degrees. But I suppose... But you've got that many cars going around at that pace. The, they heat it up themselves. But yeah, I don't think any car will be able to double stint unless they are really just uh, nursing the tyres um, that come out of the pits nicely. Well, behind I'll tell you who's nursing the tyres. Inertia, who pitted the same lap, have gone fuel only. Come out just behind Team Redline Ice Blue. So, in the 24... They believe they can look after the tyres, and they're on the they're on the hunt to uh, really put the pressure on second and third. I think we're about to see Altus Esports come onto the lane and respond. We are so Caruso is going to make his pit stop, and now the gap in pit timing between Red Line Ice Blue and Altus goes from two laps to just one lap difference in when they make their pit stops. And just looking real quickly to see if Jordan is actually going to put some fuel in 13 seconds yet. And Enzo should be coming down into pit lane anytime soon. He's just done with the chase. Yep, so we're expecting, as Lorenzo says, our leader to pit in a second as well. But we look at what was second place, the BMW from Altus Esports. Are they going to go tyres the same as Redline Ice Blue? Or are they going to stick with their double stint strategy overall that car looking pretty clean as they roll right out without going up on the jacks fuel only for Altus esports means they're gonna rejoin the race quite a bit ahead of red line ice blue probably closer in the range of 30 seconds enzo benito hits his marks uh to complete one stint and we think he's gonna stay in for another and Lorenzo, you think they're going to keep with the same strategy as Ice Blue? Good. That's a good. That's a good question. I don't. I think they will stick with the same strategy. I don't know if it's going to be the 36 seconds that. Uh, uh, sorry, not the 36 seconds, but the full length they've done for tires as well. I just. Took, I actually confused inertia with red line Ice Blue, and uh, if we're going to see anything, it should be now. Right on the money, Lorenzo. Fuel done. Tires changing now for Enzo Benito. And I'm sure that's of great interest to his teammate Max Verstappen. But it worked so well for them, uh, just going single stints on the tires across the last two hours, that really it shouldn't be much of a surprise to see them do it again. They managed to extract the performance out of the new tires so that they weren't losing time. And then also there's that added safety added comfort factor to not needing to go double stint on the tires well here is alexi yusik yakala using those new tires he was so much on the attack at mcphillany there and across skyline you can see how much closer he is to the walls how much harder he's pushing right now than he was lifting and coasting and saving fuel just a couple laps ago because look at the difference between him and altus esports it is 25 seconds, 25 seconds that he's going to need to close on the track in the next hour. And what will give us a great barometer for those new tyres and their grip and their worth is how much he's able to pull away from his fellow Audi driver in the Inertia Sim Racing 24 because they took fuel only. They're doing double stint on the tyres in the Audi in the hot, hot weather. That Redline don't think is the right way to go. That Redline aren't game to do the double stint when the track temperature is 47. 
but with those double stinted tyres on the Audi, how safe is it? How sketchy is it? What does the wheel work look like for Maddie Kaida So yeah, we're going to find out as we take commentary break, commentary break, well deserved it would sound like, uh, on board with the Inertia Sim Racing number 24, currently in fourth position, right on board with Maddie Kaida So yeah, around Bathurst in the 2021 edition of the iRacing Bathurst 24. While we're on Racebot Fan Immersion, remember to send us your tweets, your updates, and your thoughts to hashtag iRacingBathurst12. And we'll uh, come back shortly, continue riding on board with Inertia Sim Racing Euro RC.
continuing coverage of the iRacing Bathurst 12 hour for 2021. This is the top split, the 55 most competitive, highest ranked teams. We have been racing from before the dawn into the day, past midday, and now into the heat. The track is hot, the track is greasy, the track is slippery, and it shows as some teams opt to change tyres every stop, abandoning their double stinking ways. We were riding on board with Inertia Sim Racing number 24 as they gave a little bit of a boot to the back of the 178 Maniki racing car that was a lap down. So that was an interesting little moment that didn't look like it ended in much damage, but Inertia have got to be so careful if they're going to hold on to their fourth place. There's the weather, 23 in the air, 48 on the track, that is hot, that is, pardon me, quite baking indeed, and that turns up the pressure, turns up the tyre wear as well, and means our drivers have got to be so careful to hold on to their cars. I'm David Haynes, and I'm joined by Daniel Harris, I've got Lorenzo Bonda with me, and Tyler Maxson, our fantastic producer, and pulling the marionette strings on our Hit lane cameraman as well. Well, back to the regular pictures. This is a flash of the headlights there from Inertia because they are trying to put a lap on Miniti, both of them, with the older tyres here. Finally, uh, Inertia get given that spot as Miniti seed uh, a lap down to Inertia and also to. Uh, let Team BMW Bank and Bruno Spengler get a lap back on them as well. This is the shape of the battle over the top five though, where Enzo Benito leads by 55 seconds and will probably at the end of this stint, be giving that car back to Max Verstappen if they follow the pattern they established earlier in this race. Then it is very, very exciting in the battle between second and third, where new tyres on the 87 means they have been catching second place and almost at a rate of a second a lap, sometimes more. Then we look to this battle in fourth, where Inertia are driving their Audi into fourth. But the new tyres on 5th place BS competition mean that what's currently a 6 second gap could evaporate over the next 10 to 15 minutes. Bruno Spengler wants to get another lap back off inertia as well and he is going to very easily jump through at the chase. Lorenzo, what do we think for inertia here? They gained a lot of good track position by double stinting their tyres, while well, a lot of other teams around them have gone for new tyres. But it's uh, a risky game to play when the track is this hot and this slick. Yeah, and looking at the lap perspective, they're not gaining too much ground on the other cars. Uh, Maddie's average lap has been around the five high mid highs to six low mids, depending on traffic. Your highest and running out, uh, sorry, your highest sorry, running Lamborghini has just lost a position to Pure Sims, so Sim RC back mm -hmm. into 13th. Slam dunk move into Griffin's Bend, that's been one of the best overtaking chances. Get down the inside there, use the cambered inside of the road, and leave your opponent high and dry. Easy move, and I think uh, it's a different strategy over here as well for Pure Sims. Uh, they put the tires in, whereas Marvin Stella just went for a 56 pit stop. Looks like only few, maybe two tires for that car. Interesting shenanigans coming out of CMRC. But just back really quickly to Inertia, we're going to be seeing them lose ground more and more. Uh, Alexander Voss just been doing a really good stint so far. Average the four mids uh, being nearly a second faster per lap. Yeah, the uh, interesting strategies for sure. Four five one, their most recent pit stop time, fifty four and a half seconds. 
really looks like two tyres only, which is such a Beeler Racing Team Euronics thing to do. They, they, they love to do that kind of thing. And what it does mean is that they're running in sixth at the moment. That makes them the car behind BS Competition, behind this battle with uh, Inertia. So he has Heat, who look like they want a, a lap back because they are battling with Maniti. Yaz Heat have new tyres, Maniti don't, so I think we are shaping up to see a move take place here as Rovaz has closed the gap to Rasim Fazui and then, well, any time the tyres are newer, it's going to give you more speed when the track is 48 degrees Celsius. Those older tyres will be crying enough, 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 and nearly melting off the rims of the Miniti Audi. Get so close to that wall. They do every single lap coming across the top and you know they get really really close and you think wow that was risky but actually for some of those some of those corners you, you you get to the apex and then you can see where the wall is so you open the steering a little bit you're not going to hit the wall so you open the steering a little bit more and then you're a little closer to the wall but you still feel like you're not going to hit it so you just measure how much you open the hands and feed in the throttle so that it's as you get closer towards the wall you're able to open up more throttle and you get close every time without actually giving too much risk but close is sending it down the inside at the chase big closing distance fresher tires and yaz heat and you're gonna come across and slam the door shut in the face of rasim fazui and maniti racing he has heat up into 14th yeah, that was a good move up inside the chase. Always a good overtaking opportunity to get it done there. Uh, taking on the 14th position. That Maniti racing car was down in, I think, 17th, 18th uh, when we started here. Um, so I, that's uh, they've done quite well to gain two positions. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the gap, though, from the... Altus Esports car at the front and the Redline Ice Blue. Sorry, if I just have a look at that timing again. It looked like that gap has uh, since uh, decreased. It used to be a lot bigger. Um, it was 25. Now it's pretty clearly about 17 or 18 with... 19 laps to go still in the stint for Altus. So, so long as that the Audi from Team Redline Ice Blue can go a second a lap faster with those new tyres, that spells trouble for Altus. So what they've got to do is sort of pace themselves out between now and the end of their stint in about 40 minutes time so that Redline aren't able to catch them and uh, Altus don't use too much of their tyre too quickly, too early. And also, you know, don't lose control somewhere and end up in the wall. Yeah. I'm just looking down the table. There's actually two cars that are very far behind on the lap time. On on laps behind, sorry. There's one, the uh, Biela uh, Euronics. I don't know if that's actually a... Oh, it might be their third car, fourth car? Uh, 172 laps down, or 133 or something. They're just uh, having a think, just having a bit of a drive, a leisurely drive. Unless I'm wrong. No, fair enough. Yeah, the four five four is back out on track, having completed forty eight laps of this race compared to two hundred and twenty for Team Redline Orange. So, yeah, they're going to struggle to uh, get that car classified, I think. 
inertia though in fourth they want to get through a little bit of traffic here because they are still being caught by BS competition in fifth uh, can you just can't see the BS competition BMW in that shot they're uh, they're here and they're they're coming there they are in the background of that shot he has heat they wanted through easier on that traffic and didn't get it so they flash their headlights a little late and potentially in frustration as they're trying to move along and leave Maniki in their dust We talk about the gap closing between second and third, but you can study the gap closing between fourth and fifth here as well. In green, there's inertia, then traffic, 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 and then in white, blue, and black, the BS competition number 90 driven by Alexander Voss. So he, he can see inertia, he's getting close to the inertia Audi in fourth place, but there is still a big handful of traffic in the way. Yeah, big handful of traffic to get through. It's always hard to get through traffic here. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they get past, because the more you get stuck in the traffic, the more impatient you get, the more likely you are to make a mistake, and that's a good camera angle right there, going through. Pretty sure it was Murray's, that one. National Motor Racing Museum in the background there. Lot of Bathurst winners in the museum there. So uh, there's plenty of things to do in Bathurst, like not a lot, and go to the Motor Racing Museum. And uh, I can vouch for the KFC is pretty decent in town. <laughs> uh, KFC is no... decent, period. Uh, I, as a McDonald's worker, I'm going to have to make no comment there. Your nuggets are trash, and you know it. Anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> Yazid are going to try to unlap themselves from inertia here. And that's going to be a, a key little moment for inertia, because they would love, dearly, to keep more cars between themselves and BS competition. But the way the new tyres are on the BMW for Yaz Heat, I'm just not sure that Inertia are going to be able to do that forever. Look for Yaz Heat to try to line up a great run at the bottom of the hill here at Forest's Elbow to try to unlap themselves. BS Competition also critically have gotten their way past Maniti there. So then if he has heat unlap themselves, it'll go from being three cars in between the fourth and fifth place battle to just one. He has heat are, are up to speed. They're trying to shape it up and I wouldn't be surprised to see them send it once again like they did on Maniti. Here they come to the inside of the chase, breaking late using their new tires. They unlap themselves from inertia. Now there's nothing, no cars between inertia BS competition for fourth and fifth, Daniel. Yeah, they're going to be pushing now. They're really going to be pushing to get that fourth position, especially with inertia stuck in a little bit of traffic there. I think going up the mountain, though, they are going to get in front of that. Uh, I don't. I think that's the. What car is that? Sorry. In front of them. Oh, it's oh, the Yas Heat, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. I think they're, I don't know, the Yassi isn't looking to give them the position, so they're going to have to really try and get in front here, because you can definitely see that BS competition car getting closer. They come through Griffins, Griffiths, I don't remember the corner names. Griffins. So bad with my corner names. Uh... I'm normally okay, except at Silverstone, where that last complex of corners, I'll be damned if I know which one is Luffield, which one is Woodcote, and which one is, um, the other one. Brooklyn? Maybe? <laughs> Probably? 
Yeah, it, it's it's because with the new layout, it makes it a little bit more tricky, and then you you have Ings uh, Ingsville or something like that. Bro I know that Brooklyn's. Is... You can tell which is Brooklyn's when you go down the 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 first straight after turn four or five. Brooklyn's is in, into there because there's a big building on the right hand side that says Brooklyn's on it. I think I, I think I know the corner he's talking about. He's talking to, maybe talking about the loop and entry, which is basically the entry into the Wellington Strait. Uh, so now we're so. making the seeing the move done by. I think that is Ronin. I want to say Ronin. Yeah, that's Ronin because it's the uh, Lamborghini. So where it says eleven now says ten. Where it says ten now says eleven. They get ahead of one of the Beeler Racing Team Euronix cars. It's the number 453 with James Saunders. And an interesting purple that we don't see much of. They've got the same underlying pattern with the yellow kangaroos. That's something Tyler needs to get a look at at uh, one of the pit stops because uh, it's beautiful. But Ronan into the top 10 for the moment. Yeah, that's, that's good moves from Ronan, because they're the leading leading Lamborghini now. It was Sim RC for a while, now it is Ronan. And they've been one of the teams sending in their tweets at hashtag iRacingBathurst12. Uh, not just Ronan, but Inertia and BMW Motorsports as well. All sorts of people. And you can join them, send us your tweets, but there's a couple we're going to take a look at now. BS Competition, Bathurst doing Bathurst things. It's a fight. We have two Zebras in the top ten, and a lot can and will happen in the remaining five hours. BS Competition, you are not wrong there. Turner Motorsports, uh, just retweeting the, uh, the same tweet from BS Competition, sharing that sentiment. Inertia. Kaitasoya and Rinna doing an amazing job in the iRacing Bathurst 12. Currently fourth, with slightly different strategy to most of the teams. That's right, Inertia double stinting their tyres when a lot of the other teams, particularly Audi teams, had gone away from that strategy in the heat of the day. Sorry, I just yeah. ended up googling uh, Silverstone really quickly. So the way that it goes is first Brooklyn's, Luffield, and then Woodcut. Fantastic. <laughs> well, we had a bunch of tweets from uh, from teams there, and we would love to have plenty more coming through to the end of the race because that's a feature we're going to continue showing. Uh, yeah, what people are saying out in the Twitterverse and how they're enjoying and watching this racing. It's been good for Ronan, they've pulled away. Meanwhile, the 453 is another Audi on double stinted tyres. They're struggling because the 116 Pure Sims is down the inside at Griffin's Bend. They've got the, the uh, crown of the road, they've got the banking, they've got the momentum and they take that spot away from 10th down into 11th, down into 12th now. Fabula Racing Team Euronix. Uh, those tires really, you know, taking a toll on the majority of the cars that uh, decided to double stint and they're struggling so bad with grip, especially towards the latter portion. Well, yeah, that's why we've, uh, we've seen so many, I think, take the tires on every pit stop now because that track is so unforgiving at such a high temperature. I'm just wondering at... one thing. Go on. Oh, I know yeah. what you're normally wondering at this point in an yeah. endurance broadcast and the answer is people can enjoy pizza however they damn well please and I won't judge them for it. It's not that but thank you very much for you to say this. Uh... Mr. David Haynes, look at the gap between Jordan Cruz and Alexis Yakpala. 14, and it's going about 13.9 to 13.8. Could we see Alexi being within that one second range by the time he comes into pit stop? He's nearly being a second faster per lap. Oh, wow, he has, yeah. Just looking, though, at the, the timing, it wasn't at 14 seconds before. It, it was about 
I don't know if it was more or less. But I, I said 17 it, seconds 17? a couple laps ago. I remember saying that. Alrighty, then it has dropped down. It looks like it's actually closing in. So I think Logitech will be looking to definitely keep the pit stop probably late as they can. Try and keep the speed up. I don't know if they've noticed yet that they're closing in to start pushing. I suppose there is four hours to go. Yeah, the lap times I've seen for the last two laps has put Team Redline Ice Blue at more than a second a lap faster than Logitech G Ultis Esports, which is what they need. It, it's just a shame at the start of the stint they uh, they didn't have that same kind of advantage. And uh, racebot.tv slash endurance has the live timing. You want to follow your team, your friend, uh, your favourite uh Dutch Red Bull F1 driver, for example, just throwing it, throwing it out there. Uh, you can head to racebot.tv slash endurance. It's pinned in the YouTube chat as well. And that has all the juicy goodness with the pit stop times, which will let you know who's on new tyres, who's on old tyres. And also, who's driving which cars, what kind of lap times they're doing. Here's a handy hint. If you see a pit lane transit time of a minute, that's probably fuel only. If you see a pit lane transit time of minute 31, minute 32, they took a full set of tyres at that pit stop. That's your handy cheat sheet, uh, your little guide. To my top tip to the live timing available. Fuel Sims, having passed Beeler Racing Team Euronix. Uh, now looking good to close in Ronan Simsport and for all the different pure Sims cars we've got this one very easily identified by its yellow mirrors and the fact that the headlights flash <laughs> they're from the front where say beep beep I wonder why they have flashed the headlights there because they're not a back marker the, the Ronan Simsport so, I wonder if maybe they're just getting a bit impatient, sort of saying, come on guys, we know we're faster than you. I think it's a little bit of a, I'm not waiting when I get a run. If you see me closing in the mirrors, I'm, I'm going for it. Also, Ronan, second stint on their tyres, pure sims on newer tyres. I think the flash of the headlights is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get on the attack. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how the rest of this pack race pans out with this little battle forming. Because we have seen how a bit loose that uh, that Audi can get as we come through the Dipper here. I believe that's the Dipper, is it not? Am I wrong? No, no, the, di the Dipper is after Skyline, before the S's. That's Forest's elbow. Yep. Jan Ferguson got a run though, I think. If he makes a move, it will be on the chase and it will be very tight. Yeah, it is a good, it is a, a solid run here. Looking to the inside of the chase, the brake lights come on the Audi later than they come on the Lamborghini. And Daniel Ferguson puts Pure Sims 116 back up into 10th place. Clean move, and I think both parties knew it was happening. And that, I think, is what the earlier flash of the headlights meant. I don't think Ronan's going to let them uh, keep this position, though. I think they're going to have a go, just to try and stay in the slipstream. Maybe have a go up the inside in a lap or two. Don't have tires. Yeah, absolutely no tires for that. They're 51 laps, uh, an hour 40 minutes on that set of tires at this point. I just don't see them having the grip to carry speed out of the elbow, out of turn one. Turn one, seriously, on the track map, 90 degree left-hander. In reality, 
a little more complex than that with the crest in the middle, the shape of the curves on the exit. It, it really wants to kick the tail of the car out sideways as you come across the crest at the apex and that's where the difference between the new tyres and the old tyres matters. Can you slam the throttle open 100% at the apex of turn one and, and launch up the mountain or do you have to feather it in a little bit, manage the rear of the car sliding and not have the same quick blast momentum up mountain straight towards Griffin's Bend? And one more, th one more thing that is kind of interesting with these new the Mirror GT3 cars is that uh, they're most the majority of the GT3 cars nowadays have the dual uh, throttle control, right? The dual traction control. Dual sorry, and, no, uh, kind of a dual clutch of sorts because they have the slip and then they have the throttle, so it gets the part to the engine to keep the car stable. The more uh, rustic ones, uh, you know, they just have that one thing that kind of do everything at, at, at once. So, uh, just to see these now the new technologies based upon the GT LMs and the GTE cars coming into the GT3 ones, it's a very interesting uh, thing to see how these cars operate and how much stress it puts under the cars. I think I'm seeing one car coming in the pit lane, that's Pilar Racing Team Neuronics, the 4 or 5. Had been dropping back a little bit off these battles, I think. Whoa, whoa, I'm seeing a bit of cloud cover and it has changed from clear to partly cloudy. It hasn't changed the track temperature much at all, but that is interesting. If it's going to go potentially partly cloudy, some, some clouds about the sky moving around in the final four hours of this race that does change how they approach their strategy and when some of these teams might go back to double stinting their tires having abandoned it in the heat of the day. Tyler Max and that was the one car we were meant to get a good look at in the pit lane. Inertia carry on here we go they've got purple instead of their blue but look at that above the windshield uh, they've gone and got some yellow kangaroos into their normal Jackson Pollock pattern. I'm glad uh, you said that was purple because it still looks blue to me. <laughs> but it's more it's more purple than their normal blue. In isolation, as uh, tires go on and the Beela car pulls away, in isolation it looks kind of blue. It looks bluish. It's bluish purple. But compared to the normal deep blue, side by side, it looks really purple. Wow, that track has gotten a lot darker, that cloud cover. Sadly, no rain in iRacing yet. Uh, that would be interesting. But the cloud cover, I think, will definitely make a difference towards this later stage in the last four hours of the race. Seeing how that strategy change, if the track wants to lower its temperature just a little bit, maybe. And then immediately back out into the sunrise, and I... I'm seeing it's maybe dropped half a degree if we're lucky, 46.7. Partly cloudy often means actually like 30% clouds 70% of the time in the sunshine rather than a 50-50. So uh, I don't... Well, it's, it's the dynamic weather at work, but I'm not sure we're going to see a huge swing in the track temperatures. But it has, for the first time, stopped the temperatures from climbing. They're stalled out at... 46 and a half degrees Celsius. We're past the top of the hour, which means we are in pit stop time. Uh, obviously one of the first ones we saw was out of the Beeler 453. Soon, BMW Team Redline, uh, Urano Esports 93. Quite a lot of cars in your top 10. Be pitting soon. The last cars we're expecting to see. Uh, just like last time around an hour ago, Team Redline Orange and Logitech G Altus Esports. Well, from uh, this little mini segment here, uh, I've been David Haynes, I've had Daniel Harris with me, I've had Lorenzo Bonder as well, and Tyler Maxson producing four delicious hours still to go in the iRacing Bathurst 12 hour before we can crown a winner, before anyone can relax or can breathe and before the mountain stops causing its carnage. It's going to be our Junior Kanka party. It's going to be Justin Prince and Bo Albert.
coming up to bring coverage to the end. It's been a delight to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for watching. And of course, thank you to everyone at Racebot who makes our broadcasts possible, supports us, and helps with our graphics package as well. You don't have to click anywhere, but from David Haynes, it's goodbye, and Bathurst coverage will continue. Hello everyone and welcome back to RaceBot TV for a four hour sprint for the checkered flag here in the 2021 iRacing Bathurst 12 hours. My name is Arjuna Kankipati, back after a couple of hours on uh, backup production work, if you will, and I'm joined now by Justin Prince and uh, Bo Albert will be joining us in just a few moments time as he wraps up some uh, production work on the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup. Should be a fun run to the end then, Justin, and here we go. Four hours left, and guess who's out front? It's still Max Verstappen and Enzo Benito for Team Redline Orange. They've just outdriven people all day today. They've had a quick pace from the get-go, 204 flats. They're running two to three tenths at minimum quicker than the majority of the pack so far tonight. It has been domination from this organization. It's just a matter of can they keep the car clean to get to the checker flag to secure a big time victory for this organization. Three hours, 54 minutes still to go. And out of our 55 starters, if you can believe it, just about 34 cars still out there on track right now in the last few moments as well. Uh, Team Redline getting caught up in a number of incidents. But of course, the big losers and the big disappointment I'm sure of today will be Williams Esports after running second and third with the Mahler Racing Team on that third and final step of the podium. Minor issues for both of their cars have dropped them out of contention. And at the same time, I mentioned Team Redline. Just before we came on air, there was a small issue for BMW Team Redline. You would have seen that if you were watching the last four hours where uh, David Haynes, Dylan Coyle, Lorenzo Bonder, and Daniel Harris were taking you through the action. And as a result, BMW Team Redline now on the edge of the top 10. They are on the outside looking in in 11th position and they'll be looking to try and fight their way back up in towards the top 10. Incredibly though, Justin, thinking about the consistency and pace of the leaders out front, everyone other than the top six cars right now are one lap down and at the trend that we're going, I have a feeling it might be everyone except the podium finishes at least one lap down. Place of the trend they're currently going yet. So that's actually extremely difficult, mind you, for this type of racetrack, even in 12 hours, because it's so massive here. 3.86 miles, 23 plus turns around this facility. That's an impressive feat. But there's still plenty of time, especially with slides such as that one against the curbs. One bad slide, and things can go awry for these drivers. We are having, by the way, some brief technical issues, so please do bear with us. We will sort them out and be back in just a few moments time as uh, Enzo Benito down through the mountain works his way through Forest Elbow as well. Logitech G Altus Esports, by the way, when I last, last was on air, they were running around towards the end of the top five. They now find themselves in second. And while we've never seen an Australian team win this race before, Justin, it is good despite the fact that they are 75 seconds behind the race leaders, that for the first time, Altus Esports really looking strong so far today. Yeah, but they're under attack here with some of the various strategies here. This is Team Redline.
So apologies for that. We're now back live here on RaceBot TV, and Bo Albert has jumped into the booth. Bo, great to have you here for uh, your second iRacing special event. Just as we say that, though, your teammate has just been shoved off the track rather unceremoniously. We'll take a look at that replay in just a few moments' time. Uh, but glad to have you on board, and here we are in your homeland, and your team is doing very, very well. Yeah, they've managed to put on a great performance so far for the uh, home crowd. Of course, not too many Australian teams competing in the special events. Many more, of course. Think back a few years ago, we had the likes of Trans Tasman Racing and Evolution Racing Team uh, also diving into these special events. But no, it's down to us now. But hey, at least we can uh, fly the flag nice and high. You've just jumped over then from the Porsche Tagore Esports Super Cup. A very exciting round at Montreal. We'll get to uh, talk about some of that action maybe later on. Meanwhile, we'll take a look at that RaceBot TV replay and check out what happened to your teammate then. See exactly what went on here. And Justin, battle for second place. Contact between your two contenders. Yeah, just, you've seen the team red line ice blue machine was coming up with the pace, had the slipstream down the Conrad straight and seen an opportunity coming through the chase to be able to dive to the inside for the position. But sometimes it's so easy to just end up misjudging it just a little bit where you have one driver trying to arc in and error trying to stick it to the curb. You see the touch bit of contact ends up sending the Launcher Jick to Alta C Sports machine off in the grass. Loses them a ton of time, at least four seconds to the next car in front for position. This really is a, a two-horse race at this point in time for second. Uh, earlier in the race, the 451 Beeler Racing Euronics car was on a slightly contra-fuel strategy, but at this point in time, the cycles have maybe played out more in favor of the Logitech G-Altus Esports car, and as a result, they're down now to third. A gap between those two cars, about five seconds. This uh, race really has calmed down since the opening portions of the race. I'm not exactly sure how we managed to get through the first couple of laps without any major issues. No big crash through the cutting on lap one, which is usually where you expect things to go pear-shaped. And other than a couple of cars further back in your pack, we got through the first 60 minutes relatively unscathed. But of course, that race of attrition has started to play out. There are still some battles. It's not like there are no battles. So we'll jump towards Yas Heat and BMW Team Redline on the edge of the top 10, where I think Yao Vaz has just got passed by Jonas Wolmeyer a couple of laps ago and now sticks onto the back here. We are at this point of the race, Bo, where pitch strategy really plays itself out. And you're our GT3 expert. I do want to ask you, Audi versus uh, BMW, what's your feeling on the balance of performance that iRacing has managed to strike? I think they've actually done a phenomenal job. I think in previous special events, we have seen, you know, perhaps a more preference approach to a one particular car over the other, and we end up with a whole field of uh, one particular manufacturer as a uh, shelf has is all in the slipstream, and he may have been passed by the uh, red line car very recently, but he's not going to stay behind for too long. Easily done into uh, down Mount Straight and into Murray's Corner, so, or Griffin's Bend, sorry. So, uh, Yaz Heat moving up one extra place, but no, Iris have done a phenomenal job. I think. For once in a special event, we've actually got a real head scratcher for these teams to decide, do we want the Audi, do we want the BMW, or do we maybe throw a curveball like a few other teams in this field have, and gone for a Lamborghini as well. They've done an enormous job, um, and it's really paid off, and I think uh, we've had some great racing uh, come from that, because of course our, you know, first and second in the race at the moment are both Audis, third and fourth, well, sorry, third at the moment is a BMW, then it's a uh, Audi, but then we have a bunch of BMWs still in the top ten as well. And you do have a couple of Lamborghinis, a couple of Ferraris as well. I'm hearing that the lower splits do have slightly better distribution of the cars. You did see uh, tremendous damage to the front of Jonas Wallmeyer's car. Let's take a look off the rear wing of Yao Vaz once again here. And just before we came on air, Justin, I did mention the uh, heavy contact that uh, this BMW Team Redline car had going out of Forest Elbow. And you can see that entire front hood seems to be missing. Still able to run some pretty competitive lap times then, a 205-329 the last time around. I think that's telling of the talent when it comes to the drivers for BMW Team Redline for that organization. Many of those drivers taking part in the Porsche Tank Warriors for Super Cup on that roster for today. But the tough part that's going to be hurting them is the fact that they're hurt on the acceleration, I think, from this damage because it hurts the aerodynamics of the race car, in theory, Arjuna, and they were actually running a couple miles an hour slower in acceleration compared to the gas heat machine down that straightaway alone. 
So while they can keep up, I think, in the corners, it's going to be down these straightaways here where that damage is going to really impact them for the rest of this run. Reminder as well, by the way, live timing and scoring is available at racebot.tv forward slash endurance. If you're having some issues, just hit the refresh button with uh, some of the switchovers that we had. You saw the lagging that we had to uh, encounter as well. Live timing should be back up and running to follow along with your favorite team and drivers. Couple of cars down on pit lane then. Luca Kida in the Beeler Racing Team, Euronix 451, as well as DV1 Triton Racing and your highest placed Lamborghini in the field, Simarc Titan and their Lamborghini. There you'll see some great aerial shots. I'm not Tyler Maxson. I don't have uh, that much brain capacity to commentate and do some wonderful drone-style shots, but you can see in front as well, Ronan Simsport off the jacks as they come out of pit lane. Pit road is a very tricky place here, bro, and I don't know if you've had too many... Uh, wild encounters on your way into pit road before i certainly have <laughs> if you haven't had a wild encounter into the pit entry of bathurst you are not trying hard enough it is a really tricky one because you know we look at other circuits maybe a, a le mans or maybe even a snetterton or something of that like usually pit entrances are fairly straightforward and there's not really much of a skill to it but at bathurst it's actually a really tight pit entry and also it's a high speed pit entry You've got a chicane as well, and it's a very narrow entry at that as well. So if you are willing to push a little bit too hard and get a wheel on the grass, what you're actually going to do is fire yourself into a wall on pit entry, which is oh so embarrassing. But I tell you what, at least half of these drivers have done it in practice. You need to make sure you have your pit entrances perfect here at Bathurst. And as we see, a very close race off pit road, uh, even though it's not for exact position. But uh, Sven Haas, the Biller Racing Team, gets out on pit lane first ahead of Jersey Glock. Yeah, DV1 Triton Racing BMW. Well, you never want to come out behind a lap traffic. Haas back behind the wheel then. Everyone knows Sven Haase, big fan of the Audi R8, as is team owner Frank Bieler. You can see 68 seconds stationary. And the important thing here, Justin, of course, we saw Sven taking tires. Looks like I would expect a, another double stint potentially for Sven. And then his teammate will jump behind the wheel of the car. One more set of tires to take them to the end of the race. And that's just usually the normal strategy pattern when it comes to these types of races to try and make sure you have a set of tires for your teammate or for your respective driver rather at that time. Then when you switch, you take the fresh tires and try and get the better grip for that said driver. You don't want to end up risking a triple stint or even a double stint for a lot of the drivers when they swap on in. But when it comes to Buell Racing Team Euronics today, they're one of those teams that is among those interesting strategies we were talking about. We also have seen teams like Inertia Sim Racing on similar strategies where they're offset from the majority of the drivers and that can really shake things up for how much fuel in the end potentially I think could be pos possibly put in Arjuna as well into these cars towards the end of this race. Well, lots of talk about strategy. A couple of drivers that don't care about strategy. Max Verstappen, Enzo Benito, who's behind the wheel right now. Look at the speed that these guys are carrying over the top of the mountain. How close to the walls they dare to go. So far, I'm being very careful, Bo, because just before I signed off the end of my first commentary stint, <laughs> I think we put the commentator's curse on our about 50 different cars. Uh, but it's been going swimmingly for these guys. And I'll be honest, I was a bit concerned seeing the pace early on. Sometimes, you know, you push that hard, you make the small mistake and it comes unstuck. But for Max Verstappen and Enzo Benito, I mean, 10 out of 10, guys, it's gone perfectly so far. Yeah, it has. And again, I'm also very surprised because the thing is, the harder you push here at Bathurst, the closer the wall is you're getting, the closer to danger every single lap you're willing to risk yourself. So I was surprised to see their pace as well. But the fact is, they've held their pace. They haven't slowed down. They've kept on going. And uh, there's still not really that much of a scratch on this car. Of course, I think I see a little bit on the right side from a earlier hit at Forest Elbow from Enzo Benito as well. But he's in the car right now and he's not coming close to that wall. So it's one of those things, I think, for Enzo at the moment where if you are pushing 100% and you are 100% focused as well on what you're doing, then you can stay in the groove and actually be at less risk than if you were to push at 90% and not pay as much attention. And while he comes through turn one, also known as Hell Corner, teammate into pit lane, Alexei Yusiakla hands that car back over to the driver that started this race off, Jeffrey Rietveld. Tires going onto that car as well as it goes up onto the jacks, and he will continue to get service then. 50 seconds already stationary for the Ice Blue Machine. 
as mentioned, it does have a very distinctive uh, red line down the middle, uh, in keeping with the, the team name, of course, as well. Bo, I do want to ask you as well, We it's always nice having team members in the commentary booth to be able to talk to. Uh, in this case, though, your teammates are out on track right now. I'm sure you would be a little disappointed to not be sharing that car with them, but what do you think the next three hours and 40 minutes is going to hold for these guys as they battle with the number 87 car? It's got to be interesting because there are two completely different tyre strategies at play here, of course. We've just seen Jeffrey uh, Reitveld in the uh, Team Redline Ice Blue card take tyres that time around. But for the car you're looking at right now, we took tyres last stint. So we've actually got to change tyres twice more uh, to the end of this race. And uh, Jeffrey Reitveld and the Team Redline car, well, they've only got one set of tyres left to take. So um, in terms of the battle that's shaping up, of course, there's a little bit of a question mark over our Alter C Sports car, which dives into the pit lane right about now about what we're willing to do with tyres towards the end of the race. So we may have to go a little bit longer than we'd be comfortable with on a one set at the end of the race, but Cooper Webster and John Caruso, of course, they've been in the team for quite a while, and if there's one thing they both do not lack, it's bravery, so don't rule them out. And this, of course, I think is a track that will reward bravery in the closing stages of this race. Who's got uh, the most courage to throw that car around, get close to the wall, and really take those risks? Caruso is followed down onto pit road by uh, Yashi. Yao Vaz hands that car over to Johnny Gindi. And back into the car, Cooper Webster steps. As well, guess who's just come down pit lane? Race leader Enzo Benito. So, expecting the Dutchman Max Verstappen to get back behind the wheel then, Justin. And I think that will make our YouTube chat very happy. Yeah, Max Verstappen is a stellar driver, and we know this in real life when it comes to his Formula 1 career. But when it comes to the sim, he's on another level. We've seen him for the past couple years, Arjuna, be such a dominant driver. Whenever he jumps into the race car to be able to be smooth, consistent, and he takes a lot of bold moves that you were referring to and ends up making them time in, time out in several situations where majority of our drivers, including some of the top drivers on iRacing in some cases, may end up not risking because of the potential risks that you can take to damaging the race car. So it's been a stellar past couple of years seeing Max Verstappen on the service and just be dominant in those types of race cars, in these cars in particular. He's of course got a great team behind him. And uh, as Cooper Webster gets back up to speed, builds up those Pressures and temps into his tires will now await a return onto track of Max Verstappen. Should be an interesting year for him, because of course, brand new teammate. Who knows what that will do to reinvigorate the entire Red Bull Racing squad, and of course, as well, the brand new announcement of them purchasing the engine program from the Honda F1 uh, engine team. So that should be a very interesting progression as Jordan Caruso up, uh, sorry, Jordan Caruso's teammate Cooper Webster up in through the cutting. A little bit of damage to the right front seems to have been repaired on that car, and the sole remaining survivor of the Altus Esports trio up into the podium positions once again. Turning our attention then further back in the pack, because there are fights and we like to take a look at some action. Gregory Tanson in another one of the Beeler Racing team cars. This one is purple. Beeler Racing have done the uh, very kind thing of making life easy for the commentators up here, right behind Ronan Simsport, who are now your highest running. Lamborghinis, where's SimRC Titan drop down? Ah, they're three seconds down the road, Bo. So, going back to the point about GT3 balance of performance, these Lamborghinis, we've only got two of them, 12th and 14th right now. Yeah, and that's a very steady, you know, result for those uh, cars. Of course, they're not the most favorite cars, clearly, around here, but they are actually a very stable car compared to the Audi, and maybe they're not on the same pace. As the Audi, I always think of it as the more stable Audi, so I'm actually surprised not to see a few more Lamborghinis on track, but clearly SimRC were uh, one of the teams really willing to give it a crack and good on them for uh, managing to get it up the road there as well. And of course, Ronan as well, who are currently running uh, very high up at the moment. So uh, good to see the Lamborghinis running out there, but they are under attack right now from the uh, Bueller racing team Audi right behind. And I've got to say as well, a big kudos to uh, Bueller because I've noticed as well on the livery, it's kangaroos dotted all over the livery, which I think is just phenomenal. Well done. Let's go and take a close-up look if we can. I've been missing that. You don't get a great look there. We'll see if we can uh, sneak a closer look at that one. Uh, I do also want to ask you, Bo, I've just noticed that all three of your 
Altus Gaming teammates were in the BMW M4. What's your thoughts on what we're seeing a couple of these big teams do as well, where they've got one representative in one car? For example, SimRC Titan in the Lamborghini. We've got the SimRC Carbon car, though, that's in that BMW M4. So a bit of split strategy, and surely that splits your setup building attention as well. Yeah, and that was a big reason for us when we decided to all go into the one car. Of course, you know, everyone on the team has free opportunity, and if anyone did decide, or if there was a driver pairing that decided, hey, we actually prefer the Audi, by all means, they're absolutely open to go for it. But the entire team sort of pulled together with the idea of, if all seven of us are working towards the one setup, progress is going to happen a lot faster than if there's only three of us working on a setup. So that was our general thinking that, hey, you know, to... These events aren't easy to win. These are the best of the best events. These are the top splits. These are the events all the drivers want to win. So everyone's putting in the maximum effort. So why disadvantage ourselves by, you know, making setups across two cars, put all our eggs into one basket and see what we can make of it. So down the mountain we go in towards Forest Elbow. Tansen has managed to close onto the back of John Vining. 11 laps on the stint so far for Tansen. Vining only six laps in, so left-hand side of your screen, if you take a look now, you'll see the stint lengths for all of the different cars. Max Verstappen obviously just having come out of pit road. Couple of cars on the pit lane this time around, the likes of Pure Sims in the 116 and the 117. So pit window very much split at this point in time. As the cars work their way through the chase, Left-hand side, you can see those gaps once again. At some point, we'll have to switch that to the interval because everyone except the top three will show us one lap down, and it's not really helping you to uh, figure out where everyone is on track. And once again, if you do want to follow along with that, head on over to racebot.tv forward slash endurance so you can follow along with our ATVO live timing. Justin, this is our second special event of the year, and as it's a... Uh, kind of quiet and down as we enter the final hours of this race. I do want to ask you, it's a really fun journey. You start at Daytona, you've got these road courses, but you've also got a couple of other things spring sprinkled into this special event calendar. A couple of dirt races, both on the ovals and the road side of things. And of course as well, your NASCAR iRacing series with the Daytona 500 and a number of other full-length events. In your opinion, you have to pick one here. What's the one event that you can't miss on competing in every single year? Well, as a driver, I'm more leaning towards the oval sides. So I'm someone that always competes in the Daytona 500 in preference because that's just something as a racing fan and as a person growing up, that was one of the main races you watch is the Great American Race, the Daytona 500. So that's always the one I always compete in at least once or twice to try and complete the 500 miles, 200 laps to open up the NASCAR iRacing series, open season in particular. It's also an opportunity if you want to, to run the fixed side, if you elect to try and run, say, an extra 200 miles to add to what is essentially, in some cases, Arjuna, I could potentially do up to 1,500 miles of racing in one span of a week just in the Daytona 500s. So... To answer your question, the Daytona 500 is at least my preference on that side. But on the road side, I love when it go these special events goes to Bathurst because it's a special track that is very difficult, but it's also one that's indicative to being able to survive the mountain, as some people have put it throughout the day today. And we've seen some of these drivers survive the mountain and play with different strategies. And I think some of these teams are happy with the various strategies and how they worked out. It is a really intense challenge, once described as the Blue Hell. Uh, Keiko Shube has rather rudely inserted himself into this battle, separating out Bila and uh, Ronan for now. Keiko Shube down in 25th place. Team BMW Bank, the partnership between BS Competition and BMW Motorsport, that won the GT3 class at the iRacing 24 Hours of Daytona just one month ago, struggling a little bit more today. Nevertheless, still... Good to see Keiko Shube, Bruno Spengler sharing that car. Do you want to pose that same question to you as well, Bo? Uh, I have a feeling, given the way that Justin answered that question, uh, there's, I, there's only two answers to that question for you, potentially. <laughs> well, if you wanted a variety, you've absolutely come to the wrong person because my go-to special event of the year is actually the Daytona, not 500, but 24. 
Um, there's something about that event I just absolutely love. Every year, I'm always excited. I don't know if it's just because it's at the start of the year and it's that energy to get into the new year and make it a good one, but that event is super special, running around the clock for 24 hours. It's a little bit more relaxed than uh, something like the Bathurst 12 hours or even Sebring 12 hours where it's really physical or uh, you know mentally draining track like here at Bathurst where you're constantly darting in between walls. Daytona is a bit more relaxed. You can sort of get into the flow a little bit more. And uh, I think I'm also slightly biased with uh, what happened in 2019 for me, but uh, Daytona 24 is a great event. But at the same time, I'm also a big fan of uh, the 24 hours of Nürburgring as well. So um, those are my go-tos, but uh, of course, 12 hours of fun as well. And Bathurst 12 hour isn't a race I've really particularly gotten around to uh, competing in iRacing for one reason or another. But one of the reasons for that really is just because of how stressful this race is. Because I would often say that doing a, Ooh, you know, sorry. a one hour stint. Sorry, Go bro. I'm going to cut you off here. What's just happened to oh, Pearson's no. at the top of the hill? David Baker is at about a six point turn and looks to still have some significant damage to his car. That looks like it's going to need a tow back to pit lane. I'm not sure if you really want to try and go down the mountain as, ooh, here comes last year's ooh. race winners, VRS Coanda. And indeed, here comes that tow back to pit road. Take a look at this race bot TV replay. And Bo, since I rather rudely cut you off, walk us through what you see. Yep, well over the crest here, and the car does get light off him, but oh, he's just done that all on the curb himself, and unfortunately a, a little bit of a rough collision into the inside wall there, but what has happened is as the car is loaded and squatting down on the right side due to the high-speed compression, when he's got onto the curb with his right rear tyre ever so slightly, it's unloaded the car massively, and what you're going to see on the steering wheel here is a big change of uh, opposite lock immediately on the curb. But really, he doesn't even bother fighting that too much. The second you get that curb, the car is gone. And hard into the wall goes the 117. And I've got a feeling it's in the pits right now. I don't think it's leaving anytime soon. One more look at that. You can actually see it embeds itself in the wall so much that <laughs> it uh, emerges from the other side. So back to live pictures, we will go. That car's still stationary on the pit road. Uh, Bo, to get back to the point that we were talking about there, I'm a bit surprised, to be honest, uh, Australian motorsports fan here, that... The Bathurst 1000 doesn't even come into the equation for you. No, not at all. But some people will always say I'm not particularly an Australian because of that. There's something about a V8 supercar of Bathurst that just does not work in my vocabulary, does not work for me as a driver at all. Um, and believe me, in the Australian forums, I get roasted extremely hard for that. But no, it's not something for me. But if you were to look at Australia as a global, um, you know, a global average of what their favorite special event, the Bathurst 1000 would win by trunks and tops. So, uh, position switch, by the way, is Five Star Motorsport and Max Reedmuller down the inside into the chase of R8G and Nicholas Verone. R8G who have signed up so many new people that I've lost track of uh, some of the new drivers. Verone has to contend with a lot of damage to that front end of that car. And looks like Pure Sims coming from behind as well. That's the sister car, the 116. Dion Fialo is driving in that car. Not sure exactly if you can help me here, Bo. Isn't Dion a member of Mivano? Well, I was going to pose the same question to you, Arjun, and that is exactly what I thought. So perhaps a guest appearance happening here today. There are a few guest appearances. Moritz Lohner, of course, was... Uh, Driving as part of the Coanda team, he qualified and brought that car to the green flag. Not being the smoothest run for your defending race wi uh, winners, but nevertheless, interesting there. Still a battle on the edge of the top 20. Dakota Fripp joins the fun for Vendaval Sim Racing. And it's been an up and down day for Vendaval Sim Racing, but Justin, you know, endurance racing, especially here at Bathurst, it really is that never say never attitude where matter even if you get a little bit of damage early on, you've got to fight on back and for the Vendaval number 13 car, going quite well at this point in time. Yeah, even though they have a little bit of that back wing damage, that car has been handling nice and well. It's been quick. They had a bit of a moment in the pit lane where they nearly knocked into a tire barrier about 10 minutes ago, but outside of that they've had some clean racing. They've stayed in this grouping with 5 Star Motorsport and RHE Esports. And I think it's just a matter of trying to save, try and think of big picture. And if you don't want to go on the save route, just wait for the opportunity to get the run to make a move. Because you can't, of course, just laser focus yourself in too deep unless you do this. Oh, that's very and deep. Then you do that. Contact made. 
Uh, Nim's going to have a rather angry note, I think, after this one. Uh, race control, of course, does have their part to play. And let's take a look at that RaceBot TV replay from up above. This coverage brought to us by ATVO down the inside and that contact made from behind. Not sure in this case, Justin, if Verone could really do too much. Yeah, that was a little bit too deep to say the least. I was very surprised he actually went for the move there because before we've seen the contact for second place with a similar dive from that. This time though, he's just trying to hit the racing line and all of a sudden he's got a car just trying to stick to the groove and just hopes to not go in the marbles. That's where the contact comes into play and now there's some damage on Verone's car. A big dent on the front end of that machine. It's not like it was looking too uh, factory fresh even before that slight contact but with about 30 minutes left to work for some of these cars. Verone does owe us a pit stop in the next about seven laps or so, so he'll come down, potentially get some damage repair as well. Let's jump forward in towards the top seven, because here is Urano Esports and Daniel Pastor chasing down the Bila Audi in front. And over the last couple of laps, though, I have a feeling that Sven Haas has very slowly been dropping off the pace as compared to the Audi behind. Yeah, absolutely. You only have to look at the previous lap to see three tenths of a second hemorrhaged from the gap between the two cars there. So the Urano Esports car, Daniel Pasta, who is a super, super talented driver, always has been and is just getting stronger and stronger. Well, he's only getting stronger and stronger in the race as well. He's closing down the Beeler Racing Team car at the moment. And I think it's a matter of time uh, before he gets in the draft, which is around 1.2 seconds or so. And uh, from there, he'll be able to reel in the uh, driver Sven Haas very, very quickly and uh, get a pass maybe happening or you may even just decide, hey, I might just sit here, save a bit of fuel. And I'll see you when the pit stops. So at the start of the broadcast as well, we talked about the track temperature increasing to sweltering levels. And there you can see it's dropped three degrees. At one point, it was at 49 degrees Celsius. Not exactly sure how the tires are holding on in these stints, but as you can tell by the Lap time fall off since we started today's race. The fastest lap, a 201.555. Last time around for Max Verstappen, your race leader, a 204.266. So almost three seconds of fall off. And Max Verstappen is on tires that are only six laps old, Justin. And that was with traffic too, mind you. So still, he's turning some of the fastest laps on the racetrack, despite all of that. He's just finding the right moments to do so. But when it comes to the tires, of course, some of the drivers are able to stretch it around, and that's where you see the double stints come into play. It's just a matter of maintaining and keeping those tires cool in a proper temperature window. Because it's essentially like a curve where you have a peak optimal temperature that you want the tires to be. Once you pass that peak, you just start dropping exponentially down from optimal performance to average to struggling to turn the race car. And that's where you either see a car start to push or start to get really loose. With these tires, you need to know exactly what you need to do for setup wise and driving wise to make sure you don't light up those tires, whether it's something in terms of how you build the car or something in regards to how you hit the throttle, how smooth you are on the throttle, how smooth you are on the brakes, all that comes into play to make sure you manage and keep those tires in a consistent and calm and cool scenario to make sure they don't overheat and don't burn off in these temperatures. And you, you want to know just how well Max Verstappen has taken to the sim world? Look at the first three laps after his pit stop. A 204-027 a 029 and then a 043. The level of consistency on display from the Dutch F1 superstar is absolutely incredible. And to be quite honest, Bo, uh, I'm not exactly sure, even in the simulator, someone as talented as Max Verstappen, still rather incredible to pull that one off. Absolutely. It's, uh, I don't know if it's a little bit of luck to get within that level of consistency of such a ridiculous proportion, but absolutely. How can you possibly understate the talent of Max Verstappen? He's a one of a kind. He genuinely is ultra quick, and he's just put in a 2040, which compared to all the other cars around him is well in excess of half a second a lap faster. So he's pumping in the quick laps. He's comfortable doing it, and he has been since our you know, 
zero of this race is uh, on another level and it is great to see you know, just what is capable of a gt3 car here at bathurst because quite simply max verstappen is at the absolute limit so it doesn't get any better than this Let's jump on board, I tell you what, and let's go for a, a couple of laps here. Bo, why don't you, the next time we come across the start-finish line, I'm going to put you on the spot. You're going to take us through a hot lap here. On this lap, though, Justin, I want to ask you something slightly different, because I think you nailed it just a few moments ago when you talked about the managing of the tires and, and really optimizing how you heat them up, because I think that really is something that a lot of teams will not necessarily understand. When it comes to the top level of sim racing, you go... You have engineers on the background that are helping work on things, and they're analyzing all sorts of things. Oh, who's that off in the grass? Lubomir Schweitz, who's had a really awful day, it must be said, down in 36th place. Oh, we'll take a look at that replay, but I do want to ask you, Justin, about how you think the real racers transition that ability into the sim world. It really depends on driver to driver in some cases and their equipment, because in some cases, it's been smooth transitions. I've seen many different drivers on the oval and road course side immediately click and have performances. And others, they start off by doing what we see here. Go off into the sand trap and struggle early on and then have spins such as this. It can take some time and adjustment periods for a couple of different drivers to be able to get used to it. Take, for example, Jimmy Johnson. We've seen him in the Pro Invitationals last year. He was somebody that took a bit of time to be able to get used to how things handled. Then you have... The comparison, on the other hand, to drivers like Denny Hamlin, who had years of experience in his youth, who immediately were able to make things click. So lap so on board, Bo, take us through it. Absolutely. So breaking hard after the 100 meter board for turn number one, held corner, second gear, and here, sacrifice your entry, get that exit right, because that exit speed is being propelled all the way down Mountain Straight. And as you can see in front of us, there's elevation change and plenty of it. So your exit speed is multiplied all the way up to Griffin's Bend. You're looking for the little Astra or the uh, little service road on the left side of the track there. Third gear, really cambered corner. So hold it as tight as you can. Open up the exit once again as we head towards the cutting. A very tricky section of corners. It's a double apex, essentially. There's the first one, the kink, and then fire it into the second part as well. Again, using the camber, short shift up to third over these bumps, and then it's all about hitting your marks. It's high speed. It is so quick over the top. It's commitment. Get your line right through the grate. Get a big compression in the car. Flick it to the left. How close to the wall are you willing to get? all the way over the top of the mountain. You can see in front, all you can see is sky. Why? Because we're at skyline, and from here, it's all downhill, plunging all the way down towards the dipper, right to the left again. Of course, traffic, that's difficult. You can't see your reference points around you, blinded the entire way down. Under brakes into forest elbow, right behind the BS competition car. Again, slow in, fast out, hit your marks. Because again, it's a long, long straight. Conrod straight is a great passing opportunity as well. And what you're going to see here is a master of overtaking. See what he can do in setting up a move on the BMW of lap traffic in front of him. Moves to the inside, and then is, is a fast corner. 270 kilometers an hour, breaking at the 150. Tuck it into the apex, but don't clip the curb. Again, focus on the exit. Bring it all the way over to the right once again. You've got one corner to go. Deceptively tricky. It's Murray's corner. Hard on the brakes. Again, don't touch the curb. Fire yourself to the exit to complete a lap of Mount Panorama and stop the clock at a time of 2.04.1. He is not slowing down, Arjuna. That was only a couple of tenths slower than the lap before. And he was stuck behind lap traffic coming down the mountain. Absolutely incredible stuff. And we'll try not to uh, focus too much of our attention out front because uh, Verstappen is very, very comfortable at this point in time. Let's turn our attention back to this battle that we were watching just a few minutes ago. Gregory Tanson now finds himself in the meat of the Lamborghini sandwich. The only one on offer in today's menu, because of course these are the only two Lamborghinis in today's field as well. There have been some big movers and shakers have these two Lamborghinis cars as we jump on board with the second one in line. SimRC Titan, who are up, if you can believe it, 15 positions. The Lamborghini in front of them, though, Justin, that's uh, Ronin Simsport. They're up 36 spots. 
Yeah, that has been an impressive drive, and I was following along on social media with the hashtags for today's event. There's a lot of happy people at the Ronin Simsport camp. They're on that alternate strategy, though, from just about a majority of the field, though, so that's going to make things a bit more tricky for how they're going to play things for the final hour or so in this one. But for drivers like John Vining for them today, they've kept it smooth, they've kept it clean. I've been impressed with what I've seen from them so far today and been able to outpower drivers like Tansen and Jamie Moon as well throughout the day. It's just been about picking your spots as we've seen today. The curious part is gonna be, how will Tansen try and get by him? Because that Ronin Simsport machine, it's been around that 11th position for the past couple hours or so. You talked about the Twitter machine, so uh, let me turn my attention over to the laptop sitting on my right-hand side and fire up the Twitter machine. There is Ronin Simsport can follow them at Ronin Sim and you can stay involved as well using the hashtag iRacingBathers12. Awesome job so far from these guys. Two thirds of the ways through. Still a long way to go though. A couple of other tweets as well. Let's cycle through them. Inertia Sim Racing, who are uh, up in fifth position. The last car on the lead lap right now. They've done a smashing job after a very late submission of their paint as per usual couple of other questions as well before we get to the one that i wanted my to focus my attention on uh, here's turner motorsports still staying in touch with us and you can go zebra spotting at the 12 hours of sebring in just under three weeks time excited to see everything that's going to be on display then and then most importantly the uh, the reason why i turned my attention to the twitter machine what is your favorite type of fox and why is it blue so, Bo, I'm going to put you on the spot here first. Uh, what is your favorite type of fox? And, uh, yes, why is it blue? Well, the reason why my favorite fox is blue, because I was once told by a friend who goes by the name of Eiffel65 that I'm blue dubba dee dubba die. Um, but my more important question is, what noise does a fox make? <laughs> um, I think if you go on YouTube, there's a viral video that will help you out there. Um... Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, Perfect. You uh, cracked me up with that one, though, Bo. Uh, yes, uh, I'm blue. Da now I've got it stuck in my head as well. So, uh, <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so damn you, that's for sure. Justin, do you have any type of an answer here? There's different types of foxes. That was my first indication. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately here, Puist, a uh, couple of us uh, unsure exactly what you're getting at. Um, what is um, a blue fox? Inertia's... Well, Inertia's logo has a blue fox. Is it blue or is it green? It's both. <sighs> it's tealish blue. Shame. It's... Where is the fox on their car this year? Let's go. Let's take a look at the aerial coverage brought to us by ATVO, and let's see if we can zoom on in and figure this out. Um, there you can see... I, I don't think... I call any part of this car blue, personally, but nevertheless, um, I will agree, this is a rather nice blue fox. Why is it my favorite? Well, because they're up in the top five, and uh, they managed to submit their paint on time. How about that one? <laughs> As their back bumper says, they're, they've outfoxed much of the competition today. They have indeed, you know. They, uh... Struggled for pace, I thought, in the opening stages of the race. They've been very steady in working their way up through the field. And now behind 13th place Sim RC Titan in that Lamborghini, still embroiled in the scrap with Bila Racing and Ronin Sim Sport in front. 12 minutes to go then until the conclusion of another hour here live from Mount Panorama. Three hours to go once we get to that point. Still about nine laps away from some of these cars needing to come down the pit lane. It will be Bueller Racing Team in the 453, the first car down. But big gaps have started to open up throughout the entirety of the field. So I tell you what, let's turn our attention over to uh, the reason why we were slightly late making that transition over from uh, the previous set of commentators, the Porsche Esports Super Cup. I want to get a bit of an update from you guys because you were both busy on the production for that. And while I was keeping my eye on it, while I was uh, sitting here at Bathurst, it does sound like the uh, championship fight continued to uh, intensify. Well, yes, indeed. And first things first, it was a race where patience 
was a virtue because there was plenty of attrition for those who watched alone in Montreal because it's similar to the tightness here, Arjuna, of the walls. And a lot of that came into play with some of the incidents, especially in the mid-pack, but the sprint race was dominated by Joshua Rogers. But here's the kicker. The feature race, Bo, featured a lot of potential point shakeups. Yeah, absolutely, of course. With the inverted grid, everything got turned on its head with Josh Rogers being sent all the way back down to uh, position 8. And what that meant was actually Mitchell de Jong would start on the front row, not pole position, but on the front row. But he got the start. He drove a brilliant race and had to work hard for it. Kevin Ellis Jr. and Thomas Taltala did not let him go all race long, but Mitchell held his nerve. And, of course, the feature race is where the big points are. So at the end of the day... Mitchell de Jong actually clawed back a few points from Josh Rogers. So in terms of the title fight, absolutely. It's still game on, even if it does look a little bit great for uh, Josh Rogers at the moment. I think he had, what, like a 100-something point advantage coming into the More race weekend? Enough. So he can afford a few bad weekends is what I'm kind of getting at. But nevertheless, uh, sets very demanding standards for himself. And he'll be looking to hopefully try and secure that championship before we get to the final round at Monza, always known as... A bit of a lottery, but there are some longer tracks coming up, including uh, Circuit de la South, as well as personal favorite, the Nürburgring Nordschleife, which, uh, if you're curious and enjoy racing around there, the uh, NTT IndyCar Series will head there in week two of the next season of official iRacing competition, so that should be uh, one of the more interesting combinations you can drive on the iRacing service. And of course, every day is race day, so if you're watching along, thinking you want to get out on track as well, head on over to iRacing.com to start your iRacing career and maybe look at competing in this race in 12 months' time because we've got a lot of endurance races, but the one thing that you know, GT3 cars in Bathurst, if you want to take the win, you'll have to wait until next February. Hopefully, we'll also get the real race returning as well. There is V8 supercars action from the real Mount Panorama because of the unfortunate cancellation of the Bathurst 12. Race number one yesterday. I was watching that just before I went to bed. Very interesting race. Race two today might be even better. And the crazy thing, if you ask me here, Justin, is the lap time delta between a GT3 car, all of its mon uh, you know modern, fancy, high-tech driver assists and all of that, it's only a couple of seconds faster around the 23 corners of Bathurst then a V8 supercar and the sheer grunt than that car has. That's incredible to say the least in terms of that pace, but it just shows again some of the raw power that's in the V8 supercars. I remember last year there was a special event in 2019, I believe it was, with the supercars here at this track, in fact, at the time to replicate the Bathurst 1000. And it was an entertaining race because it's similar to that of stock cars for some more so towards the next gen car coming up for nascar for example in terms of how they are projected and currently drive uh, to where they can take some contact they can take some bumping and banging they can put on some great action there's a reason supercar racing is a beloved part of motorsport culture in australia I don't know if you can call it a culture sometimes. Uh, I grew up watching uh, Top Gear, so uh, I was it was drilled into my brain, uh, Bo, that it was more of a drinking competition and then a big fist fight at the end of it as well. <laughs> I would love to prove you wrong, but there is nothing I can do to prove you wrong. That just about sums it up. Well, it sounds like uh, Top Gear was actually factual on one thing. Uh, I do remember the, uh, the thing that always cracks me up about Mount Panorama was when there was, of course, that year when they were trying to limit the amount of alcohol that fans would be bringing to the track. And so what did they do? Of course, they went and buried their uh, alcohol at the circuit before the, the weekend so they didn't have to drive with it into the facility. Um, only an Australian, I think, would do that. But uh, nevertheless, like, I'm sure that would have been a very entertaining <laughs> place. David Haynes has some stories to tell about the mountain. One day I will hear all of them. Bo, I'm not sure if you've got some as well. 
<laughs> I don't have any from Bathurst, but I've been very lucky to meet up with uh, David Haynes many, many times over the years from the Grand Prix and, you know, of course, the cancelled Grand Prix over the years as well. Um, and I've heard many of his stories and uh, I would love to tell you some of them, Arjuna, on his behalf, but uh, not many are broadcastable. I don't think any are broadcastable, <laughs> to be honest. There was one that he was talking about in our production chat. And I was very much hoping that they weren't talking about it on air as well. Six minutes to go until the top of another hour. We'll take a RaceBot TV fan immersion after the conclusion of the first pit stop cycle. But for now, continuing to watch the cars roll themselves around the track. Trying to see if there's any battles happening. Because the gap between first and second is almost up. To 90 seconds now. Max Verstappen continues to run around with some of the most consistent pace out of any of the cars out on track. His teammate doing a good job holding off Cooper Webster. That gap between second and third is up to about 13 seconds. And interestingly, BS competition is being brought into the fight very slightly. They're only seven and a bit seconds between behind rather that Logitech G Altus car. So three hours to go, still a long way before any of these cars can really start to take a sigh of relief. We did see with the Williams Esports teams when they were running second and third, one mistake, doesn't have to be your mistake, could be the end. And so we will watch and see in front of these guys, BMW Bank, they're battling it out with the Vendaval Sim Racing pink car that we saw going quite wildly through the chase a couple of laps ago. Dakota Fripp has recovered to 22nd place. And there is an incident limit in effect for this race, Justin, but you will notice, mm -hmm. uh, because of the amount of damage that these cars take, uh, I don't think there's too many cars really in any danger of hitting that incident limit. Uh, getting a 4X is much harder than getting a 0X here. Yeah, and of course some drivers have had incidents where they've gotten 2Xs, obviously, but as long as you don't hit somebody, I think you're definitely safe because there's not too many places where we can get one incident point situations and going off in the grass unless you really cook a corner in some of these sections. For the most part, things are smooth. As long as you don't do this, you're okay. <laughs> as long as you don't get out onto the grass, dip a wheel, break there, and then go flying as well. Dion Fialo, the unfortunate uh, victim, managed to do a smashing job of straightening that car up and getting it through the grass without taking any more damage. We'll take one more look at it from this aerial look, as always, brought to us by ATVO. And you were just saying there, Justin, uh, very easy to make this mistake. Absolutely. Because here at this racetrack, and at many racetracks, you're just trying to follow the racing line, and for many, it's a matter of inches. You go off that racing line by a couple inches, you either lose some time or you have that happen. Top situation again for Piel, but a great save for the guest driver for that team today. Yeah, did a great job to hang on to that car. Back to live pictures we go. On board once again with Gregory Tanson working lap 26 in his stint. A little bit of fuel saving down into the braking zone, helping to extend that stint out just very slightly. Lamborghini in front clatters himself all over the curbs. And he did allude to it earlier, Bo, but... Of course, the Lamborghini and the Audi, they do share a lot of similar characteristics, but it's not fair to say they are exactly the same. And in fact, this Evo version of the Hurricane that we have has been de developed by the Dallara team just that little bit more. So it is very distinctive compared to the Audi that we're on board with right now. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I think the thing that shocks a lot of people between these two cars is the fact they actually share an identical chassis. You could, you know, strip an Audi R8 and just about pair it with a uh, Lamborghini Huracan very easily with almost no troubles. But uh, absolutely, there's a lot more development that goes into the aero, the engine, the drivetrain, all kinds of things that uh, make these two very different cars at the end of the day. And if you drive them on iRacing, the characteristics are very obvious as well. You will notice the Lamborghini is a little bit more twitchy under brakes, but much more stable overall, whereas the Audi is a car that is constantly quite loose. It's a car you really have to hustle in a few places on track. But if you can do that, the lap time is there over the Lamborghini. So strengths, weaknesses, it's all a part of balanced performance. And uh, the Lamborghini and the, the Lamborghini and the Audi are just another story of that. 
And these new cars that we're getting on the iRacing service, of course, the Lamborghini Huracan and the BMW M4 GT3 cars added in the same build to the iRacing service. The BMW, not a fully homologated GT3 model yet, but when it does get that final certification, we'll get the final updated version on the iRacing service as well. For now, we've got a prototype version that's made its debut in official BMW competition in the virtual world. How do you know it was official, you ask me? Well, BMW tweeted about it. That's how I know it's official. In the modern age, if you tweet about it, uh, it must be uh, real. That car has been competing in the digital NLS series as well, which you can catch, I think, coming up in a couple of weeks' time as they return for another round, as the mix of pro drivers and sim drivers go racing around the Nürburgring Norschleife. VCO Esports supporting that and the next time we go racing for an iRacing special event it will be part of the VCO Grand Slam the 12 hours of Sebring where Racebot TV and Radio Show Limited will partner up for once again continued coverage of iRacing special events you can catch it on Racebot TV as well as Radio Show Limited's radio channels as well it'll be a very exciting time to uh, get that partnership underway once again. These cars work their way through some lap traffic as Inertia in their Audi as well gets on past these two. And the Audi and the Lamborghini will get reacquainted once again. Jamie Moon doing a good job to hang on to the tail, but here comes the race leader, Max Verstappen, with a 90 second buffer over the rest of the field. If I'm doing the math, Justin, based on the pace that we're seeing from Max Verstappen, last time he did a 203.854, it's going to be about the last hour by the time he's uh, lapped every single car in this field. Which would be absolutely unbelievable. And he's done it before. Him and his organization has done it before in the Red Line Orange Machine. In one of the Red Line Machines in general. I think back to Circus Spa Francochamp back in 2019, I believe it was. One of the first major virtual races where Max Verstappen was a part of Lando Norris was also a part of that action at the time where they lapped the field. But remember, Verstappen's brake pedal broke at that time with about, what was it, 20, 25 minutes ago, to go rather. They had a big enough buffer where by the time they had the tow and were able to get a new driver in the car, where they still were able to come away with the victory by a good amount of time, by at least a few seconds or so. So this amount of time to just keep on chugging along and keep the tempo going is going to be vital in case anything happens because you want to have that buffer just in case something happens. Yeah, anything can happen. It can be a hardware failure like it was for Verstappen at Spa. Very analogous to technical failure on a car as well. It could also be, uh, unfortunately, just the limitations of technology. Sometimes we've had a few issues with... Uh, Internet, for example, I was not meant to be producing this portion of the race. That was meant to be uh, former world champion Hugo Luis. He's got no internet right now in Brazil, so stepping on up and no problem whatsoever. I'm not sure, Bo, what the most unfortunate issue you've ever had during a race was. I can think back to a couple of times back when I used to be competing much more regularly of, you know, unfortunate in uh, instances rather, you know, net code or whatever it might be, where you sometimes feel just a little bit ticked off. Yeah, absolutely. I, in fact, the most unlucky thing I think I've ever had happen to me in a sim race actually only happened maybe two weeks ago where I did a full-on Max Verstappen. I was in a rallycross league that I competed in, went for the brake pedal only to realize the brake pedal had actually collapsed and uh, the car was not going to be stopping in time. So that was the one thing that has ticked me off, but also sort of taught me in some ways to sort of, you know, do more regular maintenance of my brake pedal as such as well. But there are so many things that can happen in a race that are just completely out of your hands. Like you say, like an internet failure or net code or even a mechanical issue of some kind. Like I spoke about with my pedal or even a wheelbase malfunctioning or something of the like. A lot of people think of sim racing as just a virtual entity where the only way things can go wrong is if you've put the car in the wall. That's not always correct. There are outside forces and, you know, all kinds of things that can go wrong to a three or day off of a, it's a designated path. 
And as Julian Bell is just thrown into our YouTube chat, uh, your graphics card could uh, catch fire. Uh, head on over to RaceBot's <laughs> YouTube to see Will Vincent having a panic attack. Ooh, last year at the 12 Ooh. hours of Sebring, Verstappen goes a little bit deep under braking trying to get past some lapped cars. That's not going to cost him too much time. But for the first time, a small mistake then from the Dutchman as Gregory Tansen down onto pit road for Beeler Racing Team in the 453. Ooh, small mistake there, Justin, and you can't afford small mistakes at a place like this. That actually ended up losing him, I think, about a second or so because he ended up getting a little too optimistic. It's the same thing we've talked about and seen a couple times. You think you got a chance to outbreak somebody into the chase, you end up missing the corner and you go off in the marbles. And once you go off in the marbles, the, you just lose grip and it's just difficult to try and stop the car from then on out. For Max Verstappen, a good job to be able to keep it out of the grass and keep himself in that line to make sure he didn't come across the other cars there who were battling for position. But this is why you build a buffer, right? If you have small mistakes build up into more and more and more and more mistakes, you have that time in hand just in case. I tell you what, the pit window is still a couple of laps away from opening for the front runner, so we're going to step aside, take our first RaceBot TV fan immersion of this uh, last portion of the coverage. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here live on RaceBot TV, and we'll treat you to a couple of laps on board with Inertia Sim Racing in their Audi R8 GT3. Let's go down the mountain then in the number 24.
Hello and welcome back to RaceBot TV and continued coverage of the iRacing Bathurst 12 hours. Three hours left on our race clock then here on our second special event of the year. And it's F1 superstar Max Verstappen that has a 90 second advantage over the rest of his competitors. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati alongside for the remaining portion of today's coverage is Justin Prince and Bo Albert and we've got TV cameras from trackcams22.com and additional car cameras from RaceBot's own Tyler Maxson. You can follow along with live timing and scoring at racebot.tv forward slash endurance and stay connected with your favorite team and driver throughout the entirety of today's action. So it is a big gap out front but the pit window is now open. We've had a couple of cars down onto the lane over the last few laps. Grano Esports, SimRC Titan, as well as DV1 Triton Racing and Miniti Racing, a couple of the cars coming down onto the road. Let's take a look then at a RaceBot TV replay while we were under fan immersion. So it looks like young hotshot Quinton Violate for RAG Esports has had a bit of an issue coming over the top of the hill, down through Skyline, and he gets it all sorts of wrong, Bo. And I think that might be... Uh, Slightly disappointing day then for Quinton Violate. Yeah, of course, Quinton is extremely young. He's got obviously a very bright future ahead of him in the world of sim racing. But, you know, to get ahead in sim racing, you have to learn from mistakes sometimes. And he's going to learn from this one, unfortunately. A, a very tricky spot to be in. Just lost the car of a Skylar on the grass. Couldn't quite get it settled again before it got back to the tarmac. And it dug into the wall fairly heavily on the impact as well. So. That won't be race ending for them. They'll absolutely soldier on and uh, see what they can make of it. But by all means, it's going to hurt their uh, confidence. It's going to hurt their lap times too. Somehow, I'm very impressed. Pointed in the right direction at the end of it. Down through the mountain, they plunge. And they keep going. Back to live pictures. Pit lane, a very busy place. As here comes Rainer Talvar down into his box. As well as Oscari Rene, who we're just riding on board with through that fan immersion. Ronan Simsport and John Vining in their Lamborghini coming down onto the road as well. So lots of pit stops with two hours and 50 minutes still to go. And that means two more pit stops left to go after this one, Justin. And for many of the drivers, their strategies are, for the most part, solidified from this point on. If you make any major mistakes from now, it's going to be very costly if you have to make any extra pit stops. So at this rate, I think at the most part, everyone's feeling nice and comfortable. Drivers are making it about 30 laps or so, 29, 30 laps on their stints. Currently, Max Verstappen projected to go into the pits in about five, six laps at this rate. So right now, you're just locked into your situations and strategies right now. Some of these drivers are going to have to take a lot extra fuel and have a bit heavier car towards the end, while others who are able to keep their cars clean or in a situation when they can try and underfuel the car a little bit, potentially, depending on when their stops are at this moment. It is a very weird experience uh, listening to these cars coming down the mountain because there are constant noises as cars get to the limit, as close to the limit as they can, and then go beyond the limit and touch the wall as well. I feel like every time Verstappen makes his way down the hill, plunging down from Skyline, I hear a little bit of contact. No speed is being lost on that car. Last time, 2.03.937. Curious what the lap time is going to be this time around. Let's see how consistent he's being then throughout the course of this stint. 24 laps so far as he comes through the final corner. Murray's looks very, very tidy, it must be said. And that lap time then is going to be a 2.03.836. So very consistent then from Verstappen here, Bo. And as we enter these final stages of the race, he's definitely looking like that's the quickest car out on track. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. That car has looked rock solid all race long. And, you know, for those of us at Altus, we went for the BMW because we thought it was a more stable option. We thought maybe the Audis would struggle. This Audi right here has not struggled even slightly. Neither of the red line Audis have. They've been rock solid all day, haven't put a foot wrong. And that's why they're 1-2 at the moment. They deserve the place they've been in. Because, you know, to run a race around Bathurst, you have to walk on a tightrope. And at the moment, they've not lost their balance even once. And even though there has been a slight pace disparity, I mean, you don't build up a 90-second advantage without having the fastest car on track. Team Redline Ice Blue, like you say, definitely looked like the second most comfortable car throughout the entirety of today's action. The sister car for Team Redline hasn't been so comfortable. We talked about the immense damage on the front of the... BMW Team Redline car. They've come down pit lane. 
now tucked up behind Jamie Moon in the CMRC Titan car. And I am quite in in just incredulous, Justin, as to the extent of the damage to the front clip on this BMW and to the lap times that Jonas Walmart is still able to do. And again, this just shows the talent of Walmart, where I think it's where in the mountain he's been able to see the best at compared to some of these our drivers and our cars at the moment. Even when stuck in traffic, the problem has been, which is hurting them, I think, for at least about, at least maybe a second or so per lap, is that damage is hurting their chances to close up to anybody. So that's just going to be the tough balance for these competitors today, as now they have the Kova car coming right behind in them, as well as several other cars who are battling for various positions. So this is going to be tricky for them. They have already pit, keep in mind, their four laps into a stint. So they work through the final corner as well. Reminder that it's not just this top split that's happening today. We got word that 32 different splits in today's action and VCO Esports wants to hear from all of you. You can head over to either their Discord, uh, which I'm sure you can find the link on the Twitter machine, or on Twitter using the hashtag VCO content, or I guess V content, uh, if you're going to say that correctly. They want to see all of your input and share all of the racing action that all of you guys get to get to experience here on the iRacing service. VCO Esports doing a great job of combining and blurring the lines between real and virtual motorsport. And this coming Wednesday, if you want to continue watching racing action, the VCO Pro Sim Series does return with two rounds left in that championship. Be very interesting to see. Max Verstappen returns to that competition, sharing a car with 10K Beneke at some point in time. Or if Lorenzo Colombo will continue to do a fill-in for a Max Verstappen. He's done a very good job as the Verstappen replacement. But it would be good to have Verstappen in the car. One driver that we know will not be competing in this weekend's, uh, this week's rather, VCO Pro Sim will be Roman Grosjean, who has been one of the biggest supporters of the series since its inception. But of course, Grosjean will be in my uh, neck of the woods. He will be testing an Indy car at the WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca in his bid to get up to racing speed in the build-up to the NTT Indy car season. I'm not sure, by the way, Justin, if you saw some of the lap times that were coming in from Barber Motorsports Park where Grosjean got his first ever taste of the Dallara IR18, but not too bad. And for uh, the first couple of days in a brand new car and a brand new series, very much looking like he'll be a contender uh, come this season. Yeah, absolutely. And keep in mind, Roman Grosjean, among the drivers, we're making the transition over from Formula 1 to IndyCar. I think you're referring to as well. So it's going to be vital to be able to have a lot of simulator experience, to be able to learn some of these tracks and learn the marks he may not have had the experience at in real life before. So all of that's going to be extremely vital for him for 2021 to say the very least to see how he does for this season on that side of the motorsports world and of course his esports team in operation today they've had three or four different cars that took to the green flag and weirdly the junior outfit which uh, again we don't need junior teams in sim racing everyone's already young enough but the junior team the highest place Runner for the outfit right now, Elliot Veyron in 20th position. This is Gordy Much, who, of course, will, I'm sure, be slightly embarrassed as to what happened at the start of the race. Um, not sure exactly how to put this, bow, but he, he, <laughs> he, he pressed on the setup that had the wrong Yuck. amount of fuel. Yes, I was watching the opening hours, and uh, I should say, in Gordy Much's case, the opening 30 minutes of the race, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, it was a, such an easy thing to do, and there have been times, you know, I think back to the, uh, when I competed in the Rallycross World Championship where I have three different setups with three different fuel loads. The amount of times I loaded the wrong setup was ridiculous, and thankfully I always do a, I have a procedure before I click the race button, always double check and make sure your fuel is correct. That's something I've always, you know, put into my brain. Um, sadly, good and much hasn't quite done that yet. He hasn't quite uh, learned to always double check, triple check your fuel, and uh, fortunately you learnt the hard way, but it is an easy thing to do, I mean, I said I did it a million times, I know my teammates have done it a hundred times before, everyone's done it, it's such an easy thing to do, it's just unfortunate that it has happened in this race, you'd much rather it happen in a virtual racing school GT Sprint Series race, um, or something of that nature, not 
at the start of the top split Bathurst 12 hours. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah, it was very bizarre when we saw him pulling to the side of the road, right where he is right now, by the way, coming down into Griffin's Bend and uh, spluttering out of fuel. We had to jump onto the onboard to figure that one out, but still fighting in 24th position. Roman Grosjean has been very hands-on in the operation of this team. And of course, he was using iRacing and its interpretation, representation, depending on how you want to put it, of the Dallara IR18 to get up to speed before he got onto track for the first time. I am excited to see his prospects this season. He was already quicker than his teammate Ed Jones, which is a good benchmark in and of itself, but lap times between some of the quicker competitors as well were looking very promising. Less than a second between Grosjean and the fastest runners. Another driver that he will have to contend with throughout the course of this season will be Chip Ganassi Racing's Alex Palau, and we did see Palau driving for Team Fordzilla earlier in this one. Don't know when he last drove that car, and in fact, taking a look at the timing screen, both of those Team Fordzilla cars out of today's race. And so the Team Fordzilla BMWs, which of course is uh, always a weird thing to say, Justin, <laughs> they'll be finishing 38th and 39th. And we've talked about that organization a few times over the past couple of years, Arjuna, where Fordzilla is an organization in which uh, develops a lot of talent and is backed, of course, by the Ford Motor Company. It's just showing the increased presence of manufacturers wanting to have esports organizations. We've seen some of the BMW cars. Bruno Spangler has been one of the drivers who has popped up in the Team BMW bank car, for example, today. We've talked about PS Competition and Zebra Spawning. There's been a lot of organizations that have been on the rise in this year, especially so far, and in 2020 in particular, that a lot of those organizations have established themselves as some of the main staples of sim racing. So on to pit road then for Team Redline and Logitech G Altus Esports. Jeffrey Rietfeld is interestingly... Ah, no, this is just a little quirk on my timing screen. He's still stationary, still getting service. But uh, his pit stop is definitely longer than just two tenths of a second. Cooper Webster behind is about 32 seconds stationary. So that would be about 45 seconds for Rietfeld. And I think, Bo, both of those cars are taking tires. Yeah, it does look like that. They're both on the jacks now. So that's actually against what I said earlier. I thought that, you know, both these teams would be willing to double stint all the way to the ends. But... You know, 42 degree track, that's not cool. That is quite, you know, hot conditions, even if we have seen uh, hotter over the course of this race. So, uh, Team Redline car is out on track. Logitech G Altus Esports car still up on the jacks at the moment. Fortunately, my timing screen uh, is still working nice and well. Uh, so, it was a minute seven there for the uh, Team Redline Ice Blue car, a minute nine for the Logitech G Altus Esports car. So, two seconds in the pit stop gained for the uh, Team Redline car, but both did end up taking tyres. And you know this better than anyone, Bo. Time you do, that you win in the pit lane is effectively free time. It's so much easier to gain or... It's easier to gain time in the pits than it's easier to gain time on track. That's the right way to put it because there are a lot of ways that you could say that sentence that would be incorrect. <laughs> well, absolutely. It's, a, it's something that always blows my mind a little bit with some drivers is that... You know, they'll go to a racetrack and they will find every hundredth and thousandth of a second on that racetrack. There is nothing more to gain on the racetrack. They have perfected it to an absolute T, but then they go and lose two seconds because they haven't practiced the pit entry. They don't know where the pit speed limiter line is. They don't know how to take the entrance. They don't know where the exit line is. They don't know where the pit bay is. It's amazing to me how many drivers don't practice their pit entrances and all of that stuff. And at the end of the day, like you say, you know, on track, to gain two seconds a lap is ludicrous. No one, not even Max Verstappen, is gaining two seconds a lap. Two seconds in the pit stop? Team Redline just did it easily over Ultra Seasports just then. So, you know, practice your pit stops. It'll win you races over the course of the uh, year as uh, Max Verstappen dives into the pits himself. And looks like he's taking tires as well. So maybe these guys, with the gap that they have, they must be pretty comfortable and confident in being able to take tires and still re-emerge at the front of the queue. 
So Verstappen up on the jacks. We'll see if they swap around the next time and if Enzo Benito will finish off this race. But for now, Verstappen stationary on the pit lane. And he'll wait to get back up to racing speed. There we go, finally up on the jacks. This is going to be one of the longer stops that we've had so far. And in fact, Justin, my speculation might be that Verstappen will go all the way to the end from here. In terms of the driver stints, possibly, especially since it can take a bit of time in some of the cars, mind you, to be able to swap in drivers. Now, the main thing is going to be the fatigue that can settle on in and really... The pace he's settling in has been incredible to watch from the get-go. In fact, from the sequence, I believe he gained a little bit more time potentially here. We'll have to see with the overall interview with just a minute, seven seconds once again in the pit box or give or take for him. It's just been incredible to see how he's been able to drive and actually comes out in some clean space. I've worked out perfectly for him. 90 seconds, the total pit lane delta pretty much on the dot and that was the advantage that he had over his teammate coming down onto pit road let's see how it all cycles out though because we still wait for a couple of cars to filter their way through through this pit stop window though Bo let's work our way through this strategy looks like the inertia sim racing team with a slightly shorter stop last time around I'm guessing no tires taken in that case They've leapfrogged themselves up into third and now find themselves right behind Team Redline Ice Blue. Yeah, they've played a brilliant strategy call. Of course, tyres take around 28 seconds and their pit stop compared to everyone else, well, was pretty much 28 seconds shorter. So that tells me everything I need to know. They've gone for track position and uh, it's paid off pretty well as well because they've managed to uh, obviously gap quite a few of their nearby competitors. So... You know, great effort from them. See if they can get some track position now and maybe make it work to the end of the race. And I think maybe what Inertia are maybe going for is take these tires to the two-hour mark, get them off, throw them in the bin. They're not being used anymore. Get new tires on. And then with the track temp, I'm noticing just trending a little bit cooler as uh, this phase of the race begins to kick in. As, of course, we're now 3 p.m. local time here in uh, Bathurst, Mount Panorama. They should be able to double stint a lot more comfortably at the end of the race compared to now. So I think that's what they're going for, is if everyone else is willing to take tyres almost every pit stop, we're going to do something different. Let's only double stint to the end from here. Looks like we might have a fight then for these uh, final podium positions, second and third. Urano Esports as well are getting in on the equation. Daniel Pastor with that shorter stop as well in the number 93. So... It's all kicking off, and as we approach the final 60 minutes, all of these pit stop strategies and ideas will end up playing out. Max Verstappen, in the meantime, though, extends that gap at the front of your field, Justin. It's now upwards of 96 seconds, so... New tires, fresh tires for Verstappen. Now he can set to work once again. We saw some very consistent lap times when he first got back behind the wheel of the car. Let's see if that same thing plays out now. And it also helps, too, that he came out, talk, as we talked about, in clean space. The Team Redline Ice Blue Machine is currently about a quarter of the way up the road. is behind a couple of BMWs right now in regards to traffic. So that is going to be very pivotal to be able to get up to speed quickly and continue to grow this advantage even more so. The thing is, Verstappen's going to reach that same amount of traffic and then some coming up because he's got to lap his way past Bia's competition and a couple others. Here's that view of the Ice Blue Machine in particular. You see with that traffic they're trying to still cut through. Gap behind to uh, Inertia Sim Racing extended to about 4.3, so a couple of tenths of a second gained by the fresher tires. We'll watch for the lap time deltas as they play out. Last time it was one tenth quicker for the Inertia car behind. Across the line we come. What's the lap time in the ice blue car, 204.909 versus a 204.904. So, Oscari Rene is right on the pace, having already got his tires up to temperature and pressure. Jeffrey Reed felt third lap into his stint. Those tires will be right in the peak operating window right about now. So, he'll start to build up his momentum once again. As always, thank you for tuning in live on RaceBot TV. And if you're not already following us for your sim racing coverage, you can head over to at RaceBot TV on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and Instagram and follow us for some great sim racing coverage. A busy week ahead. 
Uh, me, myself, I just have, by myself, about eight different broadcasts, and that's not including what the other producers have to manage as well. So lots of action to look forward to on RaceBot TV. Subscribe to us on YouTube, hit the bell as well to get notified every time we go live. And join our Discord as well, because we're getting more and more engaged with you guys in there as well, just like we are on the Twitter machine. Let me take a look to my right-hand side once again. Doesn't look like anything has come in. Just a reminder that you can use uh, the hashtag iRacingBathurst12 to stay in touch with us. Turner Motorsports, my new favorite IMSA team. Under 3.5 hours remain for their BS Competition Zebras. One of the Zebras has now dropped down to P6. Rainer Talvar is uh, the last car on the lead lap and struggling to hold off. Max Verstappen right behind him as well. And as Turner Motorsports points out, we do a great job as per usual. And uh, you can tune in to us always here at Live on Racebot TV. So, as always, my name is Arjuna Kenkipati. I'm joined by the wonderful Justin Prince and Bo Albert as well, with two hours and 30 minutes still to go here in this race. I'm not going to make anyone predict the race winner here, but I am going to make you guys predict second and third. Justin, why don't you go first? I'll make your life especially difficult. I mean, based on what we've seen so far, there's a likely chance Team Redline Ice Blue gets second. The tough part's going to be third, where it all really comes down to how well Inertia does here on their call here, where I think they're going to have to end up taking tires on the next stop, potentially, and then with double stint to end off the race. I would be willing to go with Logic Dealtus Esports though as the potential third place car because of the pace they've had today where they've consistently stayed in that spot. The tough part is right now is where the times are going to lie among these tires. I've noticed the 205 so far for some of the drivers in the double stints, Arjuna. Last time around for Inertia, 205-749, 1.5 seconds lost to Team Redline Blue in front. Ask you the same question here, Bo, but I think it's a bit tougher for you. Uh, your, your team allegiances, I'm sure, are going to bias <laughs> you just slightly. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love to say that uh, Altus Esports have been sandbagging the entire race and we're about to uh, take the sandbags out and leap to first place, but no. I think, uh, of course, the obvious choice is Max Verstappen and Team Redline Orange to uh, take the win, I think. Um, but I, I don't know. Maybe my bias is shining through, but I think we can still have a fight for second place here. And uh, I think there's still a few curveballs to come in this race. So um, I'm going to, just to be a little bit different, I'm going to put Altus in second. And uh, let's put Redline Ice Blue in third. Okay, so two different set of predictions. Why don't I mix things up? I'm going to go, hmm, I think Team Redline Ice Blue will take second. The question is, third place, what can BS Competition do? You know what? I'm going to go for the Zebras. They'll be charging up through the field. A little bit of a curveball there for sure. Uh, not sure exactly why I'm picking them, other than just uh, some emotional <laughs> appeal. But nevertheless, we'll go with it. Two hours and 30 minutes to go. There are our predictions. And uh, at the conclusion of the race, once the checkered flag has flown, we'll follow up with them and see just how right or just how wrong we were as across the start-finish line comes Inertia Sim Racing to complete lap 272 in their race. An estimated 350 for your race leader. Of course, not expecting anyone else to necessarily do 350. They may do 349 if Verstappen laps them all by the time we get to the checkered flag. And a couple of the battles that we were watching out for a couple of moments ago have broken up slightly. Gordy Much has gotten past Scott Michaels in that battle for 23rd position. Still separated by just half a second on track. But for the first time today, big, uh, big gaps between every single one of your cars. As here comes Scott Michaels down onto pit road. Very off cycle from the rest of the field. And they run three laps down from the race leader. If you need an indication of just how persistent this race pace is from Max Verstappen, it is the fact that the top six cars are the only cars who have not gone one lap down. Everyone else has just been overwhelmed by this sprint it's from the two driver pairing of Max Verstappen and Enzo Benito out front. And I'm not sure, Justin, if you've done too many of these endurance events, but 
24 hour races, there are some people who like to do those with two people. Not necessarily sure I agree with them. I do think though, two people is the perfect amount of drive time for a 12 hour race. There's so much commitment that goes into preparing for these events. When you're doing, you know, 20 plus hours of practice, I think you want to do at least six hours of driving. Yeah, I think that's a good mixture for this type of race. And it's difficult, I think, in a couple of cases for teams to balance it out once you get towards three or four in the case of wanting to make sure you get the proper drive time. Yes, you can evenly split up a, say, a three-driver lineup to four-hour, four-hour, four-hour. But when do you want to do the four-hour, four-hour, four-hour mixture? Do you want to split it up? Do you want to go two hours to two hours, for example? There's so many combinations you can end up going with. And when it comes to this type of strategy of having just two drivers, it's just simple of you do two hours if you want, then this person does two hours. You do two hours, then you do this two hours if you so choose to go that route. But keep in mind... Max Verstappen's catching up to these machines as you talked about, and it's starting to get a little bit tight here for that battle for fifth with the, some of the older drive tires starting to drop back to BS competition. The inertia sim racing has really started to slow down. Last time they lost another seven tenths of a second to the ice blue car in second. Lost about six tenths of a second to Cooper Webster from behind on board with BS competition as they're stuck behind Ronan Simsport in their Lamborghini working our way up through the hill. And I do love the story about this track. Of course, when uh, races first started in Bathurst, back in the early 1900s, they didn't even have a racetrack to speak of. It wasn't, it wasn't until 1936 that construction began on this particular track. And the uh, mayor, Martin Griffin, had a rather cunning plan to uh, attract funding during the Great Depression, where under the guise of creating employment and building a tourist attraction, they had designed a scenic road for tourists to be able to escape to and enjoy. But what he didn't tell them was when the engineers showed up to actually build the track, he told them, you guys better build every single part of this track slightly wider than the original plans were. The road opened on 17th of March 1938, and just a couple of weeks later, on Easter weekend, the first ever races were held here. First on Saturday, it was the motorbikes, and then a couple of days later on a Monday, cars took to the track for the first time with more than 20,000 fans in attendance. And now this great venue hosts in excess of 100,000 fans, both for the Bathurst 1000 and the Bathurst 12 hours as well. It's a shame that this international race will not be taking place this year due to the coronavirus, but next year we know it will return bigger than better, uh, bigger and better than ever before with even more GT3 cars on display. The last few years have been a who's who if, in terms of winners. A couple of years ago, it was Matt Campbell winning for Porsche. And last year, of course, the big Bentley taking home the win. And it would be nice, you know, Bo, to have a couple more new GT3 cars. The BMW and the Lamborghini, in my mind, are kind of paving the way for this current era of GT3 machinery. And I asked a couple of the commentators earlier on which GT3 car they want to see on the iRacing service. I think I know which one you want to see. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm interested to know if my answer matches up because uh, you thought I might have picked Bathurst 1000 before, but uh, I threw a curveball for you. But um, I, if there's anything I would like, I would love some form of a Corvette um, to come into the sim. I knew it! <laughs> um, yeah, there we go. We got it. Um, but of course... There's technicalities around that, and we were talking about it earlier in part one in the YouTube comments, where there's just a few technicalities with Callaway and all of that to be sorted. So, in terms of a possible GT3 that I think I would love to come to the sim, it's got to be the Porsche. I think that is a gorgeous GT3 car, and uh, if that made its way into the sim, which, you know, I obviously don't know anything, but I'm just sort of thinking with iRacing's partnerships with Porsches, it's definitely a possibility. That would be a brilliant addition in my mind. And replace the Ford. <laughs> <laughs> the very old Ford that wasn't actually a GT3 car when it was first scanned, but now exists in a kind of weird limbo. Uh, I did mention it earlier on, if you, if you have a spare $350,000 uh, just lying around in your couch maybe, you can always head over to uh, CallawayCars.com and purchase a Callaway Corvette GT3 car, the C7 body. 
Of course, that car did compete in the ADAC GT Masters as well as a number of other GT3 competitions. And that is available as an option for SRO America's competition as well as IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car competition as well. So while we wait to see if we get a GT3 version of the brand new C8R, for those uh, with some spare cash and maybe John Henry as well if he wants to go buy that car, send it on over to iRacing staff in Boston. We'll get a brand new GT3 car onto the service. Justin, I'll ask you the same thing. Um, I'm not sure what your answer would be here, to be completely honest with you. Um, maybe a, a Mustang GT3 or something like that. There have been rumblings uh, that maybe we'll see a Mustang GT3 car after the Mustang GT4 car that's doing very well in the IMSA WeatherTech... Uh, no, sorry. IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge. That's the correct series. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this topic? That would be cool to see a Ford, but uh, I think the Aston Martin would be one of those that I'm curious to see because of some of that success as well. I would add that Bentley that you talked about. Just a good mixture of cars to be able to have some good variety and see which manufacturers come out on top in these types of races. So i go with the Aston Martin or the Bentley. I would like to see the Bentley. It's what the IGTC was really meant to be about. Bring these GT3 cars all across the globe to classic racetracks such as Mount Panorama. And since GT3 cars have debuted at this track in 2011, it's become one of the most watched races on the international sports car community. One of my other favorite tracks as well on the IGTC calendar as we see this battle for fifth position. BS competition makes it look very easy on Urano Esports and those older tires. Uh, is Kailami, which uh, not sure how many people on the iRacing service are necessarily familiar with. But uh, Bo, not sure how familiar with it you are either. It's a spectacular track I found out in South Africa. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm like digging through my mind archives. I know the name, but I can't pinpoint the track itself. But, I mean, it's a continent that iRacing really hasn't delved into for content. So, hey, I'm all for it. Uh, speaking of continent and uh, content, there was, of course, the iRacing user survey that went out a couple of weeks ago. iRacing looking for input from the various members of its community. Question was asked, what type of content do you want to see? couple of eyebrows being raised at the uh, question about Australian and New Zealand FIA grade one facilities, which of course, Bo, there aren't many, but if we're going to get the bend, I will be very happy with it. The bend, I think, would be a brilliant addition for iRacing because there's so many layouts, so you can't really go wrong. It's not really, you know, an oval circuit for say, um, where it only really suits the oval guys. It's not really a circuit like Spa-Francorchamps that only suits the road guys. There's opportunities you know, for all kinds of things in the bend. You can do plenty of uh, dirt road races there. You can do your regular road. You can do your multi-class. Um, you can't quite do oval there, unfortunately. But uh, I think there is plans as well for them to have a speedway in the line as well. So, uh, hey, throw in dirt oval as well. There's a little bit of everything at the bend. And uh, it's just a cool circuit as well. I think it's a circuit that, you know, just to sort of go over my point again, there's so many series that can run there. You can do your multi-class. You can do your rookie races there. So I think, you know, for iRacing, it's a perfect scan um, where you're not really limited. Yeah, you really put it perfectly. You can have all the small cars, your Mazda MX-5s, uh, from the rookies all the way up to your multi-class races would be a very diverse track that would offer the iRacing community a lot of use out of it. On board, we're riding with Urano Esports, by the way, down into the chase, trying to just see how much grip he's still got on these older tires. If you're wondering what the track temperature is at this point in time, 41 degrees Celsius. It does look as though that car still looks very under control. The YouTube chat, by the way, has started to pick up as we start talking about this topics. South Africa has a bunch of good tracks, I would agree there, and as Dominic Engel uh, does point out, not all of them are as safe as Kailami. Uh, there are some fantastic race tracks across the globe that, unfortunately, various series cannot go to because of safety regulations. Uh, Gustas Grinbergis, uh, who of course drives for Simsa Esports and an LMP prototype driver in the real world as well, has won a race in the Asian Le Mans series. Enjoyed racing at the bend. It'd be good to maybe talk to Gustas about that experience at one, uh, some point in the near future. The bend really is a very interesting facility, not just a track. 
And so up through the cutting, we work on board with Urano, losing a lot of time, it must be said. 1.3 seconds now behind the BS competition car in front. And by the same token, Cooper Webster has eaten into the gap of Ascari Rene. Just five seconds separates third and fourth now, Justin. So these older tires, it's a bit of a gamble. We won't know until about two hours from now how it plays out. Yeah, that's just the nature of endurance racing, the gaps that break out. But to loop back to the conversation on Australian tracks, I'd like to throw a different type of track into the equation because Bo Albert mentioned the potential, say, of ovals. Do you remember by any chance from all the way back in the 1980s and 1990s, the Thunderdome? Absolutely. How how cool would it be to have that as a retro track since that still also has a road course and a drag strip as well at that facility? I like that. I also really do like this idea that we can preserve racing history in the virtual service. It's not just, you know, tracks like Nashville that are going to get the attention and, you know, the amount of effort that was put into restoring the track to get the scan, but there's another famous Australian track, Bo, which of course doesn't exist in the real world anymore. It's now, uh, I think, a bunch of apartments at this point in time. Yes, unfortunately, is now uh, a very expensive housing estate is the uh, wonderful circuit of Oran Park. It was a, uh, a very nice track and had so much history and was really well loved by the motorsports community here in Australia and I think also had a bit of a global appeal as well with its uh, very unique figure eight layout. Um, for a road race, so uh, it's an absolute shame to see that track no longer in the real world, but it exists in iRacing, and uh, when the uh, Supercar Z Series made their way uh, to iRacing during the uh, COVID lockdowns last year, some of the drivers, of course, that raced at Oran Park back in the day, they were amazed. They almost, I think one of them said they're almost emotional getting to drive the track after all these years that, you know, no longer exists, and of course, you only have to think back to a uh, I'm forgetting the name, I don't know my ovals so well, but of course, uh, the new, oh, North Wilkesboro is the name of it, yes. that uh, was brought to life um, recently by Irising as well. So, yeah, to get back to your point, Arjuna, like, the fact we're able to bring tracks back to life, or at least preserve them in a virtual sense, is absolutely phenomenal. Look at me, I've lived in the US now for upwards of eight years, and I managed to uh, mix up Nashville and... Um... Oh, wow, I'm now just kicking myself for being able to do that. Nevertheless, uh, we're going to move right on past that. Gregory Tanson uh, now finds himself behind Jamie Moon, and they find themselves both four seconds behind Ronin Simsport. This pit window has very much played favorites because Ronin down the lane last time, they only spent about 40 seconds stationary. Simar City spent 55 seconds stationary. And Gregory Tanson in the Beeler Racing 453 spent 40 seconds stationary as well. So a couple of cars not taking tires once again. But I'm wondering here, Bo, if we've seen in the case of SimRC, two tires rather than four tires being taken. If so, I'm a little bit curious to know what tires they would take. Of course, here at Bathurst, you do tend to load the right side tires up, both front and rear quite aggressively due to the mountain section and the high-speed run across the Great McPhillamy. Um, but yeah, that's a really, really interesting call, and we've seen it done um, in the past, in future, in past events, I should say. Of course, most famously, Coanda in the 2016 something-something uh, GT World Championship, and uh, they did that to success, so it, it can work. It's a strategy that has proven, but here at Bathurst on, you know, two new tyres, two old tyres, that is a gamble and a half, but hey, let's see if it pays off for him. So, interesting call indeed. I would speculate it would be two right side tires. Oh, we're going to take a look at a replay in just a few moments' time, but before we do that, I'm spinning up the Twitter machine. Uh, two tweets to take a look at. First, hi, Bo. I see you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first time I've done that either. Remember, you can stay involved using the hashtag iRacingBathurst12. More important tweet, though. Just want to shout out. I didn't realize just how young these two drivers are. Elias Sapanen and uh, Felix Kronbach, 17 and 15, respectively. And they've done a very good job so far. Been an up-and-down day for BS competition, but Kronbach and Sapanen find themselves in the top 10. Still in with a chance, I would think, of a top 5 finish if there's some difficulties for the cars in front. 
And remember, you can stay involved using the hashtag iRacingBathos12. I can always show more tweets like that uh, if uh, you're willing to send them over, just like Bo did there. So, two hours, ten minutes left to work. And the pit window about to open then as we take a look at that RaceBot TV replay that I was referring to. It was Gordy Much coming down onto pit road. Did mention how difficult it can be. Watch someone getting it wrong, going through the grass, spinning it around, and going for rally cross action, Bo. Not the way you want to spin around. No, it's definitely not something I would recommend in a GT3 car. I've tried these off-road. They don't work so well, and unfortunately, the RG Esports car, oh, just a little too fast. And like I said earlier, pit lane is a place where you can gain seconds over your competitors if you are willing to push the limits just a little bit. But again, push the limits a little bit too far, and there were our, and there are consequences. And uh, sadly, RAG just found those consequences out. Justin, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like the majors... Bathurst 500 when we were here last November uh, talking about those consequences. We saw those consequences play out not once, not twice, I think on three different occasions. I believe so, yes, and when you pay the consequences, it loses you a ton of time to have that scenario, especially since in the pit entry, say you lose control, it can take some time to be able to restrain yourself out and be able to get yourself back rolling. You have to be careful since there are cars may want to come and pit. That can also hold those drivers up and cost them some time. It's all a balancing act to make sure it's done properly, just like the balancing act of driving the car itself on the racetrack, like Webster here. Getting word, by the way, in the YouTube chat that Inertia Sim Racing might just have scraped the wall for the first time, and we jump on board then with the car chasing them down. Cooper Webster, hometown boy. Actually, I'm not sure if he's a hometown boy. I should not just call all, all Australians racing at Bathurst hometown. That's a little bit uh, bad of me to do. Uh, very Shaquille O'Neal, if you will, uh, for those who know what I'm talking about. Cooper Webster, 2.2 seconds behind. Oscari Rene, though, last time he got an entire second out of that gap. And what's it going to be across the line this time for Cooper Webster? Lap time is going to be a 2.04.113. So he almost matches his lap time from the last time around. Eats eight tenths of a second out of that gap to the car in front. Very, very impressed at just how well, Bo, that car on old tires is able to hold on. And I wonder at what point it's going to start falling off the cliff. Yeah, well, it doesn't really look like it's falling off the cliff at all at the moment, does it? It's uh, holding very strong, and, I mean, you know, eight-tenths of a second is a lot, but we're almost at the hour mark, so if he can hold on for another four laps over the Altus Esports car, that's a net track position gain there for the Inertia car um, over the 43. So, you know, maybe they've found something that other teams are overlooking a bit, of course. We expect the 33 to take tyres every stop just purely for a safety factor with the margin they've got. But for other teams like the 87 Redline Ice Blue car, maybe, just maybe, this is something they need to do to just cover off uh, inertia if they continue to uh, pull this strategy off. Because the track temperature is continuing to drop now down into the uh, high 30s when we've seen it in the 40s for a long period of time. So clearly something's working here for inertia on this strategy. And I just was mentioning a couple of laps ago uh, how disconcerting it can be to broadcast a race here at Bathurst when you hear the constant sound of cars scraping against the walls. I heard another scrape for Cooper Webster. Doesn't seem to be affecting his lap time too much. 1.5 seconds the gap now between Inertia Sim Racing and Logitech Gialtis Esports. That BMW on those fresher tires continues to reel in the gap. And I have a feeling he'll make it look very, very simple in just a few laps time. I'm trying to do the quick math in my head here, Justin, but of course, if Inertia Sim Racing are going to come down and take tires on this next pit stop, are we potentially, as the tire, as the temperatures continue to drop off, rather, are we potentially looking at Cooper Webster trying a triple stint here? That's an interesting question here, and it all depends, yes, absolutely, on the temps, but... Really, in terms of that, that's the only thing I can think of it either that or they're going to try to take the tires maybe towards the end of this run. 
but I'm looking at the fuel marks for the math as well here. Currently, we're looking at inertia coming in in 10 laps, or 10 laps this time by coming up to 9 laps, rather. So they're in a situation where they'll have to pit with 20 to go. Logic Yalta Z Sports would come in with about 15 to go. So it's going to be tight on the margins here to where some of these teams may be put in a box here. And at this point, there is that absolute possibility of drivers trying to stretch it out from here on the triple stint. Because if they take the tires, it, they might not be able to gain the time back. Yeah, it is very, very interesting. Bo, I, I'm very interested to get your insight here. I know you can't reveal your team's secrets. You don't want to uh, <laughs> expose them to Inertia Sim Racing, who is in our YouTube chat and watching. But what would you do in this situation? Because even if you get past the Audi in front of you now, with about 10 laps left to work in the stint, give or take, th the maximum amount of gap you're going to build up is about 10 seconds. And that is not the cost of changing tires here. No, it's not. Of course, that's uh, 18 seconds the wrong way, uh, mm -hmm. of course, if you did decide to take tyres. So, uh, it is a tricky one, um, but I, I just think that at the end of the race, if something were to happen between these two and they did end up together on track, you'd want to be the driver on new tyres because we are still seeing a pace advantage of, you know, around eight-tenths of a second. So, uh, I do think triple stint is too far, in my opinion. Um, not to say that you know, Cooper and Jordan aren't aspiring to do that. But uh, I think a double stint is the max you'd want to do. And I yeah. don't know if you'd want to go any further than that. Well, they will both owe us a tire stop. So that will at least cancel one another out. And it does mean a little bit of pressure then on Webster to get the move done. Start building up a buffer and see what kind of pressure he can apply onto Oscari Rene to potentially make a mistake then in this portion of the race. Just over two hours left. We've got 10 hours done. 55 cars took to the, uh, 54 cars took to the green flag. One car uh, didn't even make it there. That was the wild animal orcas, I do believe. Lots and lots of retirements then. With just 33 cars still out there circulating on track. Most recent retirements seem to have been likes of Cube Controls, Altus Esports, and Indigo Team Redline. Very, very... I must say, I am very impressed by the fighting spirit that is being shown by Lubomir Schweitz and the Beeler Racing Team Euronix car because I have lost track of how many replays that we've shown of <laughs> Lubomir having issues, and I'm sure if you go to his Twitch channel, Bo, there'll be even more clips to take a look at. But they're still pounding around the track, and you know what? They'll end up... If I'm trying to do the math here, no, you know what? No matter what, they will still finish this race in 36th position. They're just driving around in the true spirit of endurance racing. Yeah, and why not? I mean, you come to these endurance races and above all, the biggest achievement is finishing. So for these guys to finish is still an achievement no matter how horrific the car looks and, you know, how many times I've seen Lubo uh, escape from this uh, race and go back to the pits with a, a car facing the wrong direction or on the wall. You know, finishing is an achievement as we uh, go see a replay here of the Ultra Sea Sports car and the Inertia Sim Racing car. And you said that would look easy, Arjuna, and tell you what, that did look pretty easy. It looked very easy indeed. And now the gap already between the two is almost half a second as we cross the line down in towards Hell Corner. There was someone going very slow off the pit lane. I think that was Quinton Violate in the RHG Esports car. And indeed, yes, he was just trying to stay out of the way of the leading contenders. And he'll tuck into line behind his teammate in the Audi. But now, this battle for third, Cooper Webster will have just under five laps or so before Rene comes down onto pit road. Oh, great camera shot there of the cars coming through turn two. I really must say, Esteban Ballo has done a fantastic job with our camera pack for today's coverage. Really reminiscent of a lot of the real-life angles that you see, not just in the Bathurst 1000, but the 12-hour race as well. And we have so much flexibility here on the iRacing service that uh, to place cameras wherever you want. Ben Constant Juris a week ago in the VCO Cup of Nations was uh, looking at the camera pack that we had for the circuit de la Sarthe, and 
taking pictures and taking notes to pass down to the real-life TV director. If you want to know just how close sim racing and real racing is getting, that is how close the lines are being drawn when broadcasters on both sides of the aisle take inspiration from one another. Speaking of taking inspiration, uh, shout out to ATVO, Kevin Neotola, Simon Grossman, and Nick Thyssen did an absolutely incredible job with our brand new RaceBots graphics package to uh, transform the fantastic design that Hugo Luis built into a reality and lots of hard work from the ATVO team so many many thank yous as we'll see them out on track in one week's time in the Ivor Club Sports Series that season finale the six hours of Sebring on a Saturday Ooh, as Looks like Cooper Webster was on the grass for just a moment's time, able to hold on to it through Murray's. Cross the line then. That gap now up to 1.3 seconds, Justin, and that's the effect then of the fresh tires. He gained seven tenths of a second over just one lap, and now he's got the remainder of this stint to build up an advantage. Yeah, and this is going to be critical. I think at this point, inertia might be in a box where they're going to have to take tires as well, so they're going to be in the catch-up train to try and close back up the airway. But one battle I'm keeping my eye on, may notice the swap on the timing charts. How about the Lamborghini starting to fight a little bit? Ronan Simsport and Sim RC Titan just swap positions. Sim RC is on the fresher tires here too, but only a 56 second pit stop. But Ronan Simsport's not giving up with the draft. Side by side, down in towards Griffin's we work. Ronan Simsport is gonna hang it around the outside. The corner is not cambered nicely for them, and they'll lose out very big. And in fact, uh, that's the BMW that we saw a couple of moments before. One lap down, gap between Ronan Simsport now, and the car in front is up to an entire second. Very easily done there for SimRC. I have a feeling the uh, big race bot sticker on the rear wing helped them with a bit of extra downforce and a bit of extra power as well. Miniti Racing, by the way, are down on pit road, so... They've been doing one-hour stints throughout this entire race. Your race leader, though, we haven't talked about him for about an hour or so. And here is Max Verstappen down the hill and working in towards the chase. He'll come down onto pit road, Justin, and we expect he'll give that car over to his teammate. Not sure what's going to happen. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens here. It's going to be in about 12 laps time or so where we're expecting this. But both of them, again, have done a brilliant job in terms of driving. They've split up the laps fairly evenly. 166 or so for Max Verstappen, 122 for Benito today. Both very talented drivers in their own rights. Of course, Benito a lot of experience. Considered by the team, it's Italian superstar with someone that has experience in the EROC, which is the E Race of Champions with its inaugural championship as well. Someone, though, you have to keep in mind that dislikes sleep, but likes pizza and marriage. So there's that for Max Verstappen's fellow compatriot for today. So in all seriousness, both of them have been on the Ray game today. You can tell they put in a lot of preparation into this car to make sure they were all set to go for this, to be able to hit the marks perfectly the way they have. And uh, I was just taking a look at something, getting distracted for a second. The gap now between first and second, just under 80 seconds as Verstappen builds up that momentum. Uh, if Enzo Benito is a, a true connoisseur of pizza, he knows that pineapple can never be placed on pizza. That is a true crime against food. But Max Verstappen then down the hill, once again, he will plunge. And he'll hand that car over potentially to Enzo Benito. Interesting story that I told earlier on today's broadcast that I'll share with you guys as well. Um, have you ever thought about the possibility of a car going over the top of Skyline Corner? Well, it happened back in 1970. And the car went flying so far down the mountain that they were unable to winch it back up to the point. And instead, they had to go, uh, I guess you would call it, bush trekking from Conrod Strait back in the day because there was not so much uh, clean land around so there was a lot more shrubbery and things like that and they had to go and fish that car out from the side of Conrod Strait because the car went flying so far down the hill at Skyline so 
Uh, that's a pretty incredible moment there. A lot of the corner names as well are very, very literal. We talked about uh, Griffin, uh, the mayor, Martin Griffin, who, of course, brought this track to this por uh, part of the country as well. Griffin's Bend named after him. Uh, you've got the likes of Forrest Elbow named after Jack Forrest, a motorcycle racer who had a small incident at that very corner, scraping his elbow after laying down on his bike. You've got the Conrad Strait named after a Conrad failure in 1939. Uh, McPhillamy Park named after a mayor of the city council. So lots of history at this track, Bo, and you're the kind of person who, despite the fact that you don't necessarily think this is the best special event of the year, I think you can appreciate just what an important site that this track is for Australian motorsports. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you don't have to go very far to find all the stories, the brilliant things that have happened here at this circuit. It is a track that, if you're an Australian motorsports fan, you've watched more than your fair share of races here at Bathurst. So for these drivers, you know, racing around here, you know, in some ways it's almost a privilege for them. And, you know, maybe for the Europeans, but for the Australians as well, it's a bit of pride as well, because you don't have to go very far at all <laughs> to see everything that happens here. It's often in the news. It's often, you know, just published everywhere. For Australian motorsport fans, this is as big as it gets. It's the biggest event um, here at this circuit. It has our 12 hour. It has our Bathurst 1000. So there's so much that goes into this. For the, I suppose the only comparison I can really make is for those that live in Europe and in particular Germany. You can only compare this to the Nordschleife for them, where it's just that affinity to that one track and you know every little detail, you know every little nuance and you know all of the uh, history behind this, behind it as well as uh, inertia coming out of the pit lane. And in the case of the Nürburgring Nordschleife uh, for the real hardcore fans, they know where all of the graffiti is on track as well. Uh, Matty Kaidasoa gets behind the wheel then and he'll take this car to the checkered flag. Oscari Rene steps out for the final time today. Just under 70 seconds is the total pit stop time. In front of them, we had picked up the battle between Urano Esports and Beeler Racing Team. Sven Haas on the fresher tires has been able to close the gap to Daniel Pastor. Urano Esports down onto the lane this time around then as well. Be interesting to see how far they feed behind the Inertia Sim Racing Team because of course, there is a small battle happening then for the second and third steps on the podium. Down onto pit lane for Daniel Pastor and we'll see who he hands that car over to. Not sure who he's been sharing the car with so far today. It's been Daniel Pastor and Louis Nahir, and I think we are seeing that driver switch right now. And indeed, there comes the driver switch. Louis steps behind the wheel, and he will also take that car to the conclusion of this race. And from what I can tell here, this is a strategy call potentially here. And Bo, I think you may notice this too possibly is... They might be trying to play this so they can pit with 27 laps to go at this rate. So you can go 30 laps from this point or 29 laps or so. That gets you to where you have a full tank of fuel to get to the end here. I think Inertia elected to go there early by five laps to get themselves into that scenario where they push to the end on a full tank. Bo? Yeah, I agree. So, um, so... Yeah, they're going to try and push all the way to the end on this slightly uh, shorter stint and then uh, fill it up to the end at the hour mark and then go from there. So that's an interesting call from them, though, because, of course, they're going to be in a completely different cycle for at least the next few laps to their nearest competitors who they're fighting for third place with. So BS, Competition, and Logitech G Ultra C Sports. Um, so, yeah, Inertia, they've actually come out in a little bit of clean air as well, I've just noticed. So... If anything, this is working out pretty beautifully for them because they're on an alternate strategy. You've got clear road, at least for the next few laps, which is, let's face it, very difficult to find here at Mount Panorama. So that's a, a very big call for them. And more crucially, they've put Matty Kaitasoya in the car as well. And you don't have to go very far to find his achievements. A very, very talented sim racer. He made the switch from Vendaval Sim Racing over into the Inertia Sim Racing team earlier this year competitor in the Porsche Esports Super Cup as well. Kaidasoa over the top of the hill. Already completed one lap on his stint. Tires will be coming up to temperature and pressure and he finds the track limits as well. A couple more cars down onto the lane. BMW Team Redline. Max Beneke getting back behind the wheel there after starting the car. And as well, Ronin Simsport in their Lamborghini working their way down into the box as Beneke pulls out of the lane. 
starts up the final two hours here. Not being a great day for Tenke Beneke, unfortunately. This race started off fairly well. Unfortunately, while he was competing in the World Championship, a bit of difficulty for Patrick Holtzman coming across a car stricken through the forest elbow. And Beneke, who then had several contacts in the Porsche Tagore Esports Super Cup, comes back to a very damaged car and will run around the BMW Motorsports and Team Redline combination car until the end of this race. Phil Dinez has just gotten behind the wheel then of the BMW Team BS Competition car, so these BMW Motorsports teams coming down onto the lane then for their final driver swap. And speaking of the BMW sponsored teams, Keika Shube, let's go take a look at him, embroiled in a fight with HM Engineering right behind them. And your Daytona 24-hour winners from three weeks ago, struggling then on the edge of the top 20, Justin. Yeah, this is the car where Bruno Spangor has turned laps here, and they've done a decent job despite where they're at right now position-wise and with the damage. Their pace has been solid. It's been up there with, honestly, they've had the pace of some of the drivers inside the top five, inside the top 10 even, throughout the day. So they've been quick. It's just, if it wasn't for some of the bad luck earlier on in this race, they might have better track position, you'd have to think here. They are in a spot where they're going to have to pit fairly soon here. But Keikashube doing a really solid job here, trying to break this draft from HM Engineering. And you can tell that BS Competition appreciates their efforts today. Yeah, there's the tweet from BS Competition about all of the hard work after initial disappointment for Keikashube Bruno Spengler. They will work the last couple of hours then. After spending most of the opening portion of the race in 40th position or so to be up in the top 20, they'll be pretty happy with the fight back so far. Three laps down, still the opportunity to work their way up maybe into the top 15 as well. So we are into the pit stop window then. Ronan Simsport out of pit lane, as is Phil Dinez in the BMW BS competition car. And now we await the top for contenders. Left hand side of your screen, you can once again follow along with the stint lengths as you can see. BS Competition and the number 90 car in fourth position, 28 laps into the stint so far. So they will owe us a pit stop bow in just a couple of laps time and then we'll wait for the rest of the cars, including your race leaders, to come down onto the lane. Yeah, there's still so much strategy to play for, even in these dying laps. And this is one of my favorite parts of endurance racing is coming towards the final stage of this race, because some of these teams who might be down in you know, fourth, fifth or sixth place right now, and maybe look a little bit out of place, they could have been working this race backward from the start of the race, working it back, working it back all the way down to this final stop. And then out of nowhere, they've got a really short final pit stop and can just leap up a few positions. Of course, looking at the stint length inertia, obviously, uh, on very, very fresh, uh, freshly fueled. They uh, came into the pits not so long ago at all, so they're uh, definitely good to go for one more pit stop to the end of the race, but you can often see some surprises with how much fuel is required to go in the car at the end, how that alters the pit stop times, and ultimately track position as well, so plenty of strategy to be played here as BS Competition decides to play one of their final few cards. Uh, the sister car as well, the number 91 car further down in the pit lane in front of them. Elias Sapanen jumping over and taking over from Felix Kronbach in the number 91. Reynald Talvar will slot his way down into the lane. Not sure who's going to take over here. This is one of our three driver pairings. Alexander Voss, Nathan Lewis, the other two drivers that have shared driving responsibilities so far today. Driver change underway. It's Nathan Lewis who's going to take over here. Very rapid driver indeed. Got a couple of hours then to see what he can do. Maximum push all the way to the end for him. See what the New York native then can do. Turn our attention back onto track then for the time being as we'll await F1 superstar Max Verstappen to start the plunge down the hill through Skyline once again. And the gap, Justin, is now up to 1 minute 45 seconds. So, give or take, I had said that he's going to lap the entire field by the time that we get to uh, the final hour of the race. Might have missed the mark slightly there. I do have a feeling, though, the entire field will be one lap down come to the end of this race. Especially since he's turning laps at the moment up to six tenths quicker than some of his fellow competitors. In fact, 
Guess who's in front of him? Cooper Webster. So this is going to mean a bit of draft now to be able to try and save a little bit more fuel if he elects to do so, or try to immediately get the slipstream to make the pass next time by possibly. That's just been how dominant Max Verstappen has been for the past couple seasons and couple years on this sim. On board with Max Verstappen, then in towards Murray's corner. Avoids taking too much of the curb on the inside, builds up the momentum down the pitch straight. Down in towards turn one to start another lap here. 293 laps have been completed. And now we're estimating 351. The pace is picking up from Verstappen as the temperatures drop. Lap time last time around a 2.03.044. Very impressive stuff then from the Red Bull Racing driver. And he'll hand it on over to the F1 Esports driver Enzo Benito for the final couple of hours in today's race. As they close on up on third place, Cooper Webster to put them one lap down as well. And Bo, we had a bit of a conversation about safety cars and red flags in these official iRacing special events. It is one of the unique things about the special events. There's no external intervention. Once you head out onto track, you take the green flag. It's maximum push all the way till the end. It does sometimes mean that you get these kind of situations where your race winner is going to win this race by an entire lap. Yeah, which, you know, there's pros and cons of uh, having a race run from green to check it all in one go with no interventions. Um, I, I like it in some respect because it's more of an endurance race. There's no brakes as such. It's more uh, sprint racing because every lap truly does matter. You can't afford to play it safe in the early stages of the race. Hello, Max Verstappen. That was a little too sideways through a forest elbow there. So, you know, the race is coming to an end, but you have to be careful. You can't afford to throw this Audi in a fence anytime soon behind the back of the Ultra C Sports car. You'll see he'll go under brakes here, turn it in, and then the rear just not willing to cooperate. Didn't really see it too much from the roof cam, but a big chunk of opposite lock. Here we go. You'll see, he has to catch it very, very quickly indeed. Oh, not comfortable at all. So he saves it, but uh, can't afford too many more of them. Yeah, here's the look that you really want to see. Ooh, very fast on the entry. You can see very close to the inside wall as well. Very quick hands. Grabs a hold of that car, gets it under control. Back to live pictures we go then. Still tucked up behind Cooper Webster. Might be saving just a little bit of fuel at this point in time. Bruno Spengler, by the way, just jumped back behind the wheel of the Team BMW bank car. If you have a second screen, head on over to Twitch to follow along with the BMW Works driver throughout the remaining one hour and 45 minutes of today's action. And a reminder as well that the next time we'll go special event racing will be in one month's time for 12 hours of Sebring as we kick off the VCO Grand Slam for a second year. As VCO and iRacing partner up to promote these special events and RaceBot TV and Radio Show Limited will partner up for uninterrupted coverage of the upcoming special events. We've got the Sebring 12 hours coming up, then the Nürburgring 24 hours a couple of uh, weeks after that. We have the Indy 500 a couple of weeks after that as well in the month of May. Should be a very exciting time. And no bias at all from uh, an IndyCar driver. Max Verstappen, by the way, just brushed the inside wall. We'll get away with that one as we continue taking this great off-board look off the left side door from Max Verstappen. And Justin, you really get a sense here of how fast these cars are moving and how smooth these drivers are being as well. Yeah, and this is a beautiful view to say the very least and just shows again, the amount of elevation change and the amount of bumps and how rough some of this driving can get in some of the corners with how much speed you're going to have to carry here. But you can see here, Max Verstappen, he wants to try and lap his way past the third place car, able to make that move fairly easily. Actually used the lap car as a pick there, I believe, to actually utilize the double toe there. Max Verstappen has now lapped his way past third position. And Redline 1-2, and Team Redline Ice Blue, the only car now not down one lap as Max Verstappen across the line to finish his 26th. 26th lap of the stint. Wasn't sure if it was 26 or 27 for the Dutchman, but across the line, down mountain straight, we will go. An hour and 40 minutes still to go. 
Max Verstappen leads very, very comfortably. Luca Kida has just taken over the 451 Bila Racing Team Euronics car from Sven Haase. He's come out right behind Urana Esports and Luis uh, Nasher, whose name I totally butchered the last time that we saw him coming out of pit lane. But now this battle for those second and third steps of the podium will start to intensify, Bo, because Urana Esports, Bila Racing Team, both cars now on fresh tires. This is the sprint to the checkered flag. Yeah, this is the point of the race where, you know, fuel mileage goes out the window because you know you can make it to the end uh, on a tank of fuel anyway, so don't worry about fuel. And these are the tyres you're finishing the race with, so don't bother conserving them for the next driver or the next stint, so to say, because, you know, you don't have very long to go at all. The track temp's falling, the track is rubbered in. This is the best condition possible. So for Lucas Keats right now in the uh, 451, it's quite simply go as fast as you can, see what you can do, and try and catch the Urano Esports car in front and to make a position happen as they go side by side with the, the second place redline car easily gets through and uh, now we'll see if Luca can maybe uh, use the draft of the redline car to get him back up to the Urano car. Well Luca did uh, an absolutely incredible feat in the opening two stints of the race where he did 32 laps on one tank of fuel. The only car to extend it that far out and now finds himself tucked up behind second place Jeffrey Rietfeld in the Team Redline Ice Blue car and might take this opportunity as his tires build up that temperature and pressure to save his tires just that little bit more. Looks like we've got an interview standing by as well. Oscari Rene, we've seen his teammate jump into the booth a couple of hours ago to talk to us about how the race has gone. I tell you what, let's drag him in and chat to him very quickly. Bo Albert is standing by with Oscari Rene. Yeah, how are you going, Oscari? Great to have you in the RaceBot TV commentary booth. You guys, of course, having a very strong race at the moment. And uh, just quickly, I want to hear how your stints were in the car. I'm assuming that uh, you're probably done for the day now. Um, yeah, I'm done. Um, the first one I started the race was a bit tricky at the start. I mean, I lost a few positions and it was hard to get in a rit proper uh, rhythm. But then the second one was really good. I was able to, uh, to stretch the tires pretty well. and. I had a good grip all around the double stint, and the last one was pretty... I mean, I was struggling a bit with the tires towards the end, but it was fine. I think I think we pulled a different strategy from everybody else since we doubled. Uh, I mean, we didn't change any tires, like, every second pit stop, so... Yeah, well, that is something you've uh, sort of been doing all throughout the race. You've been willing to just do something a little bit different with the strategy. Was that your game plan? all through the week of practice where you were preparing for this race, was that always the mindset of, hey, if everyone's going to be taking tyres every stop, why don't we do something a bit different and take tyres every second stop? Was that always your plan? Well, uh, yes and no, because uh, we thought basically that everyone would do it, but then we saw, I think it was Biela who pitted uh, first, and they took only two tyres, so that was a bit confusing to us, but we just decided to stick to our plan and keep doubling all tyres. Now, you've also gone for the Audi R8, which is obviously a fantastic car around here. It's got plenty of pace. Were there any other cars you guys were sort of weighing up? And what were the pros and cons of each car that you felt overall meant the Audi was the best choice for this 12-hour race? Uh, well, when, when we saw the BOP, it was basically between the, the Audi and the, the BMW. So we thought maybe the BOP speed cars on the, uh, the BMW so we just decided because Audi has proven pretty much to be the overall best car always. So just thought it should be the, the best choice. It was between BMW and Audi pretty much, but I think it was pretty easy choice still. We both liked the, the Audi a bit more. Well, fantastic. Just before I let you go, I just want to get your last thoughts on, realistically, of course, we're looking at around 90 minutes left in this race. What is the team hoping for? And realistically, what do you think you can achieve? Can you get that podium? I think podium is a bit out of our, our reach. I mean, we need mistakes from uh, Altus or the Redline team. So I think top four is the, the P4 is the, the best we can do by just driving. And it seems to be pretty close. We have like four cars on inside 11 seconds now so it will be close because we are not quite sure who will need to fuel how much on the last stop and 
and that, so it will be close. But I think P4 is the maximum we can get without any troubles ahead. Well, fantastic, Oscari. Before I let you go, is there any sponsors you want to thank? Yes, I would like to thank uh, URC, Mega Auto and Imprimo and uh, my whole team, Inertia Sim Racing. Everyone is working really hard uh, this weekend to prep everything for, for the social medias and everything. So thanks to all, all the guys in the team. And thanks to you guys for the broadcast. Well, thank you very much, Oscar, and thank you for jumping into the booth as well. And all the best to Inertia for the remaining 90 minutes in this race. And Arjuna, Inertia still willing to go a little bit risky on the strategy from time to time. Still a little bit. They're making things interesting for us, but we just saw Jordan Caruso back into the car, taking over from Cooper Webster for these closing 90 minutes. And he's got a 6.5 second advantage then over Inertia Sim Racing and Matty Kaidasoa. So this will be an interesting battle till the end as the final set of pit stops then start to work their way through. Team Redline Ice Blue for the penultimate time down onto the pit road. Alexi Yusiakala jumping behind the wheel of this car. And of course, we now wait for Max Verstappen to come down onto pit road. He will presumably hand that car over to Enzo Benito, but Verstappen is known for his love of racing very well may stay in the car bring that to the checkered flag but Justin after a very demanding race so far and the reason I say demanding is despite the fact that he's led almost from lights to flag these guys have been pushing so hard every single lap that you would think that it would be good to get a fresh mind in there and get Enzo who's not had to drive the last couple of hours to take this car home to the end I would think so as well, and it just seems, based on what we've seen with the Red Line Ice Blue Machine, that may be the case where they've gone with the two-hour, two-hour, two-hour kind of philosophy. It's going to be a shorter stint, of course, though, just to get to the end to make sure they take this thing home cleanly. There's been no major mistakes, and right now, I think at this point, I think they're going to be very happy overall Team Red Line for their performances today. In the past, we've seen PRT come away with two victories. We've seen BRS, Coanda come away with the victory last year, as well as Porsche 24 driven by Red Line coming away with the Porsche Cup win last year for the, that respective class. This year, they look to try and come away with what's been a dominating finish to this one. Verstappen onto pit road then. Let's follow him down onto the lane and see what happens very smooth and very calm as he enters the pit road no ch uh, this is not the time for a mistake Verstappen knows that he's been in these situations before in iRacing endurance races and he knows one mistake can change everything here on the mountain he will work his way then into his pit box we'll wait and see if Enzo Benito jumps back behind the wheel of the number 33 team redline orange car into the box they go fuel is being added Verstappen out in jumps Benito then 90 minutes to hold on for Enzo Benito and they'll make it four redline victories in four years pure racing team taking victory overall in the first two years here at the mountain last year VRS breaking the stranglehold of the Germans on the top step of the overall podium, but Porsche 24 driven by Redline, they took home the win in your 911 Cup class, and with that 911 Cup class being removed from this race for the foreseeable future, not only will they remain your defending Porsche Cup champions, but it's looking like Team Redline will make it four victories in four years here on the mountain as Enzo Benito will get a fresh set of ties as well to take him through the closing 90 minutes in today's action. Still some battles, so let's work our way up and down the field once again. We saw Luca Kida closing down Urano Esports in front of him. Another battle developing in the top 15 as Maniti Racing and Racine Fazui chasing down Yas Heat in their BMW. Good to see Maniti Racing back in the Audi after a couple of weeks in competing in different cars in either competitions and they've got Carlos Diguez for Yas Heat in front of them now the battle between the Lamborghinis as well Ronin Simsport and SimRC Titan continue to duel it out then Justin so 
As we close on down in the final stages of the race here, there's still a lot of on-track activity. It really shows you just how much competition there is in this field where we've got 54 of the best sim racing teams out on display. And nevertheless, after 12 hours of action, they are going to end up right next to each other coming across the checkered flag. Yeah, this battle is going to be close now that they're on equal footing the tire. So it's worked out very well. That strategy for on sim sport. They're still off cycle on the fuel, but look at this die. Deep under braking, and they get it slowed down in time. Very well done then from Ronin Simsport to slip in front of Sim RC Titan. 90 minutes still left to work, though. This battle will go all the way until the checkered flag. They're going to fight it out for your top Lamborghini finisher. You've got Formula 1.5 uh, in Formula 1. Here on the iRacing service, you've got the Audi and BMW Cup out front, and then your GT 3.5, if you will, Lamborghini and Ferrari, four cars in this class. Two of them on the edge of the top 10. So very cool to see Lamborghinis working their way up through the field. And of course, in the case of Ronin Simsport, they're up an incredible 36 positions so far. So 90 minutes still to go. It's time for some RaceBot TV fan immersion. And I tell you what, let's jump on back to RHG Jr. because they're embroiled in a fun fight with Five Star Motorsports who have just come out of the pit lane. Let's mix things up a little bit, switch it back and jump further back in the pack to a battle for 18th and 19th position. Let's jump on board for a couple of laps here at the Mount Panorama circuit and take in the sights and sounds on board with Five Star Motorsports.
90 minutes still to go here live from Mount Panorama in the 2021 iRacing Bathurst 12 hours. Welcome back to RaceBot TV for continued coverage of our second special event of the year. Out front, it's Enzo Benito and Max Verstappen, Team Redline Orange, and they lead by almost two minutes from the rest of the field. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati. Delighted that you're joining us then for the final 80 minutes of action here live from Bathurst. I'm joined by Justin Prince and Bo Albert alongside. I've got TV cameras from Istvan Ballo and TrackCams22.com at my disposal, with additional car cameras provided by RaceBot's own Tyler Maxson. You can follow along with live timing at racebot.tv forward slash endurance to keep involved with all of your favorite drivers. With just 80 minutes to go then, it's really closing on up here at Bathurst. And Justin, it's a, tw it's a 12 hour sprint race here. You'd be forgiven for thinking at the front of your field though, for Enzo Benito, Max Verstappen, it's almost been like a Sunday drive. Yeah, they have had a dominating pace from the get-go. They've been upwards of nearly a full second a lap quicker when they've been in the right groove and on their marks. It's been difficult to stop them, to say the very least today. And it's going to be where it's going to need as little mistakes as possible just to secure this victory. If there's any major mistakes now, it could spell disaster. And they've been riding that fine line between a danger and a reward for this entire race so far. So for the team Redline Orange Machine, they'll be hoping that the rest of the race goes very well for them indeed. There are still battles further back. Team Redline Ice Blue and Alexi Yusiakula in second place as things stands. They're 20 seconds clear from Jordan Caruso in the Logitech G Altus Esports car, but they're being chased down by Matty Kaidasoa in the Inertia Sim Racing 24. Nathan Lewis a couple of seconds further down the road, and Urano Esports Bila Racing Team keeping them honest as well. But with 80 minutes still left on the clock then, I asked you for some predictions a few moments ago, about an hour ago I think at this point in time, before the last pit stop window. Your own team, uh, Altus Esports, they're back up into the podium positions right now, but it's very precariously balanced, I think, between them and Inertia Sim Racing. Inertia Sim Racing will owe us a slightly longer pit stop, and Jordan Caruso, last couple of laps, has been very, very quick. Yeah, Jordan is doing a fantastic job at the moment, which is not very good for him, all things considered, of course. Jordan is not someone, he'll admit himself, that is used to these uh, time zones at all. Of course, very, very early in the morning uh, does this race start. This server actually opens at 11 p.m. Australian time, so he's not used to uh, being up all through the morning. This is a new experience for him. It's actually his first ever special event that he's running in as well, so it's uh, plenty of new experiences for Jordan Caruso, but uh, he's taking to it very well doing a great job but absolutely the blowtorch is still being applied by the inertia sim racing car behind they are not slow at all half a second faster last lap around Caruso does respond on this lap but uh Altus can't afford to get too comfortable and he did mention there that the time zone factor as well of course the australians top sim racer joshua rogers found himself having to leave the region searching for a slightly easier situations to uh, make these big competitions. Now resides in the Coanda team house in Germany. And uh, now being joined by a fellow Australian in Coanda. Not at the house just yet, but Dane Warren. Maybe, maybe to uh, make that trip at some point in the future. The newest addition to the Coanda team house is Mitchell de Jong, who's competing in three different iRacing World Championships this season. The eNASCAR Coca-Cola Series, the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup, and the iRacing Rallycross World Championship, where he is the inaugural series champion as well. Not being a great day for Coanda, though. Defending champions of this race, their only entry in today's field, the number 88, is three laps down and back in 24th position. So, absolutely crazy to think about VRS Coanda three laps down on pace, especially given the uh, domination that they displayed at Daytona just a month ago. They did have a guest driver joining them as well, Moritz Lohner. Speculation still rumbles on as to his future destination. Not sure if you know anything, Bo, that I'm not aware of here. Uh, I know nothing official, but I, I heard you say uh, a little earlier in the broadcast that you have your suspicions at the moment, and I definitely have mine as well. 
but uh, because I don't know them for fact and they're just assumptions, I will uh, stay tight-lipped, but uh, no, definitely, whatever Moritz is uh, planning, whatever he is scheming, clearly there's something big happening for him, whether it's in the iRacing racing world or another platform uh, that he's going to be competing on, uh, clearly something big is happening, and hey, look, he's a fantastic driver, so congrats to him, and I hope it works out. I was trying to get you to uh, slip up there, so uh, apparently you don't That's know right. anything either. Um, <laughs> um, there are some rumors about various driver changes going around. Not silly season just yet. I have a feeling in a couple of weeks' time, once we conclude the Porsche Tagger Esports Super Cup for 2021, silly season will kick off once again with an expected world championship for the Dallara IR01 to come later on in the fall. And qualifying for that as well should start kicking off then in the next couple of months. The uh, fictional Dallara IR01 car, which of course is a very scary machine to drive. Not sure how much experience you have in that one, Justin, but any time that I try and get behind the wheel there, uh, I end up finding I either crash or I'm very slow. I've tried it before and it carries a ton of speed. It is insane how quick you have to go through the gears and how quick you are around the entire racetrack and how precise you're going to need to be to be able to slow down the car, to be able to make some of these corners. It's going to be where you're going to be right up on the wheel, I think, as a driver, if you want to be able to compete at the world championship level for that respective car in winning form because it is not going to be easy with it being that wicked quick. There are updates coming to the car in the new build as well. Week 12 will kick off on Monday or Tuesday, depending where in the world you are. Week 13, the week after that, brand new week, a uh, brand new season of iRacing competitions and brand new content about to arrive as well. Hopefully, a uh, loose, loose lips Tony will make an appearance in the forums once again to uh, break down all the content on the horizon, but for the moment, speculation about new road tracks being added. Hockenheim, Red Bull Ring, for example. The Hungara Ring as well. As well as rally cross tracks at the uh, circuit, uh, circuit de Catalunya. A couple of other additions as well. So, might be a big build on the horizon. In the meantime, though, I'm taking a look at our YouTube chat. Uh, Inertia Sim Racing versus Altus Esports bow is starting to kick off very slightly. <laughs> I'm just trying to uh, play a few little mind games here with Inertia because the fact is they're doing a fantastic job on track right now. So if they're going to try and win on track, I'm going to at least try and win in the YouTube chat. Just a little bit of fun as uh, the gap now down to 2.2 seconds. Matty Kaitasoa really is flying. Uh, someone said Matty Airlines is on fire. Not sure that's the situation you want to be in, unfortunately. But nevertheless, uh, <laughs> Kaitasoa joined up with this team just a few months ago. And Justin, I have... We were talking about this just before we came back on air. I think Kai Soa, so focused and committed on this race, he wasn't even competing in the Super Cup today. I believe that may have been the case indeed, but you have to give him credit. This organization, very happy to have him on board. Remember talking about this during the Daytona 24, in fact, when he jumped into the race car. And this was a big pickup for this organization to be able to learn from and be able to have a driver of his caliber. And you can tell the difference. And it's really helped them for this organization for today. How about half a second gain last time by though? Already almost within trafting distance here to be able to try and make this a hard fought fight. The thing is again, that pit stop strategy is gonna be really intriguing since they're going to have to pit in 10 laps. That puts them at a 26 laps to go mark to be able to make it to the end on gas. Sorry, I'm very distracted right now. Uh, SimRC Titan, we saw the Battle of the Lamborghinis a couple of moments ago. Ronin Simsport got the move done and is now 12 seconds clear of the number 76. So not sure if potentially more damage on that number 76 car, we take a look then, coming through into the chase, tucked up behind the Beeler Racing Team Euronics entry in front of them. And Bo, the lap times for the SimRC car the last few times around, 
there's no other way to put this. They've been dreadful. 206, 297 last time. What's the lap time going to be this time around? Yeah, I'm looking exactly at what you're looking at, Arjuna, and it is an improvement. It's a 246, but the first thing I did was go straight to the lap times, and everyone's roughly around the 2 minute 3s, 2 minute 4s, and I'm seeing a lot of 2 minute 5s and 6s, almost the 207 at one point at the moment as well for Marvin Shrell, so whatever is happening, maybe just the car not gelling in his conditions for his liking, or perhaps just a little bit uncomfortable with the, you know, having the pressure of being in the car at this stage of the race, because of course, there is a lot of pressure on the drivers at this point in the race. Everyone has built up to this moment. This is the, what everyone's been working for, the final hour or so, and uh, getting the car to the checkered flag. And you're the driver that has the responsibility to get that car to the checkered flag. So that mental uh, pressure may be weighing on him a little bit as well. So uh, has just put a little bit of a fire extinguisher on the uh, battle of the Lamborghinis that we're seeing a little while ago. But hey, fantastic pace from Ronan as well to build that gap. Uh, even if the other driver is uh, a little bit off the mark. Well, I've broken out my yellow pen tool. You're never a true race bot producer until you can do this at will. I'm curious about <laughs> these little two markers that we're seeing here. The first one on the left-hand side, slight crumpling on the bodywork. On the right-hand side, you can kind of see just about there. There's a bit of a hole poking through where you can see the uh, road going on past. Not sure if that's compromising the SimRC car, but you can already see Nine tenths is the gap between Beeler Racing and Sim RC. Down the Conrod straight they go. So unfortunately, there, Battle of the Lamborghinis, Ronan Simsport looks to come out on top. Let's turn our attention back to third and fourth because Kaidasoa Airlines continues to close the gap. It's 1.8 seconds between third and fourth now, Justin. And you talk about this pit stop window. Have you have you been able to do the math and figure out what the pit stop delta is going to be here? Because of course, Kaidasoa with that slightly longer fuel stop is going to have more time to gain on track now the total time delta is going to be the tough part because it all comes down to the preparation on how much work you put in arjuna because you need to know exactly to the liter or gallon how much you're going to have to put in because for some they have some fuel calculators that help that they have strategists in some error cases they in error new in other regards have to have those notes so with that being said right now, it's going to be really tricky because we already know Inertia is going to have to fill up to nearly a full tank to make it to the end. For Alta Sea Sports, it's going to be about how much do they risk putting an underfuel in the car to be able to save time in the, t in the pit stop window. Keep in mind that the Delta for drivers who have double stinted today has been around... 34, 35 plus seconds or so for today. So that's the ballpark to keep that in mind. So there's a chance they might be able to gain a few seconds at minimum right now in the pit stop sequence. It is coming down all the way to the wire here. Not out front where Enzo Benito has extended the gap to 1 minute 53 seconds. So as mentioned, he will put his teammate a lap down come the end of the race might also prove to uh, set up a photo finish, uh, or at least a photo opportunity for uh, the Team Redline virtual photographers. Reminder as well that while this is not a VCO Grand Slam, you can take your own media from today's race and stay involved on the VCO social media channels. When the VCO Grand Slam returns in just under one month's time, we'll have full media coverage from the experienced videographers and photographers on the VCO staff, but for now, VCO wants to see your media from today's event. Use the hashtag VContent to stay involved or head on over to the VCO Esports Discord as well to share your experiences on the mountain. There are 32 different splits and despite the fact that one commentator once implied that only this top split matters, there will be 32 different race winners after today and lots of different teams that can claim to have conquered the mountain and Justin, I it's such a difficult thing to exp explain because I've had relatively good success here at Bathurst, being able to survive. My luck at Daytona, which Bo mentioned earlier as being one of his favorite tracks, has been much worse. And it took me five years to finish a race at the 24 hours of Daytona. So some people just have better luck at others. You know, for me, I love Bathurst. For others, they might really not like coming to this place. Yeah, it's... A love-hate relationship almost for some drivers, right? 
I love this place because the intense racing. But as a driver, it'd be terrifying, of course, to be able to do this perfectly. And for a lot of drivers, it's for the fun of it, the preparation, and for the thrill of competing as a team to be able to win this type of race. That's where, in every split, I think drivers feel the most proud is being able to know that all your work can lead to a victory or major success. And for many of these organizations, that preparation has worked out to these types of fights we're seeing now, or you see Team Red Light Orange end up taking off into the sunset. And I'll just ex elaborate on this as well, because again, it's not just about these top split events. There are thousands, yep. 11,000 people who participated in the 24 hours of Bathurst. Me, myself, it started on Reddit when I put out a post about four years ago looking for some teammates to jump into a, a 24 hour race that takes place in the French countryside that I'm no longer allowed to say the name of. Found a couple of guys on Reddit, became very good friends with one of them, not so good friends with the other. Four or five years later, I'm still great friends with one of the guys. I have a team, I'm a race bot commentator, and it all started from one Reddit post five years ago. Bo, I know you've been on your own journey through sim racing across of different simulators, competing in world championship competitions as well. You know this better than anyone. Everyone in sim racing is on their own journey, and it's on us in the community to celebrate one another. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're, as a community, just tearing each other apart over little things or, you know, just little details, it brings everyone down. As a whole, sim racing needs to bring each other up, celebrate each other's successes, and from there, you know, the community grows, it becomes more positive. And when things are more positive, it grows even faster again. It's an endless cycle of uh, growth for sim racing, and that, I think you know, everyone who cares for sim racing wants to see it grow, wants to see it prosper. And uh, it's not going to grow and prosper if you're, you know, tearing each other down and uh, just making or uh, trying to make others feel bad over one thing or the other. Ooh. You know, it all starts somewhere for everyone. And unfortunately for the 04, I think that might have been. It's starting to end in the wall. So we'll get a replay up on screen and see what has fallen here uh, for this particular car. And it may be a lap traffic situation for Sam Michaels' contact from behind. And the r for r Motorsport car gets sent around at a horrible place on the circuit. And we'll jump on board with 5 Star Motorsport. Just a bit of a weird one. Michaels is very slow on the inside, and I don't think Jason Cooper really had any idea what was going on there in this situation. We'll grab one more look at it from our aerial look, brought to us by ATVO, graphical partners at RaceBot TV. You know, take a look here, slightly sideways off the exit, into the wall very early on. And the Audi sends the BMW around, and you can see there, that was Vendaval Sim Racing and Miniti Racing having to go scampering. Back to live pictures, and let's pick up the battle between Urano Esports and BS Competition, because battle for fifth place starting to intensify, Justin. And there is the potential possibility of one of them touching the ball a couple laps ago. There is a little bit more scratches now on that 90 machine compared to before. They are on a similar cycle on the tires as well here. So it's going to be critical for Lewis to have to be able to defend here. You can tell that that little bit of scratches that have been built up, I think more so on the left side now, is slowing him down a touch bit more than he was before. The last time by a 2044 compared to the 2035 for the car behind. Down McFilmy Park, they work. BS competition, Nathan Lewis. You can see the damage potentially on the right-hand side of the car. Down the hill we work. Urano Esports then sniffs that opportunity for fifth place. Luke Akita, by the way, is now 4.3 seconds off the back of this train. So unfortunately for him, uh, this opening stint of his double has not gone the way that he would have anticipated. And nevertheless, Urano Esports in a very good opportunity here. And... Bo, uh, Urano Esports, one of these outfits that are slowly growing in sim racing. Uh, they signed up a couple of big names earlier last year, right as uh, we went into lockdown and so many of those big competitions started up. And they did fairly well in some of them and now making a good debut here, and not a debut rather, a good performance in the iRacing special event. Down the inside they go, up into fifth place. Oh, I just about had to clear the BS competition car on the exit there, but they do clear it. Plenty of respect given from Nathan Lewis and that pass is completed, but absolutely, you know, 
I think back to 12 months ago, I never heard of Urano. They weren't a team I'm familiar with, and I'd like to think that, you know, I'm someone that at least knows all of these teams at least to a decent enough level, and yet Urano completely flew under my radar, and yet all of a sudden, you know, they picked up, you know, some good drivers. They got a few from the Prologue React Esports team that was around for a little while. Um, the likes of Daniel Pasta was a big influence as well in getting more fast drivers to join the team. And they just built momentum very, very quickly and out of nowhere. And now, you know, steering down a top five in a special event. And we know the potential is there for so much more. There are podiums. There are definitely wins and uh, world championship appearances in this team's future. You never know, actually, as well. Uh, this team has come straight into sim racing. Lots of big name sponsors attached. The likes of Huawei HP on board for several of the events that we did last year. And now here, starting off 2021 very well. A team that's got a number of big German drivers in their ranks as well. So, BS competition after making contact at the elbow, apparently, on the inside of the wall. Nathan Lewis now drops into the clutches of Luca Kida as well. Down the road, though, in front of these guys, Inertia Sim Racing and Logitech Gialtis Esports still dueling it out. And I'm curious here, Bo, what you think about the balance between these two cars as we enter the closing stages. Track temperature continues to fall. And as we saw in the opening stages of this race, you know, give about about 10 hours ago or so, the Audi was very, very strong. I'm very curious to see if, as the temperatures continue to drop, does the BMW maybe fall off the pace very slightly? I don't know if it falls off the pace as much as the Audi just gets that much stronger. Of course, the Audi is a very loose car to drive. It's very, very sensitive. It's very, very easy to upset. Track temperature goes down. Obviously, the tire is able to grip into the road a much, much be lot better. That was great English. Um, and overall, there's more grip available for the car. So that st instability the Audi naturally has becomes less of a factor because you have so much more grip. Uh, available to you all of a sudden so the Audi becomes more and more comfortable you get more confidence as a driver to push and uh, that's where the lap time really comes from so uh, in that respect absolutely the Audi will become just a little bit stronger than the BMW as we enter just about our uh, last 60 minutes in this race but of course in the wider spectrum of this battle and the balance performance in this battle it's going to be very very interesting because obviously Ultra C Sports nine laps more into a uh, or nine laps less into a fuel stint at the moment so roughly looking at around 10 seconds quicker in the pit stop what they decide to do with that i'm pretty interested to see i've had no communication with the team in these uh, final two hours i've left them all to their own devices so even i'm in the dark on this one but uh if they were willing to be a little bit risky they could even take tires and uh, maybe try and hunt down the uh, inertia sim racing car in the final few laps on new tires and a uh, slightly better fuel load, but, you know, for Altus right now, the thinking caps have to be on, because clearly the pace isn't quite there on the same level as Inertia. And Kaidosoa Airlines looks to try and upgrade you to a brand new form of jet engine, potentially. Down the hill we go, onto the Conrod straight. Gap now underneath one second for the first time so far. Into the final hour of competition as well, then, as one more round of pit stops will be due. Kaida Soa, Justin, is due then in about four laps time and Jordan Caruso will come down onto pit lane with about 40 minutes left on the race clock. Give or take, yes. It's the matter of will they try and do something different? Remember, they went to about 25 to 26 laps in the last stint. Looking like they're going to go towards their end mark on the fuel tank in about three laps this time by. But this allows them to save a touch bit more fuel to be able to put in a little bit less if they so choose to right here. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them stay tucked up behind for about a couple laps if they can before they really duck down to the pit lane. And as the uh, YouTube chat starts to brainstorm about potential 24-hour races that we can do in the French countryside, just a reminder as well that... The real thing that we're brainstorming for here is what the camera name should be at the end of the Mulsanne Strait, where uh, the race bot cone goes through its yearly tradition of being sacrificed on a minute-by-minute -minute <laughs> basis for 140 minutes. Uh, sorry, not 140 minutes. That would be a very short race. 1,440 minutes of racing action. That's what will happen. That cone gets hit about 2,880 times, about two times every single minute. But that is a long way away still to go. Lots of events on this iRacing special event calendar. And 
the addition of a very interesting one in the Suzuka 10 hours that will take place later this year, part of the VCO Grand Slam as well. And again, you'll be able to watch uninterrupted coverage of all of those events. RaceBot TV, Radio Show Limited will be partnering up once again. You can catch it live on YouTube as well as on RSL. As that gap now down to eight tenths of a second. This is coming down every single lap. That BMW is starting to drop off the pace. Like Bo says, it's more the Audi coming into its own. And at some point, Bo, I do want to jump back on board with uh, Enzo Benito and kind of see what that car is behaving like because we did an onboard lap earlier in today's race. It will be interesting to see if you're noticing any characteristics that are slightly different in these cooler temperatures. Yeah, it would be interesting to see, but I think the biggest gain, of course, will be the mid-corner speed. Of course, you thought these cars in the uh, daytime were very, very fast over the top of the mountain. You should see them in the late afternoon conditions. The Lux Vento Benito will be going across the top of the mountain at hypersonic speeds. It'll be very, very interesting to see, and uh, maybe we'll do that as we uh, enter the final stages of this race. But I'm a little bit curious to know what Matty Cardasoli is going to do here, because we know he is going to have to dive in for a pit stop extremely soon. Um, depending on how much fuel he's been burning so far this stint. So I'm wondering as we see uh, the Urano Esports car dive in for what will be its final pit stop, and doesn't look like we're going to see a driver change there, so Louis will uh, stay in for the end there. But uh, for Kaida Soya, surely it's not worth going for an aggressive overtake on the Altus Esports car now, but trying to fuel safe behind it, and uh, just sort of you know recover a little bit of the fuel that it's uh, going to lose in its uh, next pit stop. So we'll wait and see what the pit stop time is for Urano Esports. 30 seconds stationary so far as we wait for the number 93 to roll off the box. Doesn't look like they're rolling just yet. And as we take a look at them, no tires being taken. 38 seconds is the final pit stop time then for the number 93. They'll come back out onto track in seventh position, searching for that top five position turn our attention back to that battle that we were watching just a few moments ago. Looks like over the top of the hill, Justin, the gaps extended out very slightly. As they were coming down in towards Skyline, it was just two tenths of a second between these two cars. Yes, indeed, and that's just some of the closeness when it comes to that top of the mountain in that run all the way through the answers, through Skyline, through the Dipper. But I agree with Bo. Just save the gas. Right now, it's too risky, I think, to be diving on in, knowing you're coming in for a lap, in about a lap either way. So, at this point, just keep on riding behind. You. Let the slipstream carry you forward. As here here they, they come. Go. Here they come down onto the lane. No mistakes then in the number 24. Look how much of the uh, grass that he takes, maximizing his pit entry down onto the pit road speed. And now to the left-hand side, he'll pull into his box. Bo, that was about as perfect a pit entry as we've seen today. And now the pressure is on your teammates to really nail these next seven laps. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they need to do, of course. Matic Kaitasoya, dive into the pits. He won't take any new tires. I wouldn't expect it will purely just be fuel. But those tires will just cool down a little bit, get back in the operating uh, window that you want your tires. So actually, even though he's not taking new tires, there will still be a slight undercut effect to some degree, so that inertia car is going to be even faster perhaps uh, over the next two or three laps in particular compared to the Altus car, so absolutely. Right now, the pressure is on Caruso to nail these laps to within a millimeter of every single wall, hit your apexes, hit your marks, and uh, really limit the damage, and make sure that with that fuel advantage they will have in the pit stops as Kaida Suya uh, gets rolling once again, of course, as we expected, no tires. Caruso needs to make sure he is not losing more time than he is gaining from uh, his less fuel that he needs in this pit stop. And crucially, Kaidasoa comes out right behind some lap traffic. That's Yas Heat. And Carlos Diguez, 14th position out on track. And uh, you did mention tires will be in a slightly more optimal window if he's overheated them coming down onto the lane, which is always something that you can do. Maximize that braking zone onto the pit entry. But unfortunately now, we'll have to clear some traffic over the top of the mountain, comp compromising him on some crucial time that he could not afford. 
to be giving up at this point in the race. In front of them, though, we talked about the damage for Nathan Lewis. Here comes Luca Kida to take advantage of the situation, Justin. Unfortunately for BS Competition, that car dropping down to the tail end of the top five. Yeah, they are still turning 204s at this point. Half a second lost last time by, and now with the toe being reeled on in, I think they're in a bunch of trouble here until at least pit stop sequences to be able to figure things out here because all they can do is really just continue to hold on and try and play defensive if they can here to try and keep track position. But the, that, that's the tough part. They also, keep in mind, have to pit two laps earlier than be a racing team at the moment. Or be a racing rather. So it's going to be tough. They do have a bit of a buffer to some of the cars behind. So... For BS competition, they may be staring at a 7th place finish. They come down onto the lane, get some damage repaired, but still would be a very impressive finish for the Charging Zebras. As they'll build up momentum heading both to the virtual and the real Sebring International Raceway in just a couple of weeks time. We pick up Ronan Simsport and the leading Lamborghini in today's field. Down in 11th place, but chasing down Tyler Hervius for Pure Sims Esports and the 116. Audi versus Lamborghini once again. Lamborghini coming on Strongbow as the sun continues to set. Yeah, I think the Lamborghini is absolutely coming on strong at the moment, but so is Gabriel. He is punching in some phenomenal laps at the moment. Of course, we mentioned not so long ago that uh, the gap to Marvin Strell and the Sim RC Lamborghini was uh, you know, out of some 12 seconds. Well, I can tell you now, it's a lot more than that now. They are absolutely flying at the moment in the Ronin Sim Sport car. And uh, really, I think Tyler Hervius in the uh, Pure Sims Esports car, you know, I really think he's just the victim on Gabriel's hit list at the moment. He is flying. Uh, well, Ronin does have to come down onto pit lane probably this time around as well. Pure Sims 15 laps into their stint. They'll stick out on track for an additional 12 or 13 laps or so. Pit lane, though, is busy. There's 10k Beneke down onto the lane. Is there a driver change going on? Yes, there is. Jonas Wolmeyer jumps behind the wheel of the BMW Team Redline car. I guess what they figured out, Justin, is they've got enough of an advantage that uh, after a very difficult day, Max Beneke will get a well-earned rest now. Yeah, for some of the drivers, keep in mind, there's a ton of preparation that goes into some of the special event races. But as well... The World Championship races, too, take several hours minimum of preparation. Where some of the drivers talk about how they spend the entire week spending hours upon hours turning thousands of laps. In some cases, 1,500 to 3,000 laps in some series. That just shows the amount of dedication required and the reason why you want to give a driver such as Beneke a rest knowing... He's put in all of this time. Has already had a World Championship race today. He's going to be exhausted. Allowing the chance to rest. Knowing the car is damaged and finish things out. Solid top 10 regardless. Despite the damage. They've been able to do fairly well with that car. Meanwhile, BS Competition have just been passed by Luca Kida. Vila Racing Team in the 451 car. That started off this race by doing 32 lap stints. They'll work their way up in past BS competition, trying to chase down the likes of Inertia Sim Racing and Urano Esports as well. Expecting BS competition in either this lap or the next lap. Then we'll wait for Logitech G Altus Esports next as well. They're about five laps from owing us a pit stop. Team Redline Ice Blue will come down the lap after that. Enzo Benito for Team Redline Orange out in the race lead will come down one lap after that as well. And so in about 15 minutes time, we will be done with our final round of pit stops. All cars will be good to make it to the end from here. And we'll get that final picture of the sprint to the end. What we do know though, Justin, is that Enzo Benito, Max Verstappen, that gap between them and their teammates in second place, is getting very close to two minutes now. Yeah, and it helps that they've had some clean track for a good amount of time to be able to close up to Team Redline Ice Blue. But the thing is, there's a ton of traffic in front of both of them starting to build up. You have the Junior R8 G Esports car. You have Dual Racing Team Neuronics' fourth entry, or rather third entry coming up. And you also have a couple other cars like the VRS Coanda Simsport Machine that could be within range right before their pit stop window. 
So that's going to all play a factor, I think, in can they catch up to them and lap the entire field, including their own teammates, to close things out? Absolutely insane. I think Red Line Ice Blue maybe just knows the left-hand side of that car into the wall, pushing all the way to the limit and beyond. But nevertheless, dominant performance for Max Verstappen, Enzo Benito, Alexei Yusiakala, and his teammate Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Rietfeldt will try and hang on to the second place on track. And as mentioned by Ronan Simsport in our YouTube chat, as we approach this final 45 minutes after 11 hours of build-up, there are still some very exciting fights out on track, and as we work our way through the pit cycle, boat, it's hard to really tell exactly where they are, uh, because we're in this kind of a situation where we think we know what's going to happen, but you never want to say you know what's going to happen. No, exactly, and endurance racing is an unpredictable beast. There's so many times that I think I know what's going to happen. I'm like, yep, lock it in. That's what's going to be the end result, and then come the end of the uh, race it's, nope it's totally different to everything i expected one thing i do want to say though is at the moment maddie kaida sawyer is struggling on his outlaps he has not been at the pace you would expect he's running about nine tenths of a second slower than jordan caruso in the ultra Sports car and he on this particular lap right now that we're watching he had a very big wiggle at the cutting as well so maybe the extra fuel load of course goes all the way to the back of the audi in, uh, with this uh, configuration of uh, engine layout really not working for him or something because clearly the confidence that he had before the pit stop just isn't quite gelling the same way now. You can see there those lap times. A couple of laps immediately after the pit stop in the 204s. Uh, Bo, you do know you have a lot of experience in GT3 cars. Even when you double stint these tires, especially when you double stint those tires the first couple of laps with full fuel slightly worn tires it's like driving on ice and you kind of have to wait for the fuel to burn off very slightly before the pace comes back to you and you can start pushing once again so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out bs competition they're down on the lane so next time around we're expecting Beeler racing team Euronics. and we're just a couple of laps away then from your teammates in altus esports diving their way down onto lane as well Yep, plenty of pit stops taking place. BS competition with the damage they have on the front of their car. Just hurting them ever so slightly, so they will uh, get that fixed. And they're already back on the lane and underway. So there is Matty Kaida. So he will get that one position off there. And actually, BS competition come out relatively close behind as well. So a good job there from BS competition to be so close to the likes of Inertia Sim Racing. But uh, yeah, at the moment, you know, I expected Matty, despite obviously, like you mentioned, the double sensor tires and the heavier fuel load, be a little bit closer to the mark but at the moment this is really playing into the hands of Altus and uh, you know maybe solidifying their position on the podium if they can uh, keep the car on the circuit but uh, Kaida Sawyer of course uh, will have a slight advantage perhaps in overall car pace as the uh, track temperature continues to fall almost down into the uh, high 20s now so plenty of uh, shade appearing over the uh, Mount Panorama circuit. Pit stop time for Nathan Lewis 31 seconds just under 32 seconds so about seven seconds delta between inertia sim racing and bs competition on fuel expect that to be slightly larger than to altus esports in that battle for the third and final step on the podium working our way in towards the final 45 minutes of action here our second special event of the year vrs coanda took victory at the daytona 24 at least in your overall class team redline are going to be fighting back and they'll make it four victories in four years here on the mountain. And the next time we will be live, as mentioned, we'll be at Sebring for the 12 hours of Sebring. Very different type of a race, Justin. Uh, you're here on public roads, uh, relatively smooth if there is uh, a lot of incline and elevation change. Sebring is much flatter, but much bumpier and a very different type of a circuit. Yeah, of course, it's going to be an interesting race to see which team's coming on top there with the different types of speed you need to be able to set up there. I'm, inter I'm interested to see if we see some of the top teams from here, though, be able to carry a lot of momentum over to Sebring. It's going to be a tricky race again, especially in Sectors 1 and 2, I think. Sector 3 is going to be important to maintain speed overall, so you can't just carbon copy, I don't think, 
what you have from here, of course, and copy it over to Sebring because of the amount of elevation change here. Sebring is obviously not just known for its bumps, but uh, yep. lots of other racetracks, as, uh, races as well that have taken place yep. there. Uh, I'm trying to think of who won the first ever race there. Was it Carol Shelby? And did he say something about uh, racing one hour at uh, Sebring is like racing 17 hours or something at Watkins Glen? A very, very high praise from Carol Shelby for the Sebring International Raceway. And of course, lap record now being set by the monstrous Toyota LMP1 cars. We won't be matching those type of lap times when we head over there in a month's time. We'll have our Dallara P217s at the front of the field, your GTLM class in the middle, and then GTD at the back. It will be BMW and Lamborghini in the GTD class once again. And I'm just curious what you think, Bo, will be the balance of performance there, because obviously the Audi has been very strong here today. A little bit weaker is the Lamborghini, at least compared to the BMW from what we can tell. Do you think it will be slightly similar when we get to Sebring? It'd be a little bit interesting to see how the cars would go at Sebring. Of course, the Lamborghini, I think, outright pace will be slightly faster. Well, at least you would think on paper at uh, Sebring. But at the same time, the Lamborghini does seem to get thrown around a little bit on the bumps. And, oh, I mean, at Sebring, the bumps aren't in short supply at all. So, honestly, I reckon it'd be pretty close between the two cars. It'd definitely require quite a lot of testing between the... Uh, for the teams to actually figure that out because of course we saw at daytona both the lamborghini and the uh, bmw were extremely close to one another so you never know it could actually be another race where we see two different cars in the bmw and the lamborghini definitely you know pretty much equal on paper and uh, both can win the race luca kita by the way is out of pit lane i was trying to see where he would cycle out i was expecting him to cycle out maybe around Nathan Lewis maybe slightly in front of Lewis behind Kaida Soa, but Luca Kida now up into fourth position has jumped Matty Kaida Soa on the pit stop cycle after spending nine seconds shorter on pit road. So change around then for position. Bela Racing Team up into fourth, and then Justin as we wait now for Logitech Gialtis Esports. It's very much looking like Logitech Gialtis Esports will come out in third, Bela Racing Team will be in fourth. And then Inertia Sim Racing and Matty Kaida Soa will be setting sail and trying to chase them down from fifth place. And that's the tough thing, right, is they had to add the extra fuel and that is the trouble spot of having to deal with extra weight in that race car. And you have to wonder and have to feel that's going to be impacting and it is the current impact for the times. I'm keeping a close eye on that to see if they can get that time distance down and quickly here because they're going to need it to go down I think for them to really utilize and execute the strategy properly they're going to be lightning quick towards the end of this run possibly on in regards to later fuel depending on how the tires fare but it's going to be important for them to at the very least get into the 451's draft if they want to be able to get some more time picked up so we now wait for Jordan Caruso to come down onto pit road. Splash of fuel, final stop in the Logitech Gialtis Esports car. As Cooper Webster, Jordan Caruso sharing the 43. On the podium right now, they've got to hold on for the remaining 39 minutes in today's race. And while this will unfold under pit cycle, let's turn our attention back to Enzo Benito for a few moments time at the very least because you can just about see there as uh, Team Redline Ice Blue goes through the chase. Here comes the race leader. And uh, I did say it was going to be about 60 minutes when Team Redline Orange lapped the entire field bow. I was a little bit off on time, but nevertheless, you get the sense of the speed that Max Verstappen and Enzo Benito have been charging around the Mount Panorama circuit for 11 hours and almost 30 minutes so far. 30 minutes about left to go still. That pace has not relented. They are still the fastest car on track. They are running at an incredible pace given their lead at the moment. The complete lack of need to risk the car at this point with the lead they have. But they're continuing to punch in great laps. Last lap around he did a 203.3, but the lap before that was actually a 202.7. 
which is bonkers to be in the 2.7s when a vast majority of the field are in the 204s. So that's some over, you know, 1.4 seconds compared to what some other teams are running. So, you know, what can you say about Team Redline Orange? Clearly, they've come into this race prepared. They've had a game plan. They've had a strategy. And they've just executed to a, such a phenomenal level. There really is so little you can fault them for in this race. They've, you know, maybe been one or two little moments that haven't been perfectly ideal. Of course, I remember Enzo Benito just clipping the wall at Forest Elbow in the early stage of the race. But we're talking about at the end of a 12-hour race, their biggest issue they had was slightly grazing a wall on the exit of the corner. Like, that is a phenomenal effort. And uh, with 37 minutes to go, you know... They really can afford to uh, you know, just lead, ease off and take it nice and easy, but I don't think they will. They're very, very comfortable at this pace. And I think at, at some point, uh, when you're comfortable and when you're in the groove, slowing yourself down can sometimes hurt you more than it helps you. For Enzo Benito, then 35 minutes. He's got one pit stop still to go. He'll come down onto pit road in just a couple of laps time. And we'll wait for Jordan Caruso, the next car, to uh, come down for their final pit stop in just a few moments' time. And then we'll see exactly how that shakes out with uh, Luca Kida, Matty Kaidosoa in close pursuit as well. We pick up Jordan Caruso then, coming down in towards the chase. Should be pulling to the left side of the track, making his way down onto the pit road. The gap to Luca Kida is 63 seconds. Pit road time expected for Jordan Caruso, 52 seconds. What's it going to be? How's it going to shake out? Onto the pit road for the final time. This is the most important stop of the entire race, and the podium hangs in the balance. Luca Kida, Matty Kaidasoa continue to work their way around the track, and let's pick them up down the hill they come. And Bo, if I've got my math right here, Jordan Caruso should have a nice 12 second advantage over Luca Kida. Yeah, that's what we've sort of worked it out to be as well. Around the 12 second mark, we're expecting about a uh, 10 second quicker pit stop compared to the uh, inertia sim racing car, plus a little bit um, gained uh, for the laps that have been run so far on the uh, overcut for the Ultra C Sports car. But of course, then you've got the likes of the Beeler Racing Team, which is actually still on a great pace and pulling away from the inertia car behind. So that is the crucial thing. Where does Caruso come out in relation to Luca Keaton, I tell you what, it's not even close. Out of pit exit goes Jordan Caruso in the Ulta C Sports car in third place at the moment. Luca Kita entering the final corner now. It might even be larger than 12 seconds, the gap. We'll wait for the timing to update as Logitech Gialtis Esports comes out right behind one of the R8G. No, sorry, that's the RLR Abruzzi car. It makes life very easy for the Australian team. Jordan Caruso holds on to the third step of the podium for now. The gap, in fact, is 18 seconds back to uh, Luca Kida. Matty Kaidasoa a further two seconds down the road. So it looks like the podium is going to be all but locked up at this point in time. Battle now will continue on between Inertia Sim Racing and the Beeler Racing Team. And at this venture, Justin, I would be fairly confident in saying that Kaidasoa Airlines is going to set sail and catch the back of Luca Kida. The question is... Which Audi has a bit more speed than the other? Yeah, that's going to be a good question because we've seen both of them be very quick today for obvious reasons. And at some point, compared to the others, Inertia has had some great speed lately, but I think it's going to come down to driver versus driver and really how they perform in these types of scenarios. And Matty Kawasso... For Matty, he, we've seen him be able to perform in these types of scenarios in the past. It's just the tough part of trying to look, close up to Lee, Luca, but it's going to be easy to catch. It's difficult to pass. That's going to be the key thing. And he's got to get inside the draft for him to have a true shot here to make the move. 33 minutes to push all the way to the checkered flag then for Matty Kaidasoa. 1.9 seconds is the gap. And he works himself in towards that drafting range. Then we wait for the final set of pit stops. And we'll wait for Alexi Yusiakala, Enzo Benito to make their way down onto pit road. 
It's been a long day for you, Bo, but I think this is a great way to uh, cap it off. Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup slightly earlier, and now here at the Bathurst 12 Hours, closing off what's been a very entertaining race. And uh, guess what? Max Verstappen going to win this one, hopefully. Yeah, it does look that way. And of course, not just uh, Max Verstappen, but Enzo Benito as well. Those two as a combination have done a brilliant job and uh, definitely running away with it. Well-deserved as well as uh, the gap between them and their teammates gets ever closer towards uh, lapping the entire field. And what an achievement that is. I wonder how many times that has happened in an outright race where uh, the leader has been able to lap their teammate so frequently and with such ease as well as Alexi UC Yakola actually dives into the pit lane in second place. So uh, that will very briefly... Nope, Enzo Benito dives into the pits as well. So <laughs> maybe the uh, overlap here will happen on the pit lane. Well, we did see in the VCO Cup of Nations a week ago at the Audi R8 race at Le Mans, Bart Horsten and I believe it was Nick Foster coming across the line in a formation finish. A very nice photo opportunity. I wonder if Team Redline already communicating and coordinating their own photo opportunity with 31 minutes left on the clock. So they're in pit lane, fuel getting refilled into that car. They'll be hoping that the fuel calculator does not make a mistake. It was one week ago today where in an Ivor competition, I saw drivers making that mistake, trusting their fuel calculator and having it make a mistake for them. UC Yakula rolls off the lane first, and in fact, Enzo Benito goes up on the jacks. No risk being taken here. And Justin, he's going to take tires for the remaining 30 minutes of this race. And with that quick stop, you have to wonder if there was maybe even two tires possibly. So off and away, Enzo Benito. An interesting decision possibly, maybe, for this call to be made. Either way, this likely secures possibly that the ice blue car stays on the lead lap here to end off this race, depending on the pace here. Well, if we want that photo finish, uh, it will have to happen. They will have to finish one lap down. Uh, Bo, a bit of speculation uh, just on my end. Uh, the way that Benito went up on the jacks and very quickly dropped off them too, kind of indicates to me and intimates that he forgot to uh, uncheck the tires coming into the box. And as soon as he went on, up on the jacks, realized his mistake and got rid of the remaining three tires. Yeah, but that's an interesting call. I think I would have just uh, stuck with taking tires at that point because now he's got a really odd balance in the car where he's got a really grippy tire. I think it would be the front left or maybe front right from memory. Um, it'd be one of the front tires would be extremely grippy, but then the rest will not be. So you'll have a very odd balance for the remaining laps. And every time he hits the brake pedal, the car will uh, just weave around a little bit uh, due to the uh, very odd grip levels from each tire. But uh, nonetheless, a very comfortable lead. And uh, he will continue racing on. And it is definitely one tire, because one tire is seven seconds uh, in a pit stop. And well, his uh, pit stop was seven seconds longer than his uh, fellow Redline teammate. I mean, if you ever needed that reminder that even these guys, the best of the best in the sim world, make mistakes. Look no further than this Bathurst 12 hours, the opening hour of the race. First, uh, it was Gordon Much uh, as part of the RAG Esports crew for getting to uh, put the right fuel into his car. Had to come down onto the pit road 30 minutes into the race. Now here in the final hour of the race, Enzo Benito with what... I don't want to call it a rookie mistake, Justin, but it's the type of mistake where if this was a more competitive race, and seven seconds was the difference between first and second, Enzo Benito would be kicking himself right now. And this is again why you build up a cushion. You never know what's going to end up happening, right? And now it's again going to be, can he handle the difference in the balance? And that's going to be where that talent's going to come into play. By the way, Inertia Sim Racing, they fall into 2.1 seconds back now, and they have a car in between them. And that is Vendival Sim Racing Pink, Dakota Fripp behind the wheel there. How much of a helping hand are they going to give to Matti Kaidasoa? Two seconds the gap between fourth and fifth. As Luka Kida tries to run away. You did notice, by the way, Bo, and I kind of didn't want to make too much of a uh, point out of it until just about now. But you'll see over here, all of the hard work being done by the Beeler Racing Team livery designers. Those are kangaroos, and uh, Vendival Sim Racing, we're just talking about them being nice to Matty Kaidasoa, and not so nice to Luka Kida, really checks up the momentum of the Beeler Racing car as we climb up the hill. 
Yeah, that was a very forceful overtake there from Dakota Fripp, of course. A, a little bit further down the running order at the moment in 23rd is the uh, Vendivel Sim Racing pink car, but yeah, no no holds uh, prisoner there to the 4th place car, Bila Racing Team Euronix and uh, Luca Kita, so uh, if he's going to overlap them or uh, try and uh, make life easy for him, he's definitely not doing that, and what that's done is cost uh, Luca Kita a whole bunch of time and just a bit more incentive now for Matty Kaida Sawyer. You can see that car in front is a little closer than it was the lap before. And such a motivation as a driver when you're chasing someone down. When you finally get into the slipstream of them. When you can finally start seeing you know, every little detail of the line they're taking. Because you're that close to them. So much motivation to keep on pushing. And well and truly the battle is on. Kaida Sawyer in the slipstream down Conrad. Lots of draft at play then. Kova tucked in behind as well on their recovery drive. It'll be a fascinating scrap here then as it looked as though this battle had kind of separated out. But now lap traffic proves to be a factor as well. As a Simo, one of the team managers for Inertia Sim Racing in our YouTube chat says, Thank you, Vendival Sim Racing. I'm sure there was no communication there whatsoever. But for now, pressure being applied. 26 minutes left to work between 4th and 5th, and this really is one of the few battles that we'll keep our eyes on in this closing portion of the race. You do have Urano Esports who are closing in on BS competition for 6th place after that damage incurred from Nathan Lewis through Forest Elbow. Ronin Simsport, they were chasing down the Pure Sims Esports uh, 116 car for a top 10 finish, but they've slightly stalled out over the last couple of laps, and a team that is up 36 positions so far this race might have found their final finishing position because we've got 20 laps left to work according to my timing screen. That does not seem right, Bo, with 25 minutes left on the clock. <laughs> no, not at all. My timing screen is saying we've got 14 laps to go uh, this time across the start-finish line, so uh, that probably sounds a little bit more correct. Either way, there is still more than enough time for uh, plenty of storylines in this race to take place. And, uh, hey, look, you know, a lot can happen in 14 races. We've seen sprint races with plenty of chaos with uh, that amount of time. So uh, in an endurance race where everyone's on old tires, slightly damaged cars, you can never, you know, count your chickens before the hatch. The reason I was bringing that up is because I think, I think we are going to get very, very close to our overall lap record, which is 348 laps but we will not break that margin once again. That was set back in 2019 by the Pure Racing team. I have a feeling we'll reach around 345 laps, give or take. Um, we are going to extend the streak, though, of pole teams winning this race. Two of the three pole teams have won in the years past. Looks like Team Redline Orange will continue that trend out front, but we will wait and see. And, of course, they will make it four wins for Germans in four years of competition as well. Gap between Inertia and Bila Racing Team, still just three-tenths of a second between these cars. Matty Kaidasoa right on the tail end now, Justin, and 24 minutes to work here. How do you approach this? You've got the speed, you've got the opportunity. How patient are you going to be? Well, you leave some opportunities as a result of the amount of laps left for several chances. And based on the defensive moves, I think you just wait for the right opportunity. I think you wait until there's a slip up or you get yourself an up slipstream to be able to make a realistic pass that you know will work without having to be over aggressive. Right now, Kita, he can just defend all over the racetrack at this point and it can be difficult to try and make the pass. So I think you just have to weigh your patience in. Know that you can work to try and provide pressure pressurize them into a mistake someone who's been pressurized into a, a mistake unfortunately is ronan simsport last lap time for them a 207 953 what a disappointing way for this race to come to a close but if we're talking about hard chargers in today's race look no further than ronan simsport up an incredible an absolutely staggering uh, i'm trying to think of one more adjective to describe this uh, Immense 36 positions gained in the race so far today. They will try and hold off SimRC Titan in the second Lamborghini in today's field. To be the highest 
Lamborghini finisher in today's field. The GT 3.5 class, as I dubbed it. Uh, midway through the pit window last time around, and we'll jump on board with Inertia Sim Racing. This battle then for fourth and fifth will rage on all the way to the checkered flag, unless a small mistake happens. Matty Kaidasoa really is on the absolute limit right now, Bo, and just listening to the way that he's balancing the weight of the car, you can tell that he's only thinking about finishing this race in fourth place. Yeah, at this point, Matty Kaidasoa doesn't even want to think about fifth place. It's not even in his realm of possibilities. The only reality Kaidasoa is seeing right now is that fourth place right in front of him. It's like a carrot dangling on a stick at the moment. You can see the Beeler Racing Team car Pulls all the way to the left to break that slipstream. Nah, if you're going to follow him, we'll go to the right. Maybe the middle of the track. Just break the slipstream however he can. But sadly, that is not going to work on a campaign veteran like Matty Kodosuri. He's been in plenty of race battles. He knows how to get a pass done, especially in the closing stages of the race. So he's going to keep on pushing and try and force a mistake somewhere. But uh, of course, Kodosuri has to be careful where he uh, makes the pass. He doesn't want to make the pass too early. I think there's plenty of time for Luke Kida to respond. 21 minutes left here in Mount Panorama, the second iRacing special event of the year. We're watching a battle for fourth and fifth out on track. Your podium looks fairly set at this point in time. Team Redline Orange in first, leading their teammates by almost two entire minutes. Team Redline Ice Blue and Alexei Yusiakula will continue to come home in second if they can hold on to this position. Jordan Caruso for Logitech Gialtis Esports makes it an Australian representative on the podium as things run. And then Beeler Racing Team Euronics, Inertia Sim Racing scrapping it out. Urano Esports has just gone and passed BS Competition who continues to struggle with some slight damage but 20 minutes left to work. They've got plenty of a gap over the BMW Team Redline car. BS Competition should hold on to seventh place in today's race. There is still a question mark about Ronin Simsport because the lap times for that car with some damaged suspension very much falling off a cliff. Last time was a 208, 404, but they'll be hoping for a lap time not found instead, you would have to assume. A 208 is four seconds off the pace, Justin, and they really are going to slip right into the clutches now of a lot number of cars. They're in danger of tumbling out of the top 15. Yeah, and the trouble spot is their steer is not even straight. So that makes it very difficult to be able to properly control the car and to be able to properly rotate throughout the corner. So it's going to be a tricky situation where they need to be careful. You can see right through the window on the straightaway coming up how much it's angled right here. That is about an extra 5, 10 degrees or so, they're having to turn it because of that steering, which is going to really impact the left-hand turns. You can see how much he's on edge and having to flick the wheel through these turns compared to the smoothness of some of the other cars. Last time, though, a 206.555, so only two seconds off the place. That might be a saving grace for the 15. 12 seconds is the gap to SimRC Titan from behind. If they can hold that delta at two seconds with... 19 minutes still left on the clock. They may be able to hold on, not to 11th, but maybe to 12th, maybe to 13th. And what a historic result it would be for Ronin Simsport. Back up front, watching Inertia Sim Racing chasing down the Beeler Racing Team Euronics car in front. More cars that have made their way up through the field. Three and four places respectively, though. Cars that had very impressive qualifying performances and proving that track position is so vital in the early stages of this race. And for Inertia Sim Racing, 18 minutes to try and work their way past one of the strongest campaigners of an Audi R8 on the iRacing service, Frank Beeler, synonymous with the Audi brand. And now his young eSports superstars have to defend from Inertia Sim Racing from behind. Matti Kaidasoa deep under brakes, loses a bit of time through the chase here. But Bo, I just mentioned how aggressive Kaidaso was looking. That look down into the chase indicates what's happening here for me. Kaidaso is setting himself out of the elbow, trying to get the perfect run down in towards that final braking zone to get the move done as cleanly as possible. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot easier to pass in a straight line than it is to pass in a corner. So he wants the best exit possible at a forest elbow, get the pass as 
much done as possible in a straight line and then finish the job into the breaking zone. But he wasn't able to do it that time. He had a big, big lunge and it actually cost himself a little bit of time there. So uh, for Kaido Soya, that's a, a lesson learned from him. And, you know, he can afford to experiment a little bit. There's 10 laps to go. And uh, for these next 10 laps, he can afford to just see where are the strengths, where are the weaknesses of the Bueller Racing Car, and uh, where, more importantly, can he slip through and not have a chance for Luka Kita to respond as well. So, Kaida Soya, he'll be looking at plenty of opportunities. He'll have a plenty of little half looks over the next few laps. But then eventually, you know, we know Matty Kaida Soya. He is a weapon of a driver. Super, super quick, super, super committed when he needs to be. There is a big, big pass coming, and uh, if I was Bieler Racing Team, you'd have to feel just a little bit worried. Uh, your use of the word weapon there has me concerned, because that can go either way. Uh, I think I know which way you meant it, though. In the positive sense. <laughs> exactly. The pace from Kaidaso has been blistering in these closing stages of the race. A uh, race, rather, and... As we work our way then, 15 minutes to go, still lots of opportunity on the table. Light flashing from Matty Kaida Soa, tucked up behind the Beeler Racing Team car, trying to break the draft. About a couple of kilometers an hour difference here. Inertia Sim Racing are six kilometers an hour faster as we enter the braking zone. They look to the inside. Oh, they get onto the curb as well. And they're gonna have to slot themselves into line for now. But this really is starting to intensify, Justin, and you don't want to be on the outside into the chase, and I think Matty Kaidasoa kind of set himself up in the wrong way for that move there. Yeah, and hence the defensive moves to try and make sure that the bottom line is held on too hard here for Beale Racing Team Neuronics at this point. For Matty, I think, again, it's going to come down to that section, and it's going to have to be a move that will be fairly bored of this rank because it almost looks like he's being held up here at this point. Don't forget, they also have the 28th place car here added on to the tow as well, who's just watching along for the ride. And they've got the RAG Esports and Venable Sim Racing Pink Car still up the road here that are within range to potentially become factors still in this fight after seeing Venable become a factor so much to close up this gap. Up through the cutting, we work only one issue through this quarter throughout the entirety of today's race. If you can believe it, we managed to get through lap one on today's race without any major drama. It was some very respectful and clean racing at the start of the race. And uh, as I was just about to allude to, Inertia Sim Racing pointing it out as well, the defense is going to get more aggressive. The elbows will come out and potentially cars will be shoved off the track as well. Let's turn our attention away from these guys for just a few moments time because it feels like we've been staring at them for the entirety of the last hour. And let's check in with Yas Heat and Sim RC Titan. These guys are closing in. Ronin Simsport in front. Last time around, another two seconds uh, chipped away at the gap to the 11th place car, Justin. And as these guys work their way through some traffic as well, we're approaching this checkered flag phase. It's great to see, 12 hours after we started this race, these guys are still scrapping it out very hard. It's very great to see indeed, and it just shows what can happen in motorsports, where you have cars who end up getting grouped up with one another and others who utilize strategy in smart ways to be able to get themselves into position battles. For Yas Heat, they've had some impressive runs today and some impressive speed overall with some big acquisitions, and now they scrape the left side of the car against the wall. Not the first time they've done that in the Microsoft-sponsored machine. It does compromise them down the straightaway. Ooh, looks like we've had an issue. Oh no! Rolling down Skyline the wrong way round. That's Five Star Motorsports and Jason Cooper who will back it into the wall very hard. Surely more damage done to that car as a result of the subsequent contact. As we spool up the replay machine, your race leader makes his way on past. Ooh, and he hits the wall early, Bo. And after that, things just go from bad to worse. Absolutely, and what a scary place of the track to be with the approach speed of the cars coming uh, towards him. But thankfully, no one was really uh, on track at that point in time. So he gets away with it, apart from backing it into the wall uh, down the uh, exit of Skyline. But just, yeah, lost the car really early. Actually clipped to the inside curb, I think, a little bit. And that really started to bounce the car, and from there, there was really no saving it. And uh, we might have been switched from onboard and really get a good idea of uh, how this looks from Enzo Benito's perspective. 
and uh, see exactly what he saw. Because, of course, coming over the top of Skyline, the last thing you want to see is a car facing the wrong direction and almost out of control. And to put it into context, we're st we've stuck on the replay. We haven't jumped back in time at all. So as Enzo Benito works his way down through Skyline, it took about 30, 40 seconds before Jason Cooper was uh, ready to go and uh, pointed in the right direction. So let's jump back to live pictures and pick up that battle between Inertia Sim Racing and Beeler once again. They work their way down Conrod Strait. 12 minutes left on the race clock. Inertia pulls itself to the inside of the chase. They'll have the outside. Oh, slight contact made. Oh, Beeler's go going off through the grass. And that's a disappointing way for this battle to come to an end. Luca Kida keeps it out of the wall just about. Absolutely amazing car control on display once again. And we'll spool up this replay machine and jump on board with Luca Kida and take us through this one, Justin. And obviously the run is coming up from the inside, but eventually they make a tiny bit of contact that sends Kita sliding. And he tries to go for the only space he can without making significant contact off to the grass and try to aim it for the pavement right after the chase. The problem is he overshot that pavement and slammed hard into the tire barriers and sand barriers right afterwards. You can see he was trying to keep it away from potentially coming up in the rest of the traffic and aiming for that pavement. Just way too much speed and a tough break in that situation. Very disappointing way for this battle to come to a close. And unfortunately then, that fight to the checkered flag that we were hoping to witness has come unstuck. Inertia Sim Racing will promote themselves up into fourth, and Luka Kida will be thinking about the battle that might have been. Let's see if we can take uh, one more look at this and take a look at the aerial look brought to us by ATVO Graphical Partners at RaceBot TV, and it's two going into one bow. I'll throw it back just very slightly so we can take one more look at this, and it's just very disappointing that after 11 hours and 50 minutes, this battle has come to an end with this. Yeah, it's such a shame, of course. We're set for a grandstand thriller and just the smallest, basically, door-to-door -to -door touch on the entrance to the chase, 280 kilometers an hour through there. So uh, self-preservation kicked in, tried to drive it through the uh, grass out the other side sadly didn't work out the same way as Mark Winterbottom did in 2007 <laughs> and I did collect the ball but amazingly I've looked on board with the uh, Beeler Racing Team car and while I can't speak on behalf of the suspension and uh, how the overall balance of the car is somehow despite the big hit into the side the steering is straight I'm very curious what the lap time is going to be because Urano Esports are 2.2 seconds further back you can see left front of this car, significant damage to the front clip there. I tell you what, let's take a better look at this from a slightly different camera angle. Uh, you don't even get a great indication here, but that was a significant hit. Great car control to avoid it being a larger hit. Across the line, lap time for Kida is a 2.05.089, so he's lost half a second to Urano Esports from behind. And Justin, this might be a fight now for Beeler Racing to hold on to fourth as well. Currently, the separation is about two to three seconds or so. As long as there isn't any more mistakes, no more wall taps, I think they might have enough of a cushion to hold on. It's just going to come down to what's the mindset of Luca after that contact. As well, keep in mind, Summer C. Titan is still keeping up the pressure on the SE to try and fight for that position for 12 spot. Ronan well, Simsport has been able to stabilize some of the time loss now to only about a second a lap. They look to be fairly safe right now with that cushion still about 25 plus seconds we see. Or rather, four plus seconds. I, th I think you're still right. Still might be just enough for Ronan Simsport to hold on to a very impressive 11th place finish. Less than nine minutes left on our race clock right now. Let's check in with your race leader. Where is Enzo Benito? He's coming across the start-finish line to start another lap here at Bathurst. That will mean five laps to go as Benito crosses the start-finish line to complete lap 339 in today's race. Four laps to hold on to victory here on the mountain. And for a team that had a very difficult 2020 uh, bow... <laughs> They started off 2021 with more difficulties, not just in the World Championship competitions, but in the iRacing Daytona 24 hours as well. The one bright light was the BMW Sim GT Cup from Daytona, where 
Gianni Vecchio and Jonas Wallmeyer have already secured tickets to BMW Munich in December. But here at Bathurst, they came into this race with high expectations and they've delivered from the drop of the green flag. We haven't talked much about them because what's there to talk about? They've led this race and they've led it comfortably since lap one. They've just executed exactly what they needed to. You know, their plan was perfect and they executed that to the very end. And uh, that is a credit to Team Redline you know, and the drivers. They've done exactly what they had to. And, uh, you know, there is a bit of a reputation at Team Redline for, you know, the need to get results. And, you know, once again, they're delivering on that and they're proving why, you know, they've got a massive history as a team. And uh, there's a reason why they have that history. It's because they always find a way to bounce back from, uh, you know, bad results. And like you said, Daytona 24 wasn't the best outing for them ever, of course, with a number of cars. I think their best finish may have been fifth with a, a wounded BMW M8. But then they did end up winning the BMW Sim Cup. And, uh, you know, in particular for the lineup today of Enzo Benito and Max Verstappen, Team Redline Orange, what you just saw on screen, I think, says it all. Absolutely dominant. And now, in fact, the gap might start to build up between those two cars, you know. Uh, that photo finish in six minutes' time might uh, have to wait. The last time around, Enzo Benito, what's the lap time going to be this time? Uh, 2.3 seconds quicker than his teammate. So maybe they are doing a bit of switcheroony around there. We'll wait and see for them to come across the line, maybe in formation in six minutes' time. But for... The next six minutes, let's check around on track. Talk about some of the big names as well. Let's start with Inertia Sim Racing. Before we come back to Logitech Gialtis Esports and Justin, after a very strong second half of this race, it was shaping up very nicely on that Contra strategy. Just didn't work out the way they wanted, but that's endurance racing, not just in the sim world, in the real world as well. You can plan everything the way you want, but there will always be those slight hiccups that present themselves along the way. Absolutely, and in the end, when you look at the interval between third and fourth at the moment, that difference right now is mainly the difference on fuel strategy. About 12 seconds difference, it was about 11, 12 seconds in the pit box. And sometimes the strategy just doesn't go your way. Sometimes you try and go with the altered strategy, and it can sometimes work, sometimes it can be difficult. Today, though, they really proved themselves to be very strong and very quick, and Matty, of course, is going to be a big part of this organization. And I think this is a huge, huge monumental part of this team's history today. It was mentioned in the YouTube chat as well. It's not just the results that Kaida Soa will bring to this team. It's the mentorship, the experience, the ability for him to nurture the next wave of young superstars in towards sim racing. And so for Matty Kaida Soa, it will be a fourth position finish here on the mountain. And it will be a start of a very successful run then with his brand new sim racing team. Your world championship driver very much seems to have settled at Inertia Sim Racing right now. And after dropping down the order early in the race, good fight back then from this entire operation. We'll talk about Altus Esports then, Bo, and I'll pose this question to you as part of the team. You've got... You guys have had success before. It's not that you don't, you haven't had the success in these top split iRacing special events before, but it's this one at home that I think is going to taste all the sweeter when you eventually get the race victory. A podium though for Cooper Webster, Jordan Caruso, a very fine way to uh, round off the second race in the iRacing special event calendar. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great result for the team in the fact that you know, Bathurst 12 Air as an event hasn't been all that kind to us. I think we've had a pole position here back in 2018 with Andrew Carl and the McLaren. Um, but then beyond that, this track has uh, definitely eaten us alive and not been nice to the home crowd. So, you know, of course, we came into this going for a win. Um, there's no hiding that. Everyone here did. But, uh, you know, a podium is a great result for the team. And, you know, it helps build momentum as well. Because, of course, we had a tricky day turn to 24 where... Uh, Perhaps we didn't get the car selection quite right and we uh, were left fighting for the top manufacturer um, that we raced in. But uh, this is a great turnaround and I think it just builds momentum for the team moving forward. We'll turn our attention then towards Ronin Simsport. Up 36 positions so far today. Three minutes left on the clock. Looks like 
They're going to have to let on pass Yas Heat as well as Simarsi potentially in the background. Down Conrod straight. Sorry, not down Conrod straight. Uh, down Mountain Straight, they will work. It's been a very long day up here in the commentary booth. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati. Two more minutes left in this race. Justin Prince, Bo Albert alongside. We had Dylan Coyle, David Haynes, Daniel Harris in the middle portion of the race. And I was joined by Stefan Schlacker and Lorenzo Bonder for the first four hours of coverage as well. Tyler Maxson did a monster stint on production with eight total hours from the start of the race all the way until I took over with four hours left on the clock. And for the entire team at RaceBot TV, it's been another entertaining special event to watch here. Ronan Simsport have now been passed by Yashi, and now Simarsi Titan will try and take advantage as well. But with two minutes left on the clock, where is your race leader? There is Enzo Benito coming down in towards Griffin's Bend. I do believe, Justin, we should have two laps to go, including this time around. I believe so as well here, and again, it's been domination, to say the very least. Again, for this organization, give credit again to both Verstappen and especially Benito to close things out. Both of them were on their A++ game today. Both of them were the two quickest drivers on the track and then some today. There is no touching them. It's absolutely incredible, the performance we've seen from the both of them today. And I don't know if we'll see performances like this at many of the tracks this season. It was just an incredibly dominant drive right from the get-go from Team Redline Orange. It really has been. Verstappen put it on pole, dominated the opening portions of the race, and they never looked back once. Out of Forest Elbow then for the penultimate time. They will get the white flag in the air this time around. That means two more opportunities for SimRC Titan to get the move done on Ronin Simsport. This is, of course, the battle for your GT 3.5 and also the highest finishing Lamborghini in today's race. Both, both cars with significant damage. But I think SimRC with slightly less damage will make it look very easy down the inside. They're up into 12th position. Ronan Simsport then down into 13th, but still, they are up 34 positions from where they started. An absolutely amazing achievement for them. Especially at a track like this, Bo, we should highlight when uh, no safety cars, as we mentioned a number of occasions. For Ronan Simsport, very, very impressive and really excited to see how they'll propel themselves on from this. Absolutely. I mean, you know... Obviously, they're going to be a little bit upset with everything that's happened in the remaining laps of this race. But take nothing away from them. Starting at the back here at Bathurst is always a dangerous place. You almost expect to get damaged starting all the way back in 47th place. But, you know, they've played it smart. They've kept it clean for the majority of this race. And that is the reason why they are, you know, moving up so far this field. So if they get qualifying right one day, Ronan Simsport definitely a force to reckon with for the future. And if not for that late damage, it would have been 11th place for them. Here comes then your race leader. One lap advantage over the rest of the field. There will be a photo finish across the line with Team Redline Ice Blue right behind Enzo Benito. Down the hill then for the final time. After 11 hours and 59 minutes of driving perfection from Max Verstappen and Enzo Benito. They have not put one foot wrong. And the challenge that Mount Panorama faces was no match for two very, very impressive young superstars in the making. Verstappen, of course, is a superstar in the Formula One paddock. Enzo Benito slowly develops as a racing driver, both in the virtual and the real world, and is quickly becoming a name to watch out for in the real world as well. Couple of corners then to go for Team Redline. It was pure racing team in the first two years, taking victory in GT3. Last year, it was VRS Kawanda breaking that stranglehold at the front. Porsche 24 driven by Redline, they took the win in your Porsche 911 Cup class, but they return now to the top step of the overall podium as Team Redline Orange, Enzo Benito, Max Verstappen come across the start finish line and they'll take a very dominant victory here. The 2021 iRacing Bathurst 12 Hours with Team Redline Blue 
in second place as well. Four wins in four years then for Germans here on the mountain. And we'll come back then in 12 months time to do this once again. As hopefully the real race returns to Mount Panorama as well. And GT3 machines down to Bathurst. What a day it was here live on RaceBot TV. And in a month's time, we will return for more iRacing special events action live from Sebring International Raceway as we kick off the VCO Grand Slam. But for now, it's celebrations for Team Redline as Team Redline Orange comes across the line to take victory here on an entire lap from the rest of the field. We will get post-race interviews then in the next few moments as the Team Redline cars work their way up the mountain, begin the celebrations. But uh, Justin, what can you say? It's uh, such a tough race here. And to come to this track and win four out of four, yes, it started as Pure Racing Team before that team migrated into the Team Redline outfit and operation, but it's absolutely incredible and a well-deserved victory for the team today. They put in the preparation, they put in the work, they showed the speed right from the get-go. And in the end, a team won two is very well deserved with the pace they had today. Absolutely blistering right from the get-go. What a drive from Team Redline today for 1-2 here at the mountain. And the hometown boys will come across the line in third. Logitech Gialtis Esports, Cooper Webster and Jordan Caruso take home third place in a very well-earned battle for that position. Inertia Sim Racing in fourth, Urano Esports in fifth, and now it's time for the moment that everyone has been waiting for 12 hours of survival. Uh, apparently, uh, Enzo Benito <laughs> not going for the jump. Is Alexi Yusiakala going to do it? No, what are you boys doing here? You're meant to be going for the jump. We'll wait and get There's... the rest of your field coming through the jump potentially then, Bo. I'm very disappointed as what just happened. It's a little bit of a tradition to go for the uh, Bathurst jump at the end of it all, so even I'm a little bit heartbroken at this point in time, but at the end of the day, these cars, they finished exactly how they started the race. Not a scratch on them, a brilliant drive, and, uh, well, maybe a few little burnouts on the front straight instead of uh, a launch off the Bathurst jump. There we go. There's oh a car taking to the jump. Matty Kaidasoa with some entertainment. Oh, Dakota Fripp has gone airborne as well. <laughs> Let's enjoy these uh, sights and sounds for the time being as the cars celebrate surviving 12 hours at Bathurst. I think that was Kova that just went flying through the air. Oh, absolute scenes and traditional way to celebrate here at Bathurst. But let's go ahead then and take a look at our final race results after 12 hours of action. So Enzo Benito, Team Redline Orange, they take victory over the entire field by one hold lap. Their teammates come across the line in second, Jordan Caruso and Logitech Gialtis Esports in third, and then Matti Kaidasoa, Girano Esports in fifth, Beeler Racing Team dropping to sixth in the closing stages of this race, as well as Nathan Lewis, final finisher, one lap down for BS competition. A couple more BMWs in a train, then Jonas Wallmeyer for BMW Team Redline in eighth, with Elias Sapanen in ninth, Tyler Hervius comes across the line for Pure Sims Esports in 10th. Does look like a lot of crossover drives in today's race. So good to see that teams, uh, team members sharing themselves with one another. Carlos Digas for Yas Heat in 11th. SimRC Titan in 12th with Ronan Sim uh, Sport in close pursuit right behind them. Bela Racing Team Euronix and James Saunders across the line in 14th with Road to Indy star Phil Denez for BMW Team BS Competition in 15th. Racine Fazui in 16th. DV1 Triton Racing, the last car two laps down back in 17th place. And HM Engineering, RHG Esports Junior, Team BMW Bank. Bruno Spengler bringing that car across the line. And we'll continue working our way through these finishes. The big thing that I'm noticing, lots of cars finishing many laps down. 21st through 30th split from 4 to 12 laps down. And you can see here big names as well. The likes of Martin Van Lusenord for RHG Esports. The Altus Esports number 66 car, Gianni Vecchio for Team Redline. Not making it to the finish line, and in this case as well, not making it past halfway for many of these contenders. 54 cars took to the green flag, and this is our final race result. Waiting then for post-race interviews as well as the f 
uh, podium finishes will come down into the booth. But Justin, just a few words from you to sum up that race that we just saw. Again, domination from Team Redline, but some incredible battles and some incredible strategy by many of the organizations who took part today. For some, they had to deal with adversity and deal with the potential of attrition and the tortures that is Mount Pamarana Circuit. But for many others, they were able to survive to the bitter end and what was an entertaining event, to say the least, in 2021 entertaining i spent eight hours on commentary uh, the other four hours basically was just watching on on the sideline so we'll continue to just have a quick chat here as we wait and see if we'll get post-race interviews from team redline or logitech gialtis esports Bo, a couple of words from you then second iRacing special event on commentary uh, first of the year what was your thoughts about this one uh, busy day for you as well coming straight over from the porsche tag core esports super cup it's been a very busy day for me, but nowhere near as busy, of course, as the drivers who had to work so hard for 12 hours and the mental fatigue that goes into this race as well. So I always knew watching this race that uh, we're going to see some entertainment with uh, obviously the drivers having to work so hard to minimize mistakes, stay off the walls and also provide some great action as well. And I tell you what, they ticked all of the boxes. They all drove brilliantly, put on a great show and uh, 12 hours of endurance racing. It's that, and that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be endurance racing. But in the end, you know, for third place and fourth and fifth and a few other positions, you know, just outside the top 10, it became a sprint race at the end. And, you know, you love to see that every time with endurance racing. And also at Bathurst, it always comes down to the final laps and you can never, ever, you know, be 100% certain in the race results until it's over. Well, we are waiting to try and get word from some of these finishers. Would be good to uh, talk to the likes of Max Verstappen, Enzo Benito, but doesn't look like that's going to happen. So we will wrap up our coverage then here live on RaceSpot TV. Second of our iRacing special events is in the books. It was VRS Coanda taking the win at the Daytona 24. This time it's their rivals, Team Redline, with the victory. And what a victory it was for Max Verstappen and Enzo Benito. As well, if you want to follow us for more sim racing action, if you're not already doing that, we'll ask you why you're not before you hit the buttons, but follow us at RaceBot TV across YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and Instagram for more sim racing coverage. If you're not subscribed on YouTube, hit the red button and the bell next to it to get notified every single time we go live with more sim racing action. It's going to be a very busy week ahead of us. VCO Pro Sim as well as Lionheart Racing Series kicking off on RaceBot TV before this weekend. We'll head to a couple of championship finales as well as the BMW Sim GT Cup returning from the land of the rising sun. My name is Arjuna Kankipati. I've been joined by Justin Prince and Bo Albert for this last four hours of coverage. Tyler Maxson producing the first eight hours along with a number of commentators helping out as well. We'll be back in one month's time for the 12 hours of Sebring, where we'll have uninterrupted coverage in partnership with Radio Show Limited. But for now, live from Mount Panorama. Thank you for tuning in to RaceBot TV, and we'll see you from Sebring International Raceway.